Acadian Reminiscences The True Story of Evangeline by Judge Felix Voorhees Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Wayne Cook Introduction by Felix Burney Voorhees Acadian Reminiscences, depicting the true life of Evangeline, is a story centered about the life of the Acadians, whose descendants are now residents of the Teche country, also known as the Land of Evangeline. These people lived a pure and simple life, with an unbounded devotion to their religion, and with an unshakable faith in their God. Their love for one another is unparalleled in the annals of human history, to which may be attributed their fortitude and perseverance in their travels from Canada upon being expelled by the British to their chosen land on the banks of Bayou Teche. The author, Judge Felix Voorhees, relates the story as it was told to him by his grandmother. The story begins by telling of the native land of these Acadians and of the village of St. Gabriel, from which they were driven when the French province was surrendered to the British. It tells of members of the same families being separated and placed on different ships and never to see each other again. The story tells of their landing in Maryland, and after some time hearing that members of theirs and other families having landed in Louisiana. This news brought encouragement and determination in face of great dangers to travel to the beautiful land of the Teche. The author was best able to present this story as it was handed down to him by word of mouth by his grandmother, who adopted Evangeline when orphaned at an early age. The writer repeats the story in a simple and narrative manner characteristic of the Acadians. To this day, travelers may visit the quaint town of St. Martinsville on the banks of Bayou Teche and pay their respects at the grave shrine of Evangeline, and for a few fleeting moments lived the life of these early settlers. Because of the demands for this story, and in tribute to Judge Felix Voorhees, my grandfather, a man of noble character, staunch patriotism, and unerring judgment, I, together with all members of the Voorhees family, dedicate this book. Felix Burney Voorhees Chapter 1 Acadian Reminiscences with the True Story of Evangeline it seems but yesterday, and yet sixty years have passed away since my boyhood. How fleeting is time! How swiftly does old age creep upon us with its infirmities! The curling smoke dispelled by the passing wind, the water that glides with a babbling murmur in the gentle stream, leave as deep a mark of their passage as do the fleeting days of man. I was twelve years old and yet I can picture in my mind the noble simplicity of my father's house. The homes of our fathers were not showy, but their appearance was smiling and inviting. They had neither quaintness nor gaudiness, but were as grand in their simplicity as the boundless hospitality of their owners. For no people were more generous or hospitable than the Acadians who settled in the magnificent and poetic wilds of the Teche country. My father's house stood on a sloping hill in the center of a large yard, whose finely laid rows of china trees, interspersed with clusters of towering oaks, formed delightful vistas. In the declivity of the hill the orchard displayed its wealth of orange, of plum, and peach trees. Further on was the garden, teeming with vegetables of all kinds, sufficient for the need of a whole village. I can yet picture that yard, with its hundreds of poultry, running with flapping of wings and with noisy cacklings around my mother as she scattered the grain for them morning and evening. At the foot of the hill, extending to the Vermilion Bayou, were the pasture grounds, where grazed the cattle, and where the bleeding sheep followed, step by step, the stately ram with tinkling bell suspended to his neck. How clearly is that scenery pictured in my mind with its lights and shadows! Were I a painter, I could even now portray with striking reality the minutest shadings and beauties of that landscape. How strange that I should recall so vividly those things, while scenes that I have admired in my maturer years have been obliterated from my memory. Ah, uh, the child's mind, like soft wax, is easily molded to sensations and impressions that never fade. 
while man's mind, blunted by the keenness of life's deceptions, can no longer receive and retain the imprints of those impressions and sensations. If this be true, does not a kind providence suggest to us, in this wise, the wisdom of moulding the child's mind and intelligence with the fostering care of parental solicitude, that he may become an upright man, a good citizen, and a reproachless husband and father? My father was an Acadian, son of an Acadian, and proud of his ancestry. The term Acadian was, in those days, synonymous with honesty, hospitality, and generosity. By his indomitable energy, my father had acquired a handsome fortune, and such was the simplicity of his manners, and such his frugality, that he lived, contented and happy, on his income. Our family consisted of my father and mother, of three children, and of my grandmother, a centenarian, whose clear and lucid memory contained a wealthy mine of historical facts that an antiquarian or chronicler would have been proud to possess. In the cold winter days the family assembled in the hall, where a goodly fire blazed on the hearth, and while the wind whistled outside, our grandmother, an exile from Acadia, would relate to us the stirring scene she had witnessed when her people were driven from their homes by the British, their sufferings during their long pilgrimage overland from Maryland to the wilds of Louisiana, the dangers that beset them on their long journey through endless forests, along precipitous banks of rivers too deep to be forded, among hostile Indians that followed them stealthily like wolves day and night, ever ready to pounce upon them and massacre them. And as she spoke, we grew closer to her and grouped around her and stirred not, lest we lose one of her words. When she spoke of Acadia, her face brightened, her eyes beamed with a strange brilliancy, and she kept us spellbound, so eloquent and yet so sad were her words, and then tears trickled down her aged cheeks, and her voice trembled with emotion. Under our father's roof she lacked none of the comforts of life. We knew that her children vied with each other to please her and we wondered why it was that she seemed to be sad and unhappy. We were then mere children and knew nothing of the human heart. Grim experience had not taught us its sorrowful lessons, and we knew not that a remembrance has often the bitterness of gall, and that tears alone will wash away that bitterness. She sat in her rocking chair with hands clasped on her knees, her body leaning slightly forward, her hair, silvered over by age, could be seen under the lace of her cap. Her dress was neat and tasteful, for she always took pride in her personal appearance. She called us Pito, meaning little ones, and she took pleasure in conversing with us. My father remonstrated her because she fondled us too much. Mother, he would say, you spoil the children. But she heeded not his words and fondled us the more. These details are interesting to none but myself, and I dwell perhaps too long upon them. Alas, I am an old man, reviewing the joys and sorrows of my boyhood, and it seems to me that I have become once more a little child when I speak of days gone by, and when I recall the memory of those I loved so well and who are no more. I shall now attempt to repeat the story of my grandmother's misfortunes, and as she has related it to us time and again. CHAPTER Two, MY GRANDMOTHER'S NARRATIVE She depicts Acadian manners and customs. Peto, she said, my native land is situated far, far away up north, and you would have to walk during many months to reach it. You would have to cross rivers deep and wide, go over mountains looming up thousands of feet, and beneath impending rocks, shadowing yawning valleys. You would have to travel day and night in endless forests among hostile Indians, seeking an opportunity to waylay and murder you. My native land is called Acadia. It is a cold and desolate region during winter, and snow covers the ground during several months of the year. It is rocky, and huge and rugged stones are strewn over the surface of the ground in many places, and one must struggle hard for a livelihood there, especially with the poor and meager tools possessed by my people. My country is not like yours, diversified by rolling and gentle hills, covered the year-round with a thick carpet of green grass, and where every plant sprouts up and grows to maturity as if by magic, 
and where one may enrich himself easily, provided he fears God, and is laborious and economical. Yet I grieve for my native land, with its <laughs> rocks and snows, because I have left there a part of my heart in the graves of those I love so well, and who sleep under its sod. And as she spoke thus, her eyes streamed with tears, and emotion choked her utterance. I have promised to give you an insight into the manners and customs of your Acadian ancestors, and to tell you how it was that we left our country as exiles to emigrate to Louisiana. I now keep my promise, and I will relate to you all that I know of our sad history. You must know, Pitot, that less than a hundred years ago, Acadia was a French province, whose people lived contented and happy. The king of France sent brave officers to govern the province, and these officers treated us with greatest kindness. They were our arbiters and adjusted all our differences, and so equitable were their decisions that they proved satisfactory to all. Is it strange, then, that being thus situated, we prospered and lived contented and happy? Little did we dream of what cruel fate had in store for us. Our manner of living in Acadia was peculiar, uh, the people forming, as it were, one single family. The province was divided into districts inhabited by a certain number of families, among which the government parceled out the land in tracts sufficiently large for their needs. Those family groupings together form small villages or posts under the administration of commandants. No one was allowed to lead a life of idleness or be a worthless member of the province. The child worked as soon as he was old enough to do so, and he worked until old age unfitted him for toil. The men tended the flocks and tilled the land, and while they ploughed the fields, the boys followed them step by step, goading on the work oxen. The wives and daughters attended to the household work, and spun the wool and cotton which they wove, and manufactured into cloth with which to clothe the family. The old people, not over-active and strong, like your grandmother, she would add with a smile, together with the infirm and invalids, braided the straw with which we manufactured our hats. So you see, Pito, we had no drones, no useless loungers in our villages, and every one lived the better for it. The land allocated to each district was divided into two unequal parts. The larger portion was set apart as the tillage ground, and then parceled out among the different families, and yet the clashing of interests resulting from that community of rights never stirred up any contentions among your Acadian ancestors. Although poor, they were honest and industrious, and they lived contented with what little they had, without envying their neighbors, and how could it be otherwise? If any one was unable to do his field work because of illness or of some other misfortune, his neighbors flew to his assistance, and it required but a few days' work with their combined efforts to weed his field and save his crop. Thus it was that, incited by noble and generous feeling, the inhabitants of the province seemed to form one single family and not a community composed of separate families. These details, Pito, are tedious to you, and you would rather that I should tell you stories more amusing and captivating. No, grandmother, we feel more and more interested in your narrative. Speak to us of Acadia, your native land, which we already love for your sake. Pito, she said, I love my Acadia, and you will learn to love it also, and when you shall have been made acquainted with the worth of its honest and noble inhabitants. Besides, added she, with a sad smile, the gloomy and somber part of my story remains to be told. When you shall have listened to it, you will understand why it is that I feel sad and weep when the remembrances of the past come crowding in my heart. But to, to resume, contiguous to the village ground lay the pasture grounds, well fenced in, and which were known as the common. 
in these grounds the cattle of the colonists were kept and thus secured in that safe enclosure our herds increased every year thus you see Pitot, we lacked none of the comforts of life although not wealthy we were not in want as our wishes were few and easily satisfied plainness and simplicity of manners are the main springs of happiness and he that wishes for what he may never have or acquire must be miserable indeed and worthy of pity alas that this simplicity of our acadian manners should have already degenerated into extravagance and folly ah the acadians are losing by degrees the remembrance of the traditions and customs of the mother country the love of gold has implanted itself in their hearts and this will bring no happiness to them ere you live to be as old as i she would say shaking her head mournfully you will find out that your grandmother is right in her prediction in acadia as we prize temperance sobriety and simplicity of manners more than riches early marriages were highly favored early marriages foster the virtues which give to man the only true happiness and from which he derives health and longevity no obstacle was thrown in the way of a loving couple who desired to marry the lover accepted by the maiden obtained the ready consent of the parents and no one dreamed of inquiring whether the lover was a man of means or whether the destined bride brought a handsome dowry as we are wont to do nowadays their mutual choice proved satisfactory to all and indeed who better than they could mate their hearts when they alone were staking their happiness on the venture and besides it is not often that marriages founded on mutual love turn out badly the bans were published in the village church and the old curate after admonishing them of the sacredness of the tie that bound them forever blessed their union while the holy sacrifice of mass was being said Bito, it is useless for me to describe the marriage ceremony and the rejoicings attending the nuptials as you have witnessed the like here but i will speak to you of an old acadian custom which prevails no more among us one which we no longer observe as soon as the marriage of a young couple was determined the men of the village after having built a cosy little home for them cleared and planted the land parcel out to them and while they so generously extended their aid and assistance the women were no laggards in their kindness to the bride to her they made presents of which they deemed most necessary for the comfort and utility of her household and all this was done and given with honest and willing hearts everything was orderly and neat in the home of the happy couple and after the marriage ceremony in the church and the wedding feast at the home of the bride's father the happy couple were escorted to their new home by the young men and the young maidens of the village how genial was the joy that warmed our hearts and brightened our souls on these occasions how noisy and light the gaiety of the young people how unalloyed their merriment and happiness chapter three rumors of war disturb the peace and quiet of the acadians thus far Pito, i have briefly described to you the simple manners and customs of the acadians I will now relate to you what befell them and how a cruel war sowed ruin and desolation in their homes. I will tell you how they were ruthlessly treated by the English, driven away from Acadia, and despoiled of all their worldly goods and possessions, how they were scattered to the four winds as wretched exiles, and how the very name of their country was blotted out of existence. My narrative will not be gay, but all but it is meet and proper that you should know these things and that you should learn them from the lips of the witnesses themselves it was on a sunday i remember this as if it were but yesterday we were attending mass and when our old curate ascended his pulpit as he was wont to do every sunday he announced to us that war was being waged between france and england 
my children he said in sad and solemn tones you may expect to witness awful scenes and to undergo sore trials but god will not forsake you if you put your trust in his infinite mercy and then kneeling down he prayed aloud for france and we all responded to his fervent voice and said amen from the depths of our hearts a painful silence prevailed in the little church until mass was over it seemed as if every one of us was attending the funeral of a member of his family as we left the church the people grouped themselves on all sides to discuss the sad news there was no dancing on the greensward in front of the little church that day Bitos, and we returned mournfully and quietly to our homes this intelligence troubled us and we tried in vain to shake off the gloom that darkened our souls when we conversed together the words died on our lips and our smiles had sadness of a sob ah Bitos, war with its train of evils and of woes is always a terrible scourge and it was but natural that we should ponder mournfully on the consequences and dread the future england had enlisted hundreds of indians in her armies and we knew that the bloodthirsty savages spared no one and inflicted the most exquisite torture on their prisoners they dreamed of nothing but incendiarism and massacre and these were the troops that were to be let loose upon us the mere thought of facing such fiends was enough to dismay the stoutest heart and disturb the peace and quiet of a community like ours we knew not what to resolve but come what may we were determined to die rather than become traitors to our king and to our god then we argued ourselves into a different mood by thinking that this news might after all be exaggerated and that our apprehensions were unfounded why should england wage war upon us acadia so poor so desolate so sparsely peopled was surely not worth the shedding of a single drop of blood for its conquest the storm would pass by without even ruffling our peace and tranquillity we argued thus to rid ourselves of the gloomy forebodings that troubled us but despite our endeavors our fears haunted us and made us despondent and miserable the news that reached us now and then was far from being encouraging france whelmed in defeat seemed to have abandoned us the english were gaining ground and our canadian brothers were calling for assistance several of our young men resolved to join them to fight the battles of france and die for their country if god so willed it Abiton. that was a sad day in the colony and we all shed bitter tears the brave young men that were sacrificing their lives so nobly wept with us but remained as firm as rocks in their resolve we had at last realized the fact that the threatening ruin was frowning upon us and that it had struck at our very hearts on the day of their departure the noble young men received the holy communion kneeling before the altar and they listened to the encouraging words of the old curate while every one wept and sobbed in the little church after having told them to serve the king faithfully and to love god above all else he gave them his blessing while big tears rolled down his cheeks alas how could he look upon them without emotion and grief he had christened them when they were mere babies he had watched them grow to manhood he knew them as i know you and they were leaving their homes and those that they loved never perhaps to return they departed from san gabriel sand but resolute and as far as they could be seen marching off they waved their handkerchiefs as a last farewell 
it was a cruel day to us and from that moment everything grew from bad to worse in acadia chapter four threatening clouds overcast the acadian sky the elders of the colony meet in council to discuss the situation six months passed away without our receiving the least intelligence of what had become of our brave young men this contributed not a little to increase our uneasiness and to sadden our thoughts for we felt in our hearts that they would never return and our forebodings proved too well founded said my grandmother with a faltering voice we have never ascertained their fate we knew however that the war was still progressing and that the french were losing ground every day the english directed all their efforts against canada and seemed to have lost sight of acadia the turmoil and fury of battle in spite of our anxiety and apprehensions the peace and quiet of the colony remained unruffled alas we had been lulled into a security by deceitful hopes and the storm that had swept along canada was about to burst upon us with unchecked fury our day of trial had dawned and doomed victims of a cruel fate we who were about to undergo sufferings beyond human endurance and to experience unparalleled outrages and cruelties our grandmother at this point was overcome by her emotion and hung her head down awed into admiration mingled with reverence for her noble sentiments and for the ardent love she still cherished for her lost country we gazed upon her in silence and understood now why it was that she always wept when she spoke of acadia having mastered her emotions she brushed away her tears and resumed her narrative as follows Pitot, she said in a sweet sad tone your grandmother always weeps when the remembrance of her sufferings and of her wrongs come back to her heart she is an old woman and her tears soothe her grief scars of a wounded heart never heal entirely joy and happiness alone leave no trace of their passage as you shall learn hereafter but why should i speak thus to you soon enough you shall learn more from the teachings of grim experience than from all the sayings and maxims how wise and judicious soever they may be it was bruited at saint gabriel that the english were landing troops in acadia whence came the rumour no one could tell and it would have been impossible to trace it to its source and yet uncertain as it was it created considerable uneasiness in the community bad news travels fast Pitot, and it looks as if some evil genius took delight to dispatch winged messengers to scatter the tidings broadcast over the land the rumour was confirmed in a manner as tragical as it was unexpected one morning at dawn of day a young man was lying unconscious on the green near the church his arm shattered he had bred profusely it was with the greatest difficulty that he was restored to life when he opened his eyes his looks were wild and terrified and despite his weakness he made a desperate effort to rise and flee we quieted him with friendly words and he heaved a deep sigh of satisfaction he had a burning fever and his parched lips quivered as he muttered incoherent words we removed him to the priest's house where his wounds were dressed and when he had recovered from the exhaustion occasioned by the loss of blood he related to us what had happened to him and we listened to his words with breathless suspense 
and anxiety. The English, said he, have landed troops on the eastern coast of Acadia, and are committing the most atrocious cruelties. Their inhumanity surpasses belief. They pillage and burn our villages, and even lay sacrilegious hands on the sacred vessels in our churches. They tear the wives from their husbands, the children from their parents, and they drive their ill-fated victims to the seashore and stow them on ships which sail immediately for unknown lands. They spare only such as become traitors to their faith and to their king. They raided our village at dusk yesterday and have perpetrated there the same wanton outrages and cruelties. They reduced it to ashes and the least expostulation on our part exposed us to be shot down like outlaws. They have driven its inhabitants to the seashores like cattle, and when, through sheer exhaustion, one of their victims fell by the roadside, I have seen the fiends compel him with the butts of their muskets to rise and walk. I have escaped in the darkness of night, with an arm shattered by a random shot, and I have run exhausted by the loss of blood. I fell where you have found me. They will overrun Acadia, and they will not spare you, my friends, if you show any hostility to them. Your town will be raided shortly, and you cannot resist them, my friends. Abandon your homes and seek safety elsewhere while you have the time and chance to do so. You may well imagine, Piton, that our trouble was great when we heard this terrible news. We stood there not knowing what to do, although time was precious, and although it was necessary that we should devise some plan for our safety and protection. In our predicament and in so critical an emergency, our only alternative was to apply to our old curate for advice. He gave us words of encouragement and withdrew with our elders to his room. We remained in the churchyard, grouped together and speaking in whispers, our souls harrowed by the most gloomy and despairing thoughts. O oh, Piton, we often speak of a mortal hour, but the hour that passed away while these men were holding counsel in the curate's room seemed to encompass a year's duration. Our happiness, our all, our life itself, in fact, were at stake and turned on their decision, and we awaited that decision in dreadful suspense. At last our elders, accompanied by our old curate, sallied out of that house with sorrowful countenances, but with steady step and firm resolve written on their brow. Chapter 5. The Acadians Resolve to Leave Acadia as Exiles Rather than submit to English rule, before leaving St. Gabriel, they apply the torch to the houses, and it is swept away by the flames. Their countenance bespoke the gravity of the situation, far more serious indeed than we had realized, and as they approached us in the death-like silence that prevailed, we could distinctly hear the throbbings of our hearts. We were impatient to learn our fate, and yet we dreaded the disclosure. Our anxiety was of short duration, and one of our elders spoke as follows. I repeat his very words, for as they fell from his lips with the solemn sound of a funeral knell, they became engraved upon my heart. My good friends, said he, our hopes were illusionary, and the future is big with ominous threats for us. A cruel and relentless enemy is at our doors. The story of the wounded man is true. The English are applying the torch to our villages, and are spreading and scattering ruin as they advance. They spare neither old age nor infirmity, neither women nor children, and are tender-hearted only to renegades and apostates. Are you ready to accept these humiliating conditions and to be branded as traitors and cowards? Never, we answered, never. 
rather proscription, ruin, and death. My friends, he added, exile is ruin. It is despair. It is desolation. Pause a while and reflect before forming your resolve. Not one of us flinched, and without hesitancy we all cried out, rather than disown our mother country and become apostates, let exile, let ruin, let death be our lot. Your answer is noble and generous, my good friends, and your resolve is sublime, said he. Then let exile be our lot. Many a one has suffered even more than we shall suffer, and for causes less saintly than ours. Let us prepare for the worst, for today we bid adieu forever, perhaps to Acadia, to our homes, to the graves of those we loved so well. We leave friendless and penniless for distant lands. We leave for Louisiana, where we shall be free to honor and reverend France, and to serve our God according to our belief. My good friends, we barely have time to prepare ourselves. Tonight we must be far from San Gabriel. These words chilled our hearts. It seemed to us that all this was a dream, a frightful illusion that clung to our hearts, to our souls, and yet, without a tear, without a complaint, we resigned ourselves to our fate. Ah, it was a cruel day to us, Bertrand. We were leaving Acadia. We were abandoning the homes where our children were born and raised. We were leaving as malefactors, without one ray of hope to lighten our dark future, and it seemed to us that poor, desolate Acadia was dearer to us now that we were forced to leave her forever. Everything we saw, every object that we touched, recalled to our hearts some sweet remembrance of days gone by. Our whole life seemed centered in the furniture of our desolate homes, in the flowers that decked our gardens, in the very trees that shaded our yards, they whispered to us ditties of our blithe childhood. They recalled to us the glowing dreams of our adolescence, illumined with their fleeting illusions. They spoke to us of the hopes and happiness of our maturer years. They had been the mute witnesses of our joys and of our sorrows, and we were leaving them forever. As we gazed upon them, we wept bitterly, and in our despair we felt as if the sacrifice was beyond our strength. But our sense of duty nerved us, and the terrible ordeal we were undergoing did not shake our resolve. And submitting to the will of God, we preferred exile and poverty, with their train of woes and humiliations before dishonoring ourselves by becoming traitors and renegades. In the course of the day, our grief increased, and the scenes that took place were heartrending. I never recalled them without shuddering. Our people, so meek, so peaceable, became frenzied with despair. The women and children wandered from house to house, wailing and uttering piercing cries. Every object of spoil was destroyed, and the torch was applied to the houses. The fire, fanned by a too willing breeze, spread rapidly, and in a moment's time, San Gabriel was wrapped in a lurid sheet of devouring flames. We could hear the crackling of planks tortured by the blaze, the crash of falling roofs, while the flames shot up to an immense height with the hissing and sloughing of a hurricane. Ah, Pito, it was a fair image of pandemonium. The people seemed an army of fiends spreading ruin and desolation in their path. The work oxen were killed, and a few among us, with the hope of a speedy return to Acadia, threw our silverware into the wells. Oh, the ruin, the ruin, Pito. It was horrible. We left San Gabriel, numbering about three hundred, whilst the ashes of our burning houses, carried by the wind, whirled past us like a pillar of light to guide our faltering steps 
to the wilderness that stretched before us. End of Acadian Reminiscences, The True Story of Evangeline by Judge Felix Voorhees, Part 1《Acadian Reminiscences》The True Story of Evangeline by Judge Felix Voorhees Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Wayne Cook Chapter 6 A Night of Terror and of Misery the exiles are captured by the English soldiery. Driven to the seashore and embarked for deportation, they are thrown as castaways on the Maryland shores. The hospitality and generosity of Charles Smith and of Henry Brent. As darkness came, we cast a sad look toward the spot where our peaceful and happy Saint Gabriel once stood. Alas, we could see nothing but the crimson sky reflecting the lurid glare of the flames that devoured our Acadian villages. Not a word fell from our lips as we journeyed slowly on, and as night came its darkness increased our misery, and such was our dejection that we would have faced death without a shudder. At last we halted in a deep ravine shattered by projecting rocks, and we sat down to rest our weary limbs. We built no fires and spoke only in whispers, fearing that the blazing fire, that the least sound, might betray us at our place of concealment. With hearts failing, oppressed with gloomy forebodings, the events of the day seemed to us a frightful dream. Oh, that it had only been a dream, Pito. Alas, it was a sad reality. And yet in our wretchedness we could hardly realize that these events had actually happened. Our elders had withdrawn a few paces away from us to decide on the best course to pursue. For in the hurry of our departure, no plan of action had been decided upon, our main object being to escape the outrages and ill-treatment of the merciless and cruel soldiery. It was decided to reach Canada the best way we could, after which, after crossing the great northern lakes, our journey was to be overland to the Mississippi River, on whose waters we would float down to Louisiana, a French colony inhabited by people of our own race, and professing the same religious creed as ours. But to carry out this plan, Piton, we had to travel thousands of miles through a country barren of civilization, through endless forests and across lakes as wide and deep as the sea. We were to overcome obstacles without number and to encounter dangers and hardships at every step. And yet we remained firm in our resolve. It was exile with its train of woes and of misery. It was perhaps death for many of us, but we submitted to our fate, sacrificing our all in this world for our religion, and for the love of France. We knelt down to implore the aid and protection of God in the many dangers that beset us, and trusting in his kind providence, we lay down on the bare ground to sleep. As you may imagine, Piton, no one save the little children slept that night. We were in a state of mental anguish so agonizing that the hours passed away without bringing the sweet repose of refreshing sleep. When the moon arose, dispelling by degrees the darkness of night, we again pursued our journey. We made the least noise possible as we advanced cautiously, our fears and apprehensions increasing with every step. All at once our column halted, 
a death-like silence prevailed, and our hearts beat tumultuously within us. Was it the beat of the drum that had startled us? No one could tell. We listened with eagerness, but the sound had died away, and the stillness of night remained undisturbed. Our anxiety became intense. Was the enemy in pursuit of us? We remained in peaceful suspense, not knowing what danger looked ahead of us. The few minutes that succeeded seemed as long as a whole year. We drew close together and whispered our apprehensions to one another. We moved on slowly, our footsteps falling noiselessly on the roadway, while we strained our eyes to pierce the shadows of night to discover the cause of our fears. The sound that had startled us was no more heard, and somewhat encouraged our uneasiness grew less. We had not advanced two hundred yards when we were halted by a company of English soldiers. Ah, patrol, our doom was sealed. We were in a narrow path, surrounded by the enemy, without the possibility of escape. How shall I describe what followed? The women wrung their hands and sobbed piteously in their despair. The children, terrified, uttered shrill and piercing cries, while the men, goaded to madness, vented their rage in hurried exclamations, and were determined to sell their lives as dearly as possible. After a while the tumult subsided, and order was somewhat restored. The officer in command approached us. Acadians, said he, you have fled from your homes after having reduced them to ashes. You have used seditious language against England, and we find you here in the depths of night congregated and conspiring against the king, our liege lord and sovereign. You are traitors, and you should be treated as such. But in his clemency, the king offers his pardon to all who are swear fealty and allegiance to him. Sir, answered René Leblanc, under whose guidance we had left Saint Gabriel, our king is the king of France, and we are not traitors to the king of England whose subjects we are not. If by the force of arms you have conquered this country, we are willing to recognize your supremacy, but we are not willing to submit to English rule, and for that reason we have abandoned our homes to emigrate to Louisiana to seek there, under the protection of the French flag, the quiet and peace and happiness we have enjoyed here. The officer, who had listened with folded arms to the noble words of Le Leblanc, replied with a scowl of hatred, To Louisiana you wish to go, to Louisiana you shall go, and seek in vain under the French flag that protection you have failed to receive from it in Canada. Soldiers, he added, with a smile that made us shudder, escort these worthy patriots to the seashore, where transportation will be given them free in his majesty's ships. These words sounded like a death knell to us. We saw plainly that our doom was sealed, and that we were undone forever. And yet in the bitterness of our misfortune, we uttered no word of expostulation, and submitted to our fate without complaint. They treated us most brutally, and had no regards for either age or for sex. They drove us back through the forest to the seashore, where their ships were anchored, and stowing the greater number of our party in one of their ships, they weighed anchor, and she set sail. The balance of our people had been embarked on another vessel which had departed in advance of ours. Is it necessary, Perton, that I should speak to you of our despair when thus torn from our relatives and friends, 
when we saw ourselves cooped up in the hull of that ship as malefactors. Is it necessary that I should describe the horror of our plight, our sufferings, our mental anguish during the many days that our voyage on the sea lasted? This can be more easily imagined than depicted. We were huddled in a space scarcely large enough to contain us. The air rarefied by our breathing became unwholesome and oppressive. We could not lie down to rest our weary limbs. With but scant food, with the water given grudgingly to us, barely enough to wet our parched lips, with no one to care for us, you can well imagine that our sufferings became unbearable. Yet when we expostulated with our jailers and complained bitterly of the excess of our woes, it seemed to rejoice them. They derided us, called us noble patriots, stubborn French people, and papists, epithets that went right to our hearts and added to our misery. At last our ship was anchored, and we were told that we had reached the place of our destination. Was it Louisiana? we inquired. Rude scoffs and sharp invectives were their only answer. We were disembarked with the same ruthless brutality with which we had been dragged to their ship. They landed us on a precipitous and rocky shore and leaving us a few rations, saluted us in derision with their caps and bidding farewell to the noble patriots, as they called us. Our anguish at that moment could hardly be conceived. We were outcasts in a strange land. We were friendless and penniless, with a few rations thrown to us as to dogs. The sun had now set, and we were in an agony of despair. Our only hope rested in the mercy of a kind providence, and with hearts too full for utterance, we knelt down with one accord and silently besought the Lord of hosts to vouchsafe to us that pity and protection which he gives to the most abject of his creatures. Never was a more heartfelt prayer wafted to God's throne. When we arose, hope, once more smiling to us, irradiated our souls and dispelled, as if by magic, the gloom that had settled in our hearts. We felt that none but noble causes lead to martyrdom, and we looked upon ourselves as martyrs of a saintly cause, and, with a clear conscience, we lay down to sleep under the blue canopy of the heavens. The dawn of day found us scattered in groups, discussing the course we were to pursue, and our hearts grew faint anew at the thoughts of the unknown trials that awaited us. At that moment we spied two horsemen approaching our camp. Our hearts fluttered with emotion. The incident, simple as it was, proved to be of great importance to us. We felt as if Providence had not forsaken us, and that the two horsemen, heralds of peace and joy, were his messengers of love in our sore trials. We were not mistaken, Bitoll. When the cavaliers alighted, they addressed us in English, but in words so soft and kind that the sound of the hated language did not grate on our ears and seemed as sweet as that of our own tongue. They bowed gracefully to us, and introduced themselves as Charles Smith and Henry Brent. We are informed, said they, that you are exiles, and that you have been cast penniless on our shores. We have come to greet you, and to welcome you to the hospitality of our roofs. These kind words sank deep in our hearts. Good sirs, answered René Leblanc, you behold a wretched people bereft of their homes and whose only crime is their love for France and their devotion to the Catholic faith. 
And saying this, he raised his hat, and every man of our party did the same. We thank you heartily for your greeting and for your hospitality so generously tendered. See, we number over two hundred persons, and it would be taxing your generosity too heavily. No one but a king could accomplish your noble design. Sir, they answered, we are citizens of Maryland, and we own large estates. We have everything in abundance at our homes, and this abundance we are willing to share with you. Accept our offer, and the Brent and Smith families will ever be grateful to God, who has given them the means to minister to your wants, assuage your afflictions, and soothe your sorrow. How could we decline an offer so generously made? It was impossible for us to find words expressive of our gratitude. Unable to utter a single word, we shook hands with them, but our silence was far more eloquent than any language we could have used. Chapter 7 Assisted by their generous friends Acadians become prosperous, but yearn to rejoin their friends and relatives in Louisiana. The same day we moved to their farms, which lay nearby, and I shall never forget the kind welcome we received from these two families. They vied with each other in their kind offices toward us, and ministered to our wants with so much grace and affability that it gave additional charm and value to their already boundless hospitality. Pitot, let the names of Brent and of Smith remain enchased forever like precious jewels in your hearts. Let their remembrance never fade from your memory, for more generous and worthier beings never breathed the pure air of heaven. Thus it was, Pitot, that we settled in Maryland after leaving Acadia. Three years pass away peacefully and happily. During the whole of that time, the Smith and Brent families remained our steadfast friends. Our party had prospered, and plenty smiled once more in our homes. We lived as happy as exiles could live away from their fatherland, ignorant of the fate of those who had been torn from us so ruthlessly. In vain we had endeavored to ascertain the lot of our friends and relatives and what had become of them. We could learn nothing. Many parents wept for their lost children. Many a disconsolate wife pined away in sorrow and hopeless grief for a lost husband. But Pito, the saddest of all, was the fate of poor Emmeline Labiche. Emmeline Labiche? Who was Emmeline Labiche? We had never heard her name mentioned before, and our curiosity was excited to the highest pitch. Chapter 8 The True Story of Evangeline Emmeline Labiche Bito was an orphan whose parents had died when she was quite a child. I had taken her to my home and had raised her as my own daughter. How sweet-tempered, how loving she was. She had grown to womanhood with all the attractions of her sex. And oh, not of beauty in the sense usually given to that word. She was looked upon as the handsomest girl of San Gabriel. Her soft, transparent hazel eyes mirrored her pure thoughts. Her dark brown hair waved in graceful undulations on her intelligent forehead and fell in ringlets on her shoulders. Her bewitching smile, her slender, symmetrical shape, all contributed to make her a most attractive picture of maiden loveliness. Emmeline, who had just completed her sixteenth year, was on the eve of marrying a most deserving, laborious, and well-to-do young man of San Gabriel, Louis Archenal. Their mutual love, dated from their earliest years, had all agreed that Providence willed their union as man and wife, she the fairest young maiden, and he the most deserving youth of San Gabriel. 
Their banns had been published in the village church. The nuptial day was fixed, and their long love dream was about to be realized when the barbarous scattering of our colony took place. Our oppressors had driven us to the seashore where their ships rode at anchor when Louis, resisting, was brutally wounded by them. Emmeline had witnessed the whole scene. Her lover was carried on board of one of the ships. The anchor was weighed, and a stiff breeze soon drove the vessel out of sight. Emmeline, tearless and speechless, stood fixed to the spot, motionless as a statue, and when the white sail vanished in the distance, she uttered a wild, piercing shriek and fell fainting to the ground. When she came to, she clasped me in her arms, and in an agony of grief, she sobbed piteously. Mother, mother, she said in broken words, he is gone. They have killed him. What will become of me? I soothed her grief with endearing words until she wept freely. Gradually its violence subsided, but the sadness of her countenance betokened the sorrow that preyed on her heart, never to be contaminated by her love for another one. Thus she lives in our midst, always sweet-tempered, but with such sadness depicted in her countenance, and with smiles so sorrowful that we had come to look upon her as not of this earth, but rather as our guardian angel. And this is why we call her no longer Emmeline, but Evangeline, or God's little angel. The sequel of her story is not gay, Petrov, and my poor old heart breaks whenever I recall the misery of her fate. And while our grandmother spoke thus, her whole figure was tremulous with emotion. Grandmother, we said, we feel so interested in Evangeline, God's little angel. Do tell us what befell her afterwards. Pito, how can I refuse to comply with your request? I will now tell you what became of poor Emmeline. And after remaining a while in thoughtful reverie, she resumed her narrative. Emmeline Pito had been exiled to Maryland with me. She was, as I have told you, my adopted child. She dwelt with me, and she followed me in my long pilgrimage from Maryland to Louisiana. I shall not relate to you how the many dangers that beset us on our journey and the many obstacles we had to overcome to reach Louisiana. This would be anticipating what remains for me to tell you. When we reached the Teche country at the Post Atacapa, we found there the whole population congregated to welcome us. As we went ashore, Emmeline walked by my side, but seemed not to admire the beautiful landscape that unfolded itself to our gaze. Alas, it was of no moment to her whether she strolled on the poetic banks of the Tetra or rambled in the picturesque sights of Maryland. She lived in the past, and her soul was absorbed in the mournful regret of that past. For her, the universe had lost the prestige of its beauties, of its freshness, of its splendors. The radiance of her dreams was dimmed, and she breathed in an atmosphere of darkness and of desolation. She walked beside me with a measured step. All at once she grasped my hand, and, as if fascinated by some vision, she stirred rooted to the spot. Her fairy heart's blood suffused her cheeks, and with the silvery tones of a voice vibrating with joy, Mother, mother, she cried out, it is he, it is Louis, pointing to the tall figure of a man reclining under a large oak tree. That man was Louis Arsenault. 
With the rapidity of lightning she flew to his side, and in an ecstasy of joy, Louis, Louis, she said, I am your Emmeline, your long lost Emmeline. Have you forgotten me? Louis turned ashy pale and hung down his head without uttering a word. Louis, she said, painfully impressed by her lover's silence and coldness, why do you turn away from me? I am still your Emmeline, your betrothed. I have kept pure and unsullied my plighted faith to you. Not a word of welcome, Louis, she said as the tears started to arise. Tell me, do tell me that you love me still and that the joy of meeting me has overcome you and stifled your utterance. Louis Auchenault, with quivering lips and tremulous voice, answered, Emmeline, speak not so kindly to me, for I am unworthy of you. I can love you no longer. I have pledged my faith to another. Tear from your heart the remembrance of the past, and forgive me. And with quick step he walked away, and was soon lost to view in the forest. Poor Emmeline stood trembling like an aspen leaf. I took her hand. It was icy cold. A deathly pallor had overspread her countenance, and her eye had a vacant stare. Emmeline, my dear girl, come, said I, and she followed me like a child. I clasped her in my arms. Emmeline, my dear child, be comforted. There may yet be happiness in store for you. Emmeline, Emmeline, she muttered in an undertone as if to recall that name. Who is Emmeline? Then, looking in my face with fearful, shining eyes that made me shudder, she said in a strange and natural voice, Who are you? And turned away from me. Her mind was unhinged. This last shock had been too much for her broken heart. She was hopelessly insane. How strange it is, Pito, that beings pure and celestial like Emmeline should be the sport of fate and be thus exposed to the shafts of adversity. Is it true, then, that the beloved of God are always visited by sword trials? Was it that Emmeline was too ethereal a being for this world, and that God would have her in his sweet paradise? It does not belong to us, Pito, to solve this mystery, and to scrutinize the decrees of providence. We have only to bow submissive to his will. Emmeline never recovered her reason, and a deep melancholy set upon her. Her beautiful countenance was fitfully lighted by a sad smile which made her all the fairer. She had never recognized any one but me, and nestling in my arms like a spoiled child, she would give me the most endearing names, as sweet and as amiable as ever. Everyone pitied and loved her. When poor, crazed Emmeline strolled upon the banks of the Tesha, plucking the wild flowers that strewed her pathway, and singing in soft tones some Acadian song, those that met her wondered why so fair and gentle a being should have been visited with God's wrath. She spoke of Acadia and of Louis in such loving words that no one could listen to her without shedding tears. She fancies herself still, a girl of sixteen years, on the eve of marrying the chosen one of her heart, whom she loved with such constancy and devotion, and imagining that her marriage bells tolled from the village church tower, her countenance would brighten and her frame trembled with ecstatic joy. And then, in a sudden transition from joy to despair, her countenance would change and trembling convulsively, gasping, struggling for utterance, and pointing her finger at some invisible object, 
in shrill and piercing accents, she would cry out, Mother, mother, he is gone. They have killed him. What will become of me? And uttering a wild, unnatural shriek, she would fall senseless in my arms. Sinking at last under the ravages of her mental disease, she expired in my arms without a struggle, and with an angelic smile on her lips. She now sleeps in her quiet grave, shadowed by the tall oak tree near the little church at the Posa de Atacapa, and her grave has been kept green and flower-strewn as long as your grandmother has been able to visit it. Ah, Petol, how sad was the fate of poor Emmeline, Evangeline, God's little angel. And burying her face in her hands, Grandmother wept and sobbed bitterly. Our hearts swelled also with emotion, and sympathetic tears rolled down our cheeks. We withdrew softly and left dear Grandmother alone to think of and weep for Evangeline, God's little angel. Chapter 9 The Acadians Leave Maryland to Go to Louisiana their perilous and weary journey overland, death of René Leblanc. They arrive safely in Louisiana and settle in the Atabacapa region on the Teche and Vermilion bayous. As I have already told you, Pito, during three years we had lived contented and happy in Maryland when we received tidings that a number of Acadians, exiles like us, had settled in Louisiana where they were prospering in retrieving their lost fortunes under the fostering care of the French government. This news, which threw us in a flutter, engrossed our minds so completely that we spoke of nothing else. It gave rise to the most extravagant conjectures in the hope of seeing once more the dear ones torn so cruelly from us was revived in our hearts. This news was deficient, however, in one respect. It left us ignorant of the fate of those who, like us, had been exiled from San Gabriel. That uncertainly cast a gloom over our hopes, which marred our joy and happiness and increased our anxiety. Our suspense became unbearable, and we finally discussed seriously the expediency of emigrating to Louisiana the more timid among us, represented the temerity and folly of such an undertaking. But the desire to seek our brother exiles grew keener every day, and became so deeply rooted in our minds that we concluded to leave for Louisiana, where the banner of France waved over true French hearts. We announced our determination to our benefactors, the Brent and Smith families, and undismayed by the perils that awaited us, and the obstacles we had to overcome, we prepared for our pilgrimage from Maryland to Louisiana. Our friends used all their eloquence to dissuade us from our resolve, but we resisted all their entreaties, although we were deeply touched by this new proof of their friendship. We disposed of the articles that we could not carry along with us, and kept our wagons and horses to transport the women and children in the baggage. In all, we numbered two hundred persons, and of these fifty were well armed and ready to face any danger. We journeyed slowly, the wagons moved in the center, while twenty men in advance and as many in the rear marched four abreast. Ten of the bravest and most active of our young men took the lead a short distance ahead of the column, and formed our advance guard. Our forces were distributed in this wise, patrol for our safety, as the road lay through mountain defiles and in a wild and dreary country inhabited by Indians. We secured as scouts and guides two Indians well known to the Brent family, and in whom we were told we could place the most implicit confidence. We had occasion more than once to find how fortunate we had been to secure their services. We set out on our journey with sorrow. We were parting with friends kind and generous, 
friends who had relieved us in our needs, and who had proved true as steel and loving as brothers. We were parting from them, lured with hopes which might prove illusory, and when we grasped their hands in a last farewell, words failed us, and our tears and sobs told them of our gratitude for the benefits they had so generously showered upon us. They, too, wept, touched to the heart by the eloquent, though mute, expression of our gratitude. Their last words were words of love, glowing with a fervent wish that our cherished hopes might be realized. We set out in a westerly direction, and we had soon lost sight of the hospitable roofs of the Brent and Smith families. We again felt that we were, once more, poor, wandering exiles roaming through the world in search of a home. Our journey, Pateau, was long and tedious, for a thousand obstacles impeded our progress. We encountered deep and rapid streams that we could not cross for want of boats. We traveled through mountain defiles where the pathway was narrow and dangerous, winding over hill and dale, over craggy steeps, where one false step might hurl us down into the yawning chasm below. We suffered from storms and pelting rains, and at night, when we halted to rest our weary limbs, we had only the light canvas of our tents to shelter us from the inclemency of the weather. Ah, Pito, we were undergoing sore trials, but we were lulled by the hope that far, far away in Louisiana, our dreamland, we would find our kith and kin. That radiant hope illumined our pathway. It shone as a beacon light on which we kept our eyes riveted, and it steeled our hearts against sufferings and privations almost too great to be borne otherwise. Thus we advanced fearlessly, I almost cheerfully, and at night, when we pitched our tents in some solitary spot, our Acadian songs broke the silence and loneliness of the solitude, and as the gentle wind wafted them over the hills, the light couplets were re-echoed back to us so clearly and so distinctly that it seemed the voice of some friend repeating them in the distance. As long as we journeyed in Virginia, barring the obstacles presented by the roads of a country diversified by hill and dale, our progress, though slow, was satisfactory. The people were generous and supplied us with an abundance of provisions. But when the white population grew sparser and sparser, and when we reached the wild and mountainous country which, we were told, bore the name of Carolina, then Pitot. It required a stout heart and firm resolve, indeed, not to abandon the attempt to reach Louisiana by the overland route we were following. During days and weeks we had to march slowly and tediously through endless forests, cutting our way across undergrowth so thick as to be almost impervious to light, brushwood where a cruel enemy might lay concealed in ambush to murder us, for we were now in the very heart of the Indian country, and the savages followed us stealthily day and night. We could see them with their tattooed faces and hideous headgear of feathers, frightful in appearance, lurking around in the forest and watching our movements. We were always on the alert, expecting an attack at any moment, for we could distinctly hear the whoops and fierce yells. Ah, Beto! It was then that our mental and bodily anguish became extreme, and that the stoutest heart grew faint under the pressures of some accumulated woes. Our nights were sleepless, and careworn and on the verge of starvation, we moved steadily onward, the very picture of dejection and of despair. Thus we toiled on, day after day and night after night, during two long, weary months on our seemingly endless journey, until, dispirited and disheartened, our courage failed us. It was a dark hour, full of alarming forebodings, 
and we witness the depression of our brother exiles with sorrow and apprehension. But a kind providence watched over us. God tempereth the wind to the shorn lamb. The hope of finding our lost kindred stimulated our drooping spirits. We had been told that Louisiana was a land of enchantment, where perpetual spring reigned, a land where the soil was extremely fertile, where the climate was so genial and temperate, and the sky so serene and azure, as to justly deserve the name of Eden of America. It smiled to us in the distance like the promised land, and toward that land we bent our weary steps, longing for the day when we would tread its soil and breathe once more the pure air in which floated the banner of France. At last we reached the Tennessee River, where it curves gracefully around the base of a mountain looming up hundreds of feet. Its banks were rocky and precipitous, falling straight down at least fifty feet. We could see in the chasm below its waters that flowed majestically on in their course toward the grand old Meshusibi. It was out of the question to cross the river there, and we followed the roadway on its banks around the mountain, advancing cautiously to avoid the danger that threatened us at every step. That night we slept in a large natural cave on the very brink of the precipice by the river. At the dawn of day we resumed our march, and as we advanced, the country became more and more level, and after four days of toil and fatigue, we halted and camped on a hill by the riverside where a small creek runs into the river. We met there a party of Canadian hunters and trappers who gave us a friendly welcome and replenished our store of provisions with game and venison. They informed us that the easiest and least wearisome way to reach Louisiana is to float down the Tennessee and Nashusibi rivers. The plan suggested by them was adopted, and the men of our party, aided by our Canadian friends, felled trees to build a suitable boat. There, Pitot, a great misfortune befell us. We experienced a great loss in the death of René Leblanc, who had been our leader and adviser in the hours of our soul trials. Old age had shattered his constitution, and unequal to the fatigues of our long pilgrimage, he pined away and sank into his grave without a word of complaint. He died the death of a hero and of a Christian, consoling us as we wept beside him and cheering us in our troubles. His death afflicted us sorely, and the night during which he lay exposed preparatory to his burial. The silence was unbroken in our camp, save by our whispered words, as if we feared to disturb the slumbers of the great and good man that slept the eternal sleep. We buried him at the foot of the hill in a grove of walnut trees. We carved his name with a cross over it on the bark of the tree sheltering his grave. And after having said the prayers for the dead, we closed his grave, wet with the tears of those who had loved him so well. My narrative has not been gay, but all, oh, but the gloom that darkened it will now be dispelled by the radiant sunshine of joy and happiness. Our boat was unwieldy, but it served our purpose well. We stored in it our baggage and supplies. We sold our horses and wagons to our Canadian friends, and taking leave of our Indian guides, we cut loose the moorings of the boat. We floated downstream, our young men rowing and singing Acadian songs. Nothing of importance happened to us after our embarkment pitot. During the day we traveled, and at night we moored our boat safely and encamped on the banks of the river. At last we launched on the turbulent waters of the Mississippi and floated down that noble stream as far as Bayou Plaquemines, in Louisiana, where we landed. Once more we were treading French soil, and we were freed from English dominion. As the tidings of our arrival spread abroad, a great number of Acadian exiles flocked to our camp to greet and welcome us. Ah, but all, how can I describe our joy and rapture when you recognized countenances familiar to us, 
Grasping their hands with hearts too full for utterance, we wept like children. Many a sorrowing heart revived to love and happiness on that day. Many a wife pressed to her bosom a long-lost husband. Many a fond parent clasped in rapturous embrace a loving child. Ah, such a moment repaid us a thousandfold for all our sufferings and privations, and we spent the day in rejoicing, our conviviality and merriment. The sequel of my story will be quickly told, Pitot. Shortly afterwards, we left for the Cheche region, where lands had been granted to us by the government. We wended our way to our destined homes, through dismal swamps, through bayous without number, and across lakes until we reached Portage Sauvage at False Point. The next day we were at the post de Atacapa, a small hamlet having two or three houses, one store and a small wooden church situated in Bayou Teche, which we crossed in a boat. There the several Acadians separated to settle on the lands granted to them. You must not imagine, Brito, that the Teche region was, at that time, dotted all over like nowadays with rising farms and elegant houses and handsome villages. No, Pito, it required the nerve and perseverance of your Acadian fathers to settle there. Although beautiful and picturesque, it was a wild region inhabited mostly by Indians and by a few white men, trappers and hunters by occupation. Its immense prairies, covered with weeds as tall as you, were the commons where herds of cattle and of deer roamed unmolested save by the hunter and the panther. Such was the region your ancestors settled, and which by their energy they have transformed into a garden teeming with wealth. The Acadians enriched themselves in a country where no one will starve if he is industrious, and where one may easily become rich if he fears God, and if he is economical and orderly in his affairs. Pitro, I have kept my promise, and my tale is told. Your Acadian fathers were martyrs in a noble cause, and you should always be proud to be the sons of martyrs and of men of principles. Grandmother, we said, as we kissed her fondly, your words have fallen in willing and loving hearts, and they will bear fruit. We are now proud of being called Acadians, for there never was any people more noble, more devoted to duty, and more patriotic than the Acadians who became exiles, and who braved death itself rather than renounce their faith, their king, and their country. Finis. End of Acadian Reminiscences The True Story of Evangeline by Judge Felix Voorhees Part 2This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Civil Rights Bill, as adopted by Congress, March 1866. Section 1. That all persons in the United States, and not subject to any foreign power, excluding Indians not taxed, are hereby declared to be citizens of the United States, and such citizens of every race and color, without regard to any previous condition of slavery or involuntary service, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall have the same right in every state and territory to make and enforce contracts to sue to be sued be parties and give evidence to inherit purchase lease sell hold and convey personal property and to full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of person and property as are enjoyed by white citizens 
and shall be subject to the like punishment pains and penalties and to none other any law statute ordinance regulation or custom to the contrary notwithstanding section two and that any person who under color of any law statute ordinance regulation or custom shall subject or cause to be subjected any inhabitant of any state or territory to the deprivation of any right secured or protected by this act or to punishment pains and penalties on account of such person having at any time been held in a condition of slavery or involuntary servitude except for the punishment of crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted or by the reason of his color or race that is prescribed for the punishment of white persons shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor and on conviction shall be punished by a fine not exceeding one thousand dollars or imprisonment not exceeding one year or both at the discretion of the court section three that the district courts of the united states within their respective districts shall have exclusively of the courts of the several states cognizance of all crimes and offences committed against the provisions of this act and also concurrently with the circuit courts of the united states of all causes civil and criminal affecting persons who are denied or cannot enforce in the courts of judicial tribunal of the state or locality where they may be any of the rights secured to them by the first section of this act and if any suit or prosecution civil or criminal has been or shall be commenced in any state court against any such person for any cause whatsoever civil or military or any other person any arrest or imprisonment trespasses or wrong done or committed by virtue or under color of authority derived from this act or the act establishing a bureau for the relief of freed men and refugees and all acts amendatory thereof or for refusing to do any act upon the ground that it would be inconsistent with this act such defendant shall have the right to remove such cause for trial to the proper district or circuit court in the manner prescribed by the act relating to habeas corpus and regulating judicial proceedings in certain cases approved march three eighteen sixty three and all acts amendatory thereto the jurisdiction in civil and criminal matters hereby conferred on the district and circuit courts of the united states shall be exercised and enforced in conformity with the laws of the united states so far as such laws are suitable to carry the same into effect but in all cases where such laws are not adapted to the object or are deficient in the provisions necessary to furnish suitable remedies and punish offenses against the law the common law as modified and changed by the constitution and statutes of the state wherein the court having jurisdiction of the cause civil or criminal is held so far as the same is not inconsistent with the constitution and laws of the united states shall be extended and govern the said courts in the trial and disposition of such causes and if of a criminal nature in the infliction of punishment on the party found guilty section four that the district attorneys marshals and deputy marshals of the united states the commissioners appointed by the circuit and territorial courts of the united states with power of arresting imprisoning or bailing offenders against the laws of the united states the officers and agents of the freedmen's bureau and every other officer who may be specially empowered by the president of the united states shall be and they are hereby specially authorized and required at the expense of the united states 
to institute proceedings against all and every person who shall violate the provisions of this act and cause him or them to be arrested and imprisoned or bailed as the case may be for trial before such of the united states or territorial courts as by this act have cognizance of the offence and with a view to affording reasonable protection to all persons in their constitutional rights of equality before the law without distinction of race or color or previous condition of slavery or involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted and the prompt discharge of the duties of this act it shall be the duty of the circuit courts of the united states and the superior courts of the territories of the united states from time to time to increase the number of commissioners so as to afford a speedy and convenient means for the arrest and examination of persons charged with the violation of this act section five that said commissioners shall have concurrent jurisdiction with the judges of the circuit and district courts of the united states and the judges of the superior courts of the territories severally and collectively in term time and vacation upon satisfactory proof being made to issue warrants and precepts for arresting and bringing before them all offenders against the provisions of this act and on examination to discharge admit to bail or commit them for trial as the facts may warrant section six and such commissioners are hereby authorized and required to exercise and discharge all the powers and duties conferred on them by this act and the same duties with regard to offences created by this act as they are authorized by law to exercise with regard to other offences against the laws of the united states that it shall be the duty of all marshals and deputy marshals to obey and execute all warrants and precepts issued under the provisions of this act when to them directed and should any marshal or deputy marshal refuse to receive such warrant or other process when tendered or to use all proper means diligently to execute the same he shall on conviction thereof be fined in the sum of one thousand dollars to the use of the person upon whom the accused is alleged to have committed the offence and the better to enable the said commissioners to execute their duties faithfully and efficiently in conformity with the constitution of the united states and the requirements of this act they are hereby authorized and empowered within their counties respectively to appoint in writing under their hands one or more suitable persons from time to time to execute all such warrants and other process as may be issued by them in the lawful performance of their respective duties and the person so appointed to execute any warrant or process as aforesaid shall have authority to summon and call to their aid the bystanders of a posse comitatus of the proper county or such portion of the land or naval forces of the united states or of the militia as may be necessary to the performance of the duty with which they are charged and to ensure a faithful observance of the clause of the constitution which prohibits slavery in conformity with the provisions of this act and said warrants shall run and be executed by said officers anywhere in the state or territory within which they are issued section seven that any person who shall knowingly and wrongfully obstruct hinder or prevent any officer or other person charged with the execution of any warrant or process issued under the provisions of this act or any persons or persons lawfully assisting him or them from arresting any person for whose apprehension such warrant or process may have been issued 
or shall rescue or attempt to rescue such persons from the custody of the officer other person or persons or those lawfully assisting as aforesaid when so arrested pursuant to the authority herein given and declared or shall aid abet or assist any person so arrested as aforesaid directly or indirectly to escape from the custody of the officer or other persons legally authorized as aforesaid or shall harbor or conceal any person for whom a warrant or process shall have been issued as aforesaid so as to prevent his discovery and arrest after notice of knowledge of the fact that a warrant has been issued for the apprehension of such person shall for either of said offences be subject to a fine not exceeding one thousand dollars and imprisonment not exceeding six months by indictment before the district court of the united states for the district in which said offence may have been committed or before the proper court of criminal jurisdiction if committed within any one of the organized territories of the united states section eight that the district attorneys the marshals their deputies and the clerks of the said district and territorial courts shall be paid for their services the like fees as may be allowed to them for similar services in other cases and in all cases where the proceedings are before a commissioner he shall be entitled to a fee of ten dollars in full for his services in each case inclusive of all services incident to such arrest and examination the person or persons authorized to execute the process to be issued by such commissioners for the arrest of offenders against the provisions of this act shall be entitled to a fee of five dollars for each person he or they may arrest and take before any such commissioner as aforesaid with such other fees as may be deemed reasonable by such commissioner for such other additional services as may be necessarily performed by him or them such as attending at the examination keeping the prisoner in custody and providing food and lodgings during his detention and until the final determination of such commissioner and in general for performing such other duties as may be required in the premises such fees to be made up in conformity with the fees usually charged by the officers of the court of justice within the proper district or county as near as practicable and paid out of the treasury of the united states on the certificate of the district within which the arrest is made and to be recoverable from the defendant as part of the judgment in case of conviction section nine that whenever the president of the united states shall have reason to believe that offences have been or are likely to be committed against the provisions of this act within any judicial district it shall be lawful for him in his discretion to direct the judge marshal and district attorney of such district to attend at such place within the district and for such time as he may designate for the purpose of a more speedy arrest and trial of persons charged with the violation of this act and it shall be the duty of every judge or other officer when any such requisition shall be received by him to attend at the place for the time therein designated section ten that it shall be lawful for the president of the united states or such persons as he may empower for that purpose to employ such part of the land or naval forces of the united states or of the militia as shall be necessary to prevent the violation and enforce the due execution of this act section eleven that upon all questions of law arising in any cause under the provisions of this act a final appeal may be taken to the supreme court of the united states end of civil rights bill as adopted by congress march eighteen sixty six 
by the Congress of the United States. The Cruise of the Wasp by Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. A crash as when some swollen cloud cracks o'er the tangled trees. With side to side and spar to spar, whose smoking decks are these? I know St. George's blood-red cross, thou mistress of the seas, but what is she whose streaming bars roll out before the breeze? Ah, well her iron ribs are knit, whose thunder strives to quell the bellowing throats, the blazing lips, that peel the armada's knell. The mist was cleared, a wreath of stars rose o'er the crimson to swell, and wavering from its haughty peak, the cross of England fell. Holmes. In the War of 1812, the little American navy, including only a dozen frigates and sloops of war, won a series of victories against the English, the hitherto undoubted masters of the sea, that attracted an attention altogether out of proportion to the force of the combatants or the actual damage done. For one hundred and fifty years the English ships of war had failed to find fit rivals in those of any other European power, although they had been matched against each in turn. And when the unknown navy of the new nation going up across the Atlantic did what no European navy had ever been able to do, not only the English and Americans, but the people of continental Europe as well, regarded the feat as important out of all proportion to the material aspects of the case. The Americans first proved that the English could be beaten at their own game on the sea. They did what the huge fleets of France, Spain, and Holland had failed to do, and the great modern writers on naval warfare in continental Europe, like the men of Jean de la Gravière, have paid the same attention to these contests of frigates and sloops that they gave to whole fleet actions of other wars. Among the famous ships of the Americans in this war were two named the Wasp. The first was an eighteen-gun ship sloop, which at the very onset of the war captured a British brig sloop of twenty guns, after an engagement in which the British fought with great gallantry, but were knocked to pieces, while the Americans escaped comparatively unscathed. Immediately afterward a British seventy-four captured the victor. In memory of her, the Americans gave the same name to one of the new sloops they were building. These sloops were stoutly made, speedy vessels, which in strength and swiftness compared favorably with any ships of their class in any other navy of the day, for the American shipwrights were already as famous as the American gunners and seamen. The new Wasp, like her sister ship, carried twenty-two guns and a crew of one hundred and seventy men, and was ship-rigged. Twenty of her guns were thirty-two-pound carronades, while for boat-chasers she had two long toms. It was in the year 1814 that the Wasp sailed from the United States to prey on the navy and commerce of Great Britain. Her commander was a gallant South Carolinian named Captain Johnson Blakely. Her crew were nearly all Native Americans, and were an exceptionally fine set of men. Instead of staying near the American coasts or of sailing the high seas, the Wasp at once headed boldly for the English Channel to carry the war to the very doors of the enemy. At that time the English fleets had destroyed the navies of every other power of Europe, and had obtained such complete supremacy over the French that the French fleets were kept in port. Off these ports lay the great squadrons of the English ships of the line, never in gale or in calm, relaxing their watch upon the rival warships of the French emperor. So close was the blockade of the French ports, and so hopeless were the French of making headway in battle with their antagonists, that not only the great French three-deckers and two-deckers, but their frigates and sloops as well, lay harmless in their harbors, and the English ships patrolled the seas unchecked in every direction. A few French privateers still slipped out now and then, and the far bolder and more formidable American privateersmen drove hither and thither across the ocean in their swift schooners and brigantines, 
and harried the English commerce without mercy. The Wasps proceeded at once to cruise in the English Channel and off the coasts of England, France, and Spain. Here the water was transversed continually by English fleets and squadrons and single ships of war, which were sometimes convoying detachments of troops for Wellington's Peninsular Army, sometimes guarding fleets of merchant vessels bound homeward, and sometimes merely cruising for foes. It was this spot, right in the teeth of the British naval power, that the Wasp chose for her cruising grounds. Hither and thither she sailed through the narrow seas, capturing and destroying the merchantmen, and by the seamanship of her crew and the skill and vigilance of her commander, escaping the pursuit of frigate and ship of the line. Before she had been long on the ground, one June morning, while in chase of a couple of merchant ships, she spied a sloop of war, the British brig Reindeer, of eighteen guns and a hundred and twenty men. The Reindeer was a weaker ship than the Wasp, her guns were lighter and her men fewer, but her commander, Captain Manners, was one of the most gallant men in the splendid British Navy, and he promptly took up the gauge of battle which the Wasp threw down. The day was calm and nearly still. Only a light wind stirred across the sea. At one o'clock the Wasp's drum beat to quarters, and the sailors and marines gathered at their appointed posts. The drum of the reindeer responded to the challenge, and with her sails reduced to fighting trim, her guns ran out, and every man ready, she came down upon the Yankee ship. On her forecastle she had rigged a light carronade, and coming up from behind, she five times discharged this point-blank into the American sloop. Then in the light air the latter luffed around, firing her guns as she bore, and the two ships engaged yard-arm to yard-arm. The guns leaped and thundered as the grimy gunners hurled them out to fire and back again to load, working like demons. For a few minutes the cannonade was tremendous, and the men in the tops could hardly see the decks for the wreck of flying splinters. Then the vessels ground together, and through the open ports the rival gunners hewed, hacked, and thrust at one another, while the black smoke curled up from between the hulls. The English were suffering terribly. Captain Manners himself was wounded, and realizing that he was doomed to defeat, unless by some desperate effort he could avert it, he gave the signal to board. At the call the boarders gathered, naked to the waist, black with powder and spattered with blood, cutlass and pistol in hand. But the Americans were ready. Their marines were drawn up on deck. The pikemen stood behind the bulwarks, and the officers watched, cool and alert, every movement of the foe. Then the British sea-dogs tumbled aboard, only to perish by shot or steel. The combatants slashed and stabbed with savage fury, and the assailants were driven back. Manners sprang to their head to lead them again himself, when a ball fired by one of the sailors in the American tops crashed through his skull, and he fell, sword in hand, with his face to the foe, dying as honorable a death as ever a brave man died in fighting against odds for the flag of his country. As he fell, the American officers passed the word to board. With wild cheers, the fighting sailormen sprang forward, sweeping the wreck of the British force before them, and in a minute the reindeer was in their possession. All of her officers and nearly two-thirds of the crew were killed or wounded, but they had proved themselves as skillful as they were brave, and twenty-six of the Americans had been killed or wounded. Quote, the Wasp set fire to her prize, and after retiring to a French port to refit, came out again to cruise. For some time she met no antagonist of her own size with which to wage war, and she had to exercise the sharpest vigilance to escape capture. Late one September afternoon, when she could see ships of war all around her, she selected one which was isolated from the others, and decided to run alongside her and try to sink her after nightfall. But accordingly she set her sails in pursuit and drew steadily towards her antagonist, a big eighteen-gun brig, the Avon, a ship more powerful than the reindeer. The Avon kept signaling to two other British war vessels which were in sight, one an eighteen-gun brig and the other a twenty-one-gun ship. They were so close that the Wasp was afraid they would interfere before the combat could be ended. Nevertheless, Blakely persevered and made his attack with equal skill and daring. It was after dark when he ran alongside his opponent, 
and they began forthwith to exchange furious broadsides. As the ships plunged and wallowed in the seas, the Americans could see the clusters of topmen in the rigging of their opponent, but they knew nothing of the vessel's name or of her force, save only so far as they felt it. The firing was fast and furious, but the British shot with bad aim, while the skilled American gunners hulled their opponent at almost every discharge. In a very few minutes the Avon was in a sinking condition, and she struck her flag and cried for quarter, having lost forty or fifty men. Well, but three of the Americans had fallen. Before the Wasp could take possession of her opponent, however, the two war vessels, to which the Avon had been signaling, came up. One of them fired at the Wasp, and as the latter could not fight two foes, she ran off easily before the wind. Neither of her new antagonists followed her, devoting themselves to picking up the crew of the sinking Avon. It would be hard to find a braver feat more skillfully performed than this, for Captain Blakely, with hostile forces all round him, had closed with and sunk in one antagonist, not greatly his inferior in force, suffering hardly any loss himself while two of her friends were coming to her help." End quote. Both before and after this, the Wasp cruised hither and thither making prizes. Once she came across a convoy of ships bearing arms and munitions to Wellington's army, under the care of a great two-decker. Hovering about, the swift sloop evaded the two-decker's movements, and actually cut out and captured one of the transports she was guarding, making her escape unharmed. Then she sailed for the high seas. She made several other prizes, and on October 9th spoke a Swedish brig. This was the last that was ever heard of the gallant wasp. She never again appeared, and no trace of any of those aboard her was ever found. Whether she was wrecked on some desert coast, whether she foundered in some furious gale, or what befell her, none ever knew. All that is certain is that she perished and that all on board her met death in some one of the myriad forms in which it must always be faced by those who go down to the sea in ships. And when she sank, there sank one of the most gallant ships of the American Navy, with as brave a captain and crew as ever sailed from any port of the New World. End of Cruise of the Wasp by Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge The Discovery of Witches by Matthew Hopkins. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gantz. The Discovery of Witches. In answer to several queries, lately delivered to the judges of Assize for the County of Norfolk, and now published by Matthew Hopkins, Witchfinder for the benefit of the whole kingdom. 1647 Exodus 22.18 Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Certain queries answered, which have been, and are likely to be objected against Matthew Hopkins, in his way of finding out witches. Query 1 that he must needs be the greatest witch, sorcerer, and wizard himself, else he could not do it. Answer. If Satan's kingdom be divided against itself, how shall it stand? Query 2. If he never went so far as is before mentioned, yet for certain he met with the devil, and cheated him of his book, wherein were written all the witches' names in England, and if he looks on any witch he can tell by her countenance what she is, so by this his help is from the devil. Answer. If he had been too hard for the devil and got his book, it had been to his great commendation, and no disgrace at all, and for judgment in physiognomy he hath no more than any man else whatsoever. Query 3. From whence then proceeded this his skill? Was it from his profound learning, or from much reading of learned authors concerning that subject? Answer. From neither of both, but from experience, which though it be meanly esteemed of, yet the surest and safest way to judge by. Query 4. I pray, where was this experience gained? 
and why gained by him and not others? Answer. The discoverer never traveled far for it, but in March 1644 he had some seven or eight of that horrible sect of witches living in the town where he lived, a town in Essex called Manningtree, with diverse and other adjacent witches of other towns, who every six weeks in the night being always on the Friday night, had their meeting close by his house, and had their several solemn sacrifices there offered to the devil, one of which this discoverer heard speaking to her imps one night, and bid them go to another witch, who was thereupon apprehended and searched by women, who had for many years known the devil's marks, and found to have three teats about her, which honest women have not. So upon command from the justice they were to keep her from sleep two or three nights, expecting in that time to see her familiars, which the fourth night she called in by their several names, and told them what shapes, a quarter of an hour before they came in, there being ten of us in the room. The first she called was... 1. Holt, who came in like a white kitling. 2. Jarmara, who came in like a fat spaniel without any legs at all. She said she kept him fat, for she clapped her hand on her belly and said he sucked good blood from her body. 3. Vinegar Tom, who was like a long-legged greyhound with an head like an ox, with a long tail and broad eyes, who when this discoverer spoke to and bade him go to the place provided for him and his angels, immediately transformed himself into the shape of a child of four years old without a head, and gave half a dozen turns about the house, and vanished at the door. 4. Sack and sugar, like a black rabbit. 5. Newes, like a polecat. All of these vanished away in a little time. Immediately after, this witch confessed several other witches, from whom she had her imps, and named to diverse women where their marks were, their number of their marks and imps and imps' names, as Elamanzer, Pie Wacket, Peckin the Crown, Grizzle, Greedy Gut, etc., which no mortal could invent. And upon their searches, the same marks were found, the same number, and in the same place, and the like confessions from them of the same imps, though they knew not that we were told before, and so peached one another thereabouts that joined together in the like damnable practice that in our hundred in Essex, twenty-nine were condemned at once, four brought twenty-five miles to be hanged where this discoverer lives, for sending the devil like a bear to kill him in his garden. So by seeing diverse of the men's paps, and trying ways with hundreds of them, he gained this experience." and for aught he knows any man else may find them as well as he and his company, if they had the same skill and experience. Query 5. Many poor people are condemned for having a pap or teat about them, whereas many people, especially ancient people, are, and have been a long time, troubled with natural rets on several parts of their bodies, and other natural excrescences, such as hemorrhoids, piles, childbearing, etc., and these shall be judged only by one man alone and a woman, and so accused or acquitted. Answer. The parties so judging can justify their skill to any, and show good reasons why such marks are not merely natural, neither that they can happen by any such natural cause as is before expressed, and for further answer for their private judgments alone, it is most false and untrue, for never was any man tried by search of his body, but commonly a dozen of the ablest men in the parish or elsewhere were present, and most commonly as many ancient skillful matrons and midwives present when the women are tried, which marks not only he and his company attest to be very suspicious, but all beholders, the skillfulest of them, do not approve of them, but likewise assent that such tokens cannot in their judgments proceed from any the above-mentioned causes. Query 6. It is a thing impossible for any or woman to judge rightly on such marks. They are so near to natural excrescences, and that they find them, durst not presently give oath that they were drawn by evil spirits, till they have used unlawful courses of torture to make them say anything for ease and quiet, as who would not do? 
but I would know the reasons he speaks of, how and whereby to discover the one from the other, and so be satisfied in that. Answer. The reasons in brief are three, which for the present he judgeth to differ from natural marks which are. 1. He judgeth by the unusualness of the place where he findeth the teats in or on their bodies, being far distant from any usual place, from whence such natural marks proceed, as if a witch pled the marks found are emeroids. If I find them on the bottom of the backbone, shall I assent with him, knowing they are not near that vein, and so others by childbearing, when it may be they are in the contrary part? 2. They are most commonly insensible and feel neither pin, needle, awl, etc. thrust through them. 3. The often variations and mutations of these marks into several forms confirms the matter, as if a witch hear a month or two before that the witch-finder, as they call him, is coming, they will and have put out their imps to others to suckle them, even their own young and tender children. These upon search are found to have dry skins and films only, and be close to the flesh, Keep her twenty-four hours with a diligent eye that none of her spirits come in any visible shape to suck her. The women have seen the next day after her teats extended out to their former filling length, full of corruption ready to burst, and leaving her alone then one quarter of an hour, and let the women go up again, and she will have them drawn by her imps close again. Probatum est. Now for answer to their tortures in its due place. Query 7. How can it possibly be that the devil bring a spirit, and wants no nutriment or sustentation, should desire to suck any blood? And indeed, as he is a spirit, he cannot draw any such excrescences, having neither flesh nor bone, nor can be felt, etc. Answer. He seeks not their blood, as if he could not subsist without that nourishment. But he often repairs to them, and gets it to the more to aggravate the witch's damnation, and to put her in mind of her covenant. And as he is a spirit and a prince of the air, he appears to them in any shape whatsoever, which shape is occasioned by him through joining of condensed thickened air together, and many times doth assume shapes of many creatures. But to create any thing he cannot do it, it is only proper to God. But in this case, drawing out of these teats, he doth really enter into the body, real corporal substantial creature, and forceth that creature he working in it to his desired ends, and useth the organs of the body to speak withal to make his compact up with the witches, be the creature cat, rat, mouse, etc. Query 8. When these paps are fully discovered, yet that will not serve sufficiently to convict them, but they must be tortured and kept from sleep two or three nights to distract them and make them say anything, which is a way to tame a wild colt or hawk, etc. Answer. In the infancy of this discovery it was not only thought fitting, but enjoined in Essex and Suffolk by the magistrates, with this intention only, because they, being kept awake, would be more the active to call their imps in open view the sooner to their help, which oftentimes have so happened, and never or seldom did any witch ever complain in the time of their keeping for want of rest, but after they had beat their heads together in the jail, and after this use was not allowed of by the judges and other magistrates, it was never since used, which is a year and a half since, Neither were any kept from sleep by any order or direction since, but peradventure their own stubborn wills did not let them sleep, though tendered and offered to them. Query 9. Beside that unreasonable watching, they were extraordinarily walked till their feet were blistered, and so forced through that cruelty to confess, etc. Answer. It was in the same beginning of this discovery, and the meaning of walking them at the highest extent of cruelty was only they to walk about themselves the night they were watched, only to keep them waking. And the reason was this. When they did lie or sit in a chair, if they did offer to couch down, then the watchers were only to desire them to sit up and walk about, for indeed when they be suffered so to couch, immediately comes their familiars into the room and scareth the watchers, and hearteneth on the witch, 
though contrary to the true meaning of the same instructions, diverse have been by rustical people, they hearing them confess to be witches misused, spoiled and abused, diverse whereof have suffered for the same, but could never be proved against this discoverer to have a hand in it, or consent to it, and hath likewise been unused by him and others, ever since the time they were kept from sleep. Query 10. But there hath been an abominable, inhumane, and unmerciful trial of these poor creatures, by tying them and heaving them into the water, a trial not allowable by law or conscience, and I would fain know the reasons for that. Answer. It is not denied, but many were so served as had paps, and floated, and others that had none were tried with them and sunk, but mark the reasons. For first, the divil's policy is great in persuading many to come of their own accord to be tried, persuading them their marks are so close they shall not be found out, so as diverse have come ten or twelve miles to be searched of their own accord, and hanged for their labor, as one Megs a baker did, who lived within seven miles of Norwich, and was hanged at Norwich Assizes for witchcraft. Then, when they find out that the devil tells them false, they reflect on him, and he, as forty have confessed, adviseth them to be sworn, and tells them they shall sink and be cleared that way. Then when they be tried that way and float, they see the devil deceives them again, and have so laid open his treacheries. Two, it was never brought in against any of them at their trials as any evidence. Three, King James in his demonology saith it is a certain rule for, saith he, Witches deny their baptism when they covenant with the devil, water being the sole element thereof, and therefore, saith he, when they be heaved into the water, the water refuseth to receive them into her bosom, they being such miscreants to deny their baptism, and suffers them to float, as the froth on the sea, which the water will not receive, but casts it up and down till it comes to the earthy element the shore, and there leaves it to consume. For, observe these generation of witches, if they be at any time abused by being called whore, thief, etc., by anywhere they live, they are the readiest to cry and wring their hands and shed tears in abundance, and run with full and right sorrowful acclamations to some justice of the peace, and with many tears make their complaints. But now behold their stupidity nature or the element's reflection from them, when they are accused for this horrible and damnable sin of witchcraft, they never alter or change their countenances, nor let one tear fall. This, by the way, swimming, by able divines who I reference, is condemned for no way, and therefore of late hath, and for ever shall, be left. Query 11 Oh, but if this torturing witch-catcher can by all or any of these means wring out a word or two of confession from any of these stupefied, ignorant, unintelligible, poor, silly creatures, though none hear it but himself, he will add and put her in fear to confess, telling her else she shall be hanged, but if she do, he will set her at liberty, and so put a word into her mouth, and make such a silly creature confess she knows not what. Answer. He is of a better conscience, and for your better understanding of him he doth thus uncase himself to all, and declares what confessions, though made by a witch against herself, he allows not of, and doth altogether account of no validity or worthy of credence to be given to it, and ever did so account it, and ever likewise shall. 1. He utterly denies the confession of a witch to be of any validity, when it is drawn from her by any torture or violence whatsoever, although after watching, walking, or swimming, diverse have suffered, yet peradventure magistrates with much care and diligence did solely and fully examine them after sleep, and consideration sufficient. 2. He utterly denies that confession of a witch which is drawn from her by flattery, that is, if you will confess you shall go home, you shall not go to the jail, nor be hanged, and etc., 3. He utterly denies that confession of a witch, when she confesseth any improbability, impossibility, as in flying in the air, riding on a broom, etc. 4. He utterly denies a confession of a witch, when it is interrogated to her and words put into her mouth, to be of any force or effect, as to say a silly, yet witch wicked enough, 
You have four imps, have you not? She answers affirmatively, yes. Did they not suck you? Yes, saith she. Are not their names so and so? Yes, saith she. Did not you send such an imp to kill my child? Yes, saith she. This being all her confession after this matter, it is by him accounted nothing, and he earnestly doth desire that all magistrates and jurors would a little more than ever they did examine witnesses about the interrogated confessions. Query 12. If all those confessions be denied, I wonder what he will make confession. For sure it is all these ways have been used and took for good confessions, and many have suffered for them, and I know not what he will then make confession. Answer. Yes, in brief, he will declare what confession of a witch is of validity and force in his judgment to hang a witch. When a witch is first found with teats, then sequestered from her house, which is only to keep her old associates from her, and so by good counsel brought into a sad condition, by understanding of the horribleness of her sin and the judgments threatened against her, and knowing the devil's malice and subtle circumventions, is brought to remorse and sorrow for complying with Satan so long, and disobeying God's sacred commands, doth then desire to unfold her mind with much bitterness, and then without any of the before-mentioned hard usages or questions put to her, doth of her own accord declare what was the occasion of the devil's appearing to her, whether ignorance, pride, anger, malice, etc. was predominant over her, she doth then declare what speech they had, what likeness he was in, what voice be had, what familiars he sent, what number of spirits, what names they had, what shape they were in, what employment she set them about to several persons in several places, unknown to the hearers, all which mischiefs being proved to be done, at the same time she confessed to the same parties for the same cause, and all affected is testimony enough against her for all her denial. Question 13. How can any possibly believe that the devil and the witch joining together should have such power, as the witch confesses to kill such a man, child, horse, cow, the like? If we believe they can do what they will, then we derogate from God's power, who for certain limits the devil and the witch, and I cannot believe they have any power at all. Answer. God suffers the devil many times to do much hurt and the devil doth play many times the deluder and impostor with these witches, in persuading them that they are the cause of such and such a murder wrought by him with their consents, when, and indeed, neither he nor they had any hand in it as thus. We must needs argue he is of a long standing above six thousand years, then he must needs be the best scholar in all knowledges of arts and tongues, and so have the best skill in physic, judgment, and physiognomy, and knowledge of what disease is reigning or predominant in this or that man's body, and so for cattle too, by reason of his long experience. This subtle tempter, knowing such a man liable to some sudden disease, as by experience I have found, as pleurisy, imposthume, etc., he resorts to diverse witches. If they know the man and seek to make a difference between the witches and the party, it may be by telling them he hath threatened to have them very shortly searched, and so hanged for witches. Then they all consult with Satan to save themselves, and Satan stands already prepared, with a, What will you have me do for you, my dear and nearest children, covenant and compacted with me in my hellish league, and sealed with your blood, my delicate firebrand darlings? O thou, say they, that at the first didst promise to save us thy servants from any of our deadly enemies' discovery, and didst promise to avenge and flay all those we pleased that did offend us, murder that wretch suddenly who threatens the downfall of your loyal subjects. He then promiseth to effect it. Next news is heard, the party is dead. He comes to the witch and gets a world of reverence, credence, and respect for his power and activeness, when and indeed the disease kills the party, not the witch nor the devil. Only the devil knew that such a disease was predominant, and the witch aggravates her damnation by her familiarity and consent to the devil, and so comes likewise in compass of the laws. This is Satan's usual imposturing and deluding, but not his constant course of proceeding for he and the witch do mischief too much. 
but I would that magistrates and jurats would a little examine witnesses when they hear witches confess such and such a murder, whether the party had not long time before, or at the time when the witch grew suspected, some disease or other predominant, which might cause that issue or effect of death. Query 14. All that the witch-finder doth is to fleece the country of their money, and therefore rides and goes to towns to have employment, and promiseth them fair promises, and it maybe doth nothing for it, and possesseth many men that they have so many wizards and so many witches in their town, and so heartens them on to entertain him. Answer. You do him a great deal of wrong in every of these particulars. For first, one, he never went to any town or place but they rode, writ, or sent often for him, and were, for aught he knew, glad of him. Two, he is a man that doth disclaim that ever he detected a witch, or said thou art a witch, only after her trial by search and their own confessions, he as others may judge. Three, lastly, judge how he fleeceth the country and enriches himself, by considering the vast sum he takes of every town, he demands but twenty shillings a town, and doth sometimes ride twenty miles for that, and hath no more for all his charges thither and back again, and it maybe stays a week there, and find there three or four witches, or if it be but one, cheap enough. And this is the great sum he takes to maintain his company with three horses. Judicet Ulus End of The Discovery of Witches by Matthew Hopkins The First Philippic of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The First Philippic If some new subject were being brought before us, men of Athens, I would have waited until most of your ordinary advisers had declared their opinion and if anything that they said were satisfactory to me, I would have remained silent, and only if it were not so would I have attempted to express my own view. But since we find ourselves once more considering a question upon which they have often spoken, I think I may reasonably be pardoned for rising first of all. For if their advice to you in the past had been what it ought to have been, you would have had no occasion for the present debate. In the first place, then, men of Athens, we must not be downhearted at our present situation, however wretched it may seem to be, for in the worst feature of the past lies our best hope for the future, in the fact, that is, that we are in our present plight because you are not doing your duty in any respect. For if you were doing all that you should do and we were still in this evil case, we could not then even hope for any improvement. In the second place you must bear in mind what some of you have heard from others, and those who know can recollect for themselves how powerful the Spartans were not long ago, and yet how noble and patriotic your own conduct was when, instead of doing anything unworthy of your country, you faced the war with Sparta in defense of the right. Now why do I remind you of these things? It is because, men of Athens, I wish you to see and to realize that, so long as you are on your guard, you have nothing to fear, but that if you are indifferent, nothing can be as you would wish. For this is exemplified for you both by the power of Sparta in those days, to which you rose superior because you gave your minds to your affairs, and by the insolence of Philip today, which troubles us because we care nothing for the things which should concern us. If, however, any of you, men of Athens, when he considers the immense force now at Philip's command, and the city's loss of all her strongholds, thinks that Philip is a foe hard to conquer, I ask him, right though he is in his belief, to reflect also that there was a time when we possessed Pydna and Potidaea and Methone, when all the surrounding country was our own, and many of the tribes which are now on his side were free and independent and more inclined to be friendly to us than to him. 
Now if in those days Philip had made up his mind that it was a hard thing to fight against the Athenians, with all their fortified outposts on his own frontiers, while he was destitute of allies, he would have achieved none of his recent successes, nor acquired this great power. But Philip saw quite clearly, men of Athens, that all these strongholds were prizes of war, displayed for competition. He saw that in the nature of things the property of the absent belongs to those who are on the spot, and that of the negligent to those who are ready for toil and danger. It is, as you know, by acting upon this belief that he has brought all those places under his power and now holds them, some of them by right of capture in war, others in virtue of alliances and friendly understandings. For every one is willing to grant alliance and to give attention to those whom they see to be prepared and ready to take action as is necessary. If then, men of Athens, you also will resolve to adopt this principle today, the principle which you have never observed before, if each of you can henceforward be relied upon to throw aside all this pretense of incapacity and to act where his duty bids him and where his services can be of use to his country, if he who has money will contribute and he who is of military age will join the campaign, if, in one plain word, you will resolve henceforward to depend absolutely on yourselves, each man no longer hoping that he will need to do nothing himself and that his neighbor will do everything for him, then, God willing, you will recover your own. You will take back all that your indolence has lost, and you will have your revenge upon Philip. Do not imagine that his fortune is built to last forever, as if he were God. He also has those who hate him and fear him, men of Athens, and envy him too, even among those who now seem to be his closest friends. All the feelings that exist in any other body of men must be supposed to exist in Philip's supporters. Now, however, all such feelings are cowed before him. Your slothful apathy has taken away their only rallying point, and it is this apathy that I bid you put off today. Mark the situation, men of Athens, mark the pitch which the man's outrageous insolence has reached when he does not even give you a choice between action and inaction, but threatens you and utters, as we are told, haughty language, for he is not the man to rest content in possession of his conquests. He is always casting his net wider, and while we procrastinate and sit idle, he is setting his toils around us on every side. When then, men of Athens, when, I say, will you take the action that is required? What are you waiting for? We are waiting, you say, till it is necessary. But what must we think of all that is happening at this present time? Surely the strongest necessity that a free people can experience is the shame which they must feel at their position. What? Do you want to go round asking one another, is there any news? Could there be any stranger news? than that a man of Macedonia is defeating Athenians in war and ordering the affairs of the Hellenes? Is Philip dead? No, but he is sick. And what difference does it make to you? For if anything should happen to him, you will soon raise up for yourselves a second Philip if it is thus that you attend to your interests. Indeed, Philip has not risen to this excessive height through his own strength, so much as through our neglect. I go even further. If anything happened to Philip, if the operation of fortune, who always cares for us better than we care for ourselves, were to affect this too for us, you know that if you were at hand, you could descend upon the general confusion and order everything as you wished. But in your present condition, even if circumstances offered you Amphipolis, you could not take it, for your forces and your minds alike are far away. Well, I say no more of the obligation which rests upon you all to be willing and ready to do your duty. I will assume that you are resolved and convinced. But the nature of the armament which I believe will set you free from such troubles as these, the numbers of the force, the source from which we must obtain funds, and the best and quickest way, as it seems to me, of making all further preparations, all this, men of Athens, I will at once endeavor to explain when I have made one request of you. Give your verdict on my proposal when you have heard the whole of it. 
Do not prejudge it before I have done. And if at first the force which I propose appears unprecedented, do not think that I am merely creating delays. It is not those whose cry is at once, today, whose proposals will meet our need. For what has already happened cannot be prevented by any expedition now. It is rather he who can show the nature, the magnitude, and the financial possibility of a force, which when provided will be able to continue in existence either until we are persuaded to break off the war, or until we have overcome the enemy. For thus only can we escape further calamity for the future. These things I believe I can show you, though I would not stand in the way of any speaker's professions. It is no less a promise than this that I make. The event will soon test its fulfillment, and you will be the judges of it. First then, men of Athens, I say that fifty warships must at once be got in readiness, and next that you must be in such a frame of mind that, if any need arises, you will embark in person and sail. In addition, you must prepare transports for half our cavalry and a sufficient number of boats. These, I think, should be in readiness to meet those sudden sallies of his from his own country against Thermopylae, the Chersonis, Olynthus, and any other place which he may select. For we must make him realize that there is a possibility of your rousing yourselves out of your excessive indifference, just as when once you went to Eubea, and before that, as we are told, to Haliartus, and finally, only the other day, to Thermopylae. Such a possibility, even if you are unlikely to make it a reality, as I think you ought to do, is not one which he can treat lightly. And you may thus secure one of two objects. On the one hand, he may know that you are on the alert. He will, in fact, know it well enough. There are only too many persons, I assure you, in Athens itself, who report to him all that happens here. And in that case, his apprehensions will ensure his inactivity. But if, on the other hand, he neglects the warning, he may be taken off his guard, for there will be nothing to hinder you from sailing to his country if he gives you the opportunity. These are the measures upon which I say you should all be resolved, and your preparations for them made. But before this, men of Athens, you must make ready a force which will fight without intermission and do him damage. Do not speak to me of ten thousand or twenty thousand mercenaries. I will have none of your paper armies. Give me an army which will be the army of Athens, and will obey and follow the general whom you elect, be there one general or more, be he one particular individual, or be he who he may. You must also provide maintenance for this force. Now what is this force to be? How large is it to be? How is it to be maintained? How will it consent to act in this manner? I will answer these questions point by point. The number of mercenaries, but you must not repeat the mistake which has so often injured you, the mistake of first thinking any measures inadequate, and so voting for the largest proposal, and then, when the time for action comes, not even executing the smaller one, you must rather carry out and make provision for the smaller measure, and add to it, if it proves too small, the total number of soldiers, I say, must be two thousand. And of these five hundred must be Athenians, beginning from whatever age you think good. They must serve for a definite period, not a long one, but one to be fixed at your discretion and in relays. The rest must be mercenaries. With these must be cavalry, two hundred in number, of whom at least fifty must be Athenians, as with the infantry, and the conditions of service must be the same. You must also find transport for these. And what next? Ten swift ships of war. For as he has a fleet, we need swift sailing warships too, to secure the safe passage of the army. And how is maintenance to be provided for these? This also I will state and demonstrate, as soon as I have given you my reasons for thinking that a force of this size is sufficient, and for insisting that those who serve in it shall be citizens. The size of the force, men of Athens, is determined by the fact that we cannot at present provide an army capable of meeting Philip in the open field. We must make plundering forays, and our warfare must at first be of a predatory nature. 
Consequently, the force must not be over big. We could then neither pay nor feed it, any more than it must be wholly insignificant. The presence of citizens in the force that sails I require for the following reason. I am told that Athens once maintained a mercenary force in Corinth, under the command of Palistratus, Ephicrates, Chabrius, and others, and that you yourselves joined in the campaign with them. And I remember hearing that these mercenaries, when they took to the field with you, and you with them, were victorious over the Spartans. But even since your mercenary forces have gone to war alone, it is your friends and allies that they conquer, while your enemies have grown more powerful than they should be. After a casual glance at the war to which Athens has sent them, they sail off to Artabazus, or anywhere rather than to war, and the general follows them naturally enough, for his power over them is gone when he can give them no pay. You ask what I bid you do? I bid you take away their excuses both from the general and the soldiers by supplying pay and placing citizen soldiers at their side as spectators of these mysteries of generalship. For our present methods are mere mockery. Imagine the question to be put to you men of Athens whether you are at peace or no. At peace, you would say, of course not. We are at war with Philip. Now have you not all along been electing from among your own countrymen ten captains and generals, and cavalry officers, and two masters of the horse? And what are they doing? Except the one single individual whom you happen to send to the seat of war, they are all marshalling your processions for you with the commissioners of festivals. You are no better than men modelling puppets of clay! Your captains and your cavalry officers are elected to be displayed in the streets, not to be sent to the war. Surely, men of Athens, your captain should be elected from among yourselves, and your master of the horse from among yourselves. Your officers should be your own countrymen, if the force is to be really the army of Athens. As it is the master of the horse who is one of yourselves has to sail to Lemnos. Or the master of the horse, with the army that is fighting to defend the possessions of Athens, is Menelaus. I do not wish to disparage that gentleman. But whoever holds that office ought to have been elected by you. Perhaps, however, while agreeing with all that I have said, you are mainly anxious to hear my financial proposals, which will tell you the amount and the sources of the funds required. I proceed, therefore, with these at once. First, for the sum, the cost of the bare rations for the crews, with such a force, will be ninety talents, and a little over, forty talents for ten swift ships, and twenty mine a month for each ship, and for the soldiers as much again, each soldier to receive rations to the value of ten drachme a month, and for the cavalry two hundred in number, each to receive thirty drachme a month, twelve talents. It may be said that the supply of bare rations to the members of the force is an insufficient initial provision, but this is a mistake. I am quite certain that, given so much, the army will provide everything else for itself from the proceeds of war, without injury to a single Hellene or ally of ours, and that the full pay will be made up by these means. I am ready to sail as volunteer and to suffer the worst if my words are untrue. The next question, then, is of ways and means, in so far as the funds are to come from yourselves. I will explain this at once. At this point, a schedule of ways and means is read. This, men of Athens, is what we have been able to devise, and when you put our proposals to the vote, you will pass them if you approve of them, that so your war with Philip may be a war not of resolutions and dispatches, but of actions. I believe that the value of your deliberations about the war and the armament as a whole would be greatly enhanced if you were to bear in mind the situation of the country against which you are fighting, remembering that most of Philip's plans are successfully carried out because he takes advantage of winds and seasons, for he waits for the Etesian winds or the winter seasons, and only attacks when it would be impossible for us to effect a passage to the scene of action. Bearing this in mind, we must not carry on the war by means of isolated expeditions. We shall always be too late. We must have a permanent force and armament. 
as our winter stations for the army, we have Lemnos, Thassos, Skyathos, and the islands in that region, which have harbors and corn, and are well supplied with all that any army needs. And as to the time of year whenever it is easy to approach the shore and the winds are not dangerous, our force can without difficulty lie close to the Macedonian coast itself and block the mouths of the ports. How and when he will employ the force is a matter to be determined when the time comes by the commander whom you put in control of it. What must be provided from Athens is described in the scheme which I have drafted. If, men of Athens, you first supply the sum I have mentioned, and then, after making ready the rest of the armament, soldiers, ships, cavalry, bind the whole force in its entirety, by law, to remain at the seat of war, if you become your own paymasters, your own commissioners of supply, but require your general to account for the actual operations, then there will be an end of these perpetual discussions of one and the same theme, which end in nothing but discussion. And in addition to this, men of Athens, you will in the first place deprive him of his chief source of supply. For what is this? Why, he carries on the war at the cost of your own allies, harrying and plundering those who sail the seas. And what will you gain besides this? You will place yourselves out of reach of disaster. It will not be as it was in the past, when he descended upon Lemnos and Imbros, and went off with your fellow citizens as his prisoners of war, or when he seized the vessels of Geraistus, and levied an enormous sum from them, or when, last of all, he landed at Marathon, seized the sacred trireme, and carried it off from the country while all the time you can neither prevent these aggressions nor yet send an expedition which will arrive when you intend it to arrive. But for what reason do you think, men of Athens, do the festivals of the Panthenea and the festival of the Dionysia always take place at the proper time, whether those to whom the charge of either festival is allotted are specially qualified persons or not? Festivals! upon which you spend larger sums of money than upon any armament whatsoever, and which involve an amount of trouble and preparation which are unique, so far as I know, in the whole world, and yet your armaments are always behind the time, at Methane, at Pagasse, at Potidaea. It is because for the festivals all is arranged by law. Each of you know long beforehand who is to supply the course and who is to be the steward of the games for his tribe. He knows what he is to receive, and when, and from whom, and what he is to do with it. No detail is here neglected. Nothing is left indefinite. But in all that concerns war and our preparation for it, there is no organization, no revision, no definiteness. Consequently, it is not until the news comes that we appoint our triarchs and institute exchanges of property for them, and inquire into ways and means. When that is done, we first resolve that the resident aliens and the independent freedmen shall go on board. Then we change our minds and say that citizens shall embark. Then that we will send substitutes. And while all these delays are occurring, the object of the expedition is already lost. For we spend on preparation the time when we should be acting, and the opportunities which events afford will not wait for our slothful evasions. While as for the forces on which we think we can rely in the meantime, when the critical moment comes, they are tried and found wanting. And Philip's insolence has reached such a pitch that he has sent such a letter as the following to the Eubeans. At this point, the letter is read. The greater part of the statements that have been read are true, men of Athens, and they ought not to be true. But I admit that they may possibly be unpleasant to hear. And if the course of future events would pass over all that a speaker passes over in his speech to avoid giving pain, we should be right in speaking with a view to your pleasure. But if attractive words spoken out of season bring their punishment in actual reality, then it is disgraceful to blind our eyes to the truth to put off everything that is unpleasant, to refuse to understand even so much as this, that those who conduct war rightly must not follow in the wake of events, but must be beforehand with them. 
For just as a general may be expected to lead his army, so those who debate must lead the course of affairs, in order that what they resolve upon may be done, and that they may not be forced to follow at the heels of events. You men of Athens have the greatest power in the world, warships, infantry, cavalry, revenue, but none of these elements of power have you used as you ought, down to this very day. The method of your warfare with Philip is just that of barbarians in a boxing match. Hit one of them and he hugs the place, hit him on the other side and there go his hands. But as for guarding or looking his opponent in the face, he neither can nor will do it. It is the same with you. If you hear that Philip is in the Chersonese, you resolve to make an expedition there. If he is at Thermopylae, you send one there, and wherever else he may be, you run up and down in his steps. It is he that leads your forces. You have never of yourselves come to any salutary decision in regard to the war. No single event do you ever discern before it occurs, before you have heard that something has happened or is happening. Perhaps there was room for this backwardness until now, but now we are at the very crisis, and such an attitude is possible no longer. Surely, men of Athens, it is one of the gods, one who blushes for Athens, as he sees the course which events are taking, that has inspired Philip with this restless activity. If he were content to remain at peace in possession of all that he has won by conquest or by forestalling us, if he had no further plans, even then the record against us as a people, a record of shame and cowardice and all that is most dishonorable would, I think, seem complete enough to some of you. But now he is always making some new attempt, always grasping after something more, and unless your spirit has utterly departed, his conduct will perhaps bring you out into the field. It amazes me, men of Athens, that not one of you remembers with any indignation that this war had its origin in our intention to punish Philip, and that now, at the end of it, the question is how we are to escape disaster at his hands but that he will not stay his progress until someone arrests it is plain enough. Are we then to wait for that? Do you think that all is right when you dispatch nothing but empty ships and somebody's hopes? Shall we not embark? Shall we not now, if never before, go forth ourselves and provide at least some small proportion of Athenian soldiers? Shall we not sail to the enemy's country? But I heard the question, at what point on his coast are we to anchor? The war itself, men of Athens, if you take it in hand, will discover his weak points. But if we sit at home listening to the mutual abuse and recriminations of our orators, you can never realize any of the results that you ought to realize. I believe that whenever any portion of Athens is sent with the forces, even if the whole city does not go, the favor of heaven and of fortune fights on our side. But whenever you dispatch anywhere a general with an empty resolution and some platform hopes to support him, then you achieve nothing that you ought to achieve. Your enemies laugh at you, and your allies are in deadly fear of all such armaments. It is impossible, utterly impossible, that any one man should be able to effect all that you wish for you. He can give undertakings and promises. He can accuse this man and that. The result is that your fortunes are ruined. For when the general is at the head of wretched unpaid mercenaries, and when there are those in Athens who lie to you light-heartedly about all that he does, and on the strength of the tales that you hear, you pass decrees at random, what must you expect? How then can this state of things be terminated? Only men of Athens, when you expressly make the same men soldiers, witnesses of their general's actions, and judges at his examination when they return home. For then the issue of your fortunes will not be a tale which you hear, but a thing which you will be on the spot to see. So shameful is the pass which matters have now reached, that each of your generals is tried for his life before you two or three times, but does not dare to fight in mortal combat with the enemy even once. They prefer the death of kidnappers and brigands to that of a general. For it is a felon's death to die by sentence of the court. The death of a general is to fall in battle with the enemy. 
Some of us go about saying that Philip is negotiating with Sparta for the overthrow of the Thebans and the breaking up of the free states. Others that he has sent ambassadors to the king. Others that he is fortifying cities in Illyria. We all go about inventing each his own tale. I quite believe, men of Athens, that he is intoxicated with the greatness of his successors and entertains many such visions in his mind. For he sees that there are none to hinder him, and he is elated at his achievements. But I do not believe that he has chosen to act in such a way that the most foolish persons in Athens can know what he intends to do. For no persons are so foolish as newsmongers. But if we dismiss all such tales and attend only to the certainty that the man is our enemy, that he is robbing us of our own, that he has insulted us for a long time, that all that we ever expected any one to do for us has proved to be against us, that the future is in our own hands, that if we will not fight him now in his own country, we shall perhaps be obliged to do so in ours. If I say we are assured of this, then we shall have made up our minds aright and shall be quit of idle words. For you have not to speculate what the future may be. You have only to be assured that the future must be evil, unless you give heed and are ready to do your duty. Well, I have never yet chosen to gratify you by saying anything which I have not felt certain would be for your good, and today I have spoken freely and without concealment just what I believe. I could wish to be as sure of the good that a speaker will gain by giving you the best advice as of that which you will gain by listening to him. I should then have been far happier than I am. As it is, I do not know what will happen to me or what I have said, but I have chosen to speak in the sure conviction that if you carry out my proposals, it will be for your good. And may the victory rest with that policy which will be for the good of all. End of the First Philippic of Demosthenes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. My First Expedition to the Permian of Texas in 1882 by Charles Sternberg This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in July 2020 First Expedition to the Permian of Texas in 1882 my first expedition to the Permian of Texas was made in 1882, while I was in charge of collecting parties for the Museum of Comparative Zoology of Harvard University. I left the station at North Cambridge about the 15th of December and reached Dallas on the 21st, with the address of A. R. Rossler, but I was told at the post office that there was no such man and no such address in the city. I had been depending absolutely upon the information which I hoped to receive from this Mr. Rossler, as I myself had no more idea as to the whereabouts of the Permian beds than a newborn child. Dr. Hayden had written me to follow up Red River until I found the red beds, which had coloured the whole flood plain of the valley, and I had seen the red mud at Texarkana as I entered the state but it would take years to explore the whole valley of that great stream. I felt that I had come upon a wild goose chase, and I suppose showed my dismay in my face, for the postmaster asked if he could help me. I told him my troubles, and he said that there was a man in town, a Professor W. A. Cummins, who had been Cope's assistant the year before. Greatly cheered, I went to the man's house post-haste, to be met at the door by his wife, who told me that the professor was in Austin, whereupon my spirits dropped below zero again. But if a girl's face is her fortune, so is a man's sometimes, for I gained Mrs. Cummins' sympathy at once. When I told her why I had come to Texas, she answered, Why, I was with Professor Cummins on his expedition to the Permian beds, and proceeded to give me all the information which I thought necessary. I learned that they had made their headquarters at Seymour, in Baylor County, between the Brazos and Wichita rivers, and I supposed that anyone in Seymour could tell me the exact localities from which the fossils came. 
Later I found to my sorrow that this was not the case, and I wasted months of careful exploration over barren beds before I found the horizon that yielded the wonderful Batrachians and reptiles of which I had come in search. Much elated, I took the train for Gordon, a cattleman's town south of Seymour, and the point nearest to it by rail. I arrived there on Christmas Eve. I was the only passenger to leave the cars, and was welcomed by about twenty cowboys who were just beginning to paint the town red. The leader asked me where I came from, and I answered promptly, from Boston. "'Where do you want to go?' he asked. "'To the best hotel in town,' said I. "'All right,' he said. "'We'll take you there.' And sure enough, they did. They formed in double file and put me in the middle of their ranks. Then the two men ahead of me laid their Winchesters over my shoulders from in front, and the two men behind crossed these guns with their own, and at the word, fire at will, the whole command opened fire and kept it up all the way to the hotel. There a girl appeared, carrying a lamp with no chimney, and the men, facing the porch, allowed me to go into the waiting room. I turned first and made a little speech, thanking them for their kind reception, and remarking that if I were not so poor, I should stand treat for the whole crowd. This satisfied them, and shouting, All right, they went off to continue their nonsense until they were all drunk. I hired the son of the hotel keeper, a Mr. Hammond, put my baggage in his wagon, and started on the journey north to my headquarters at Seymour, which we reached eight days later. Here I got off the track again, for although everyone in town knew Professor Cummins, no one could tell where he had found his fossils. Over in the breaks was all the information anyone could give. Finally, a man named Turner asked me to come over to his cattle range on the middle fork of the Wichita, as the country was cut up into canyons and ridges and denuded, so that I should be likely to find fossils. He knew of some mastodon bones in the vicinity, he said. So I went with him. At one place the road led us across the narrows, where there is scarcely room for a wagon road between the breaks of the Brazos and the big Wichita. Looking south, shallow ravines led to the valley of the Brazos, while to the north were deep gulches and mounds capped with white ledges of gypsum, with red beds of clay below. I had reached at last the red beds of Texas. An interesting phenomenon is to be observed here. The bed of the big Wichita is 175 feet lower than that of the Brazos. North of the Brazos, along a line that extends through Baylor County, the country has been lifted up and disturbed by pressure from below, while south of that line, the only disturbance in the strata has been due to erosion. Everywhere in the red beds of the Wichita Valley are signs of an elevation of the Earth's crust, and for miles down the stream, one comes upon miniature mountains with the strata turned up at all angles. The river valley occupies a fault. Very beautiful indeed was the view when we got in sight of the breaks of the big Wichita. As far as the eye could see stretched miniature badlands with rounded knobs, deep canyons, bluffs and ravines. The prevailing color of the strata was Indian red, but beds of white gypsum and of greenish sandstone relieved the sameness. Sometimes seams of gypsum filled cracks in the strata, forming dikes a few inches in thickness. Between the hills grew patches of grass, a welcome sight to our horses, for we had passed through a country devoid of vegetation. The fall before, the army worm had eaten the ground clean of everything that was eatable. We pitched our camp near a ditch that had been cut through the sediment which overspread the flood plain. The day after pitching camp I heard George Hammond calling me, and crossing the bridge saw him beckoning me to follow him. He gathered his pockets full of cobblestones as he went along, and when he reached the edge of the ditch a little way below the crossing, he began to throw the stones at something. I ran up to him and heard the rattle of snakes, but could not see any until, resting my hand on his shoulder, I lifted myself on my toes and saw, on the other side of the ditch, 
a cave with a broad floor. Lying singly or knotted together in gorgon spheres, with heads sticking out in all directions, were hundreds of large rattlesnakes, which had come out of the cracks in the earth to bask in the sun on this sheltered floor. They had become terribly irritated by the blows of the stones which Hammond was hurling at them, and were rattling in chorus and striking out in all directions, biting themselves and each other. Suddenly one rattled in the high grass at our very feet, and looking down we saw a big fellow making ready to strike. As quick as a flash Hammond threw himself over backward, knocking me down, and the instant he touched the ground turned a complete somerset. While I lay there, overcome with laughter, he turned two more, and finding himself on the road started for camp on a run. I was too hysterical with laughter to help myself, and lay there, while the snake continued to sound its rattle and dart out its forked tongue, swinging its head back and forth above its coiled body. When George saw my predicament, he was brave enough to come back and pull me out of reach of his lordship's fangs. Then we were mean enough to kill him. He measured five feet in length. The valley contained thousands of wild turkeys, and it was a fine sight to see them come down in great droves from the hills at night to roost in the trees below. On the level prairie there were many antelope also, and wild cats and coyotes were seen nearly every day. I remember one day, when crossing a low-level prairie covered with bushes a couple of feet in height, seeing at my left a coyote which was running along in a straight line, with its nose pointed toward a certain spot, like a pointer dog after a prairie chicken. My interest was aroused, and to increase my curiosity I caught sight of a short-tailed cat, the Canadian lynx, crawling along the ground in the same direction. I knew that they were both trailing some prey, which each, unknown to the other, had scented, and imagining that it might be a calf, I shouted, as I did not want to see it torn to pieces. This startled the cat and drove her off at a tangent to her trail. The coyote continued his course, but did not stop, for a Texas cow had run to the point toward which he was travelling, and stood with lowered horns, ready to repel his assault, while her calf sprang up and deliberately proceeded to take advantage of the situation to get his dinner. In this region, as in the Kansas chalk beds, the question of water gave us a great deal of trouble. All the water in the river is that which goes by the name of alkali in the west, being thoroughly impregnated with salt and other mineral ingredients. There are, moreover, no wells or springs in the red beds. The surface rock is porous and the water sinks through it to the compact grey beds below, from which it drains off into the river. These grey beds are some distance below the surface, and so far as I know have never been reached in digging for water. One is, therefore, forced to depend upon rainwater. This is collected either in artificial tanks built by the cattlemen, or in natural tanks, sometimes along the creek beds, but usually in the flood plain in old creek beds where the fine red mud has been puddled by cattle, perhaps, or, in the olden days, by buffalo. These ponds hold water for years, although often they become very foul from the cattle that frequent and wade into them in summer to get away from the flies. It is an odd sight to a stranger in the valley of the big Wichita to see the rain come rushing down the hills. It soon becomes as thick as cream with the fine red clay, and to think of depending upon such water for drinking and cooking purposes is revolting to one who remembers the sparkling springs and clear wells of the east or any mountainous country. During quiet days, when the wind was not blowing, the red mud would settle in the bottom of the tanks, but one had to be careful not to pull out one's pail suddenly, or the water would instantly thicken with mud from the bottom. Nothing would settle this water but boiling it, although it might be cleared a little by the pulp of cactus leaves. I have sometimes gone to the trouble of peeling the broad leaves of the prickly pear and beating them into a mucilaginous pulp to throw into a pail of muddy water. 
The mud attached itself to this material and sank with it to the bottom, but even then the clarified liquid remaining on top did not make a very tempting drink. I soon got used to the thick red water, however, as had the other inhabitants of the country, and for six seasons drank it thankfully when I was thirsty. When a man is thirsty, he drinks first and tastes the water afterwards. I once asked an old cowman what he did for drinking water on the range, and he answered, Wherever and whatever a cow can drink, I can. And cows will take filthy water if they can get no other. All that winter I worked in these desolate beds, walking over thousands of acres of denuded rock, searching without success for the fossil fields. The dominant color of these beds is red, but the tints vary so that the eye is dazzled and wearied by the constant change. There are countless concretions too, all of which had to be looked over. If fine specimens had rewarded the labor, all would have been well, but I know of no work more trying than spending day after day in a fruitless search. At least Hammond, having fattened his horses on two-dollar corn, started a quarrel with me so that he might have an excuse for deserting me, and drove off with the team which I had hired for some time longer, leaving me alone thirty miles from town. Fortunately, however, I found a good, honest Irishman, Pat Whelan by name, who became not only a splendid assistant, but a true friend. Poor fellow! I learned a few years ago that he had frozen to death in Montana. One warm, sultry day I sent him into town for provisions. I had no tent at that time, but he left me the wagon sheet, and I had camped on the south side of a large tree, which was so effectually covered with green briars as to be an almost impenetrable defense against the north wind. I was in the field after Mr. Whelan left me, and noticing the Texas cattle coming from the prairie to the heavy timber, I concluded, although there was not a cloud in sight, that they had scented a norther. Rushing to camp, I began rapidly to make preparations for the storm. First I cut a couple of crotches, and sank them well into the ground on the south side of the briar-covered tree. Then I put up a ridge pole and stretched over it the wagon sheet, which I fastened securely to the ground on either side. I also heaped dirt on the edges to keep out the snow. I thus had a dog tent, opening toward the northern barrier and toward the south. There was plenty of fallen wood lying about, and I devoted every moment and all my strength to cutting it up and dragging it to the tent. I must have got several cords together before I heard the wind howling in the heavy timber to the north. I piled up the supply of fuel at the opening toward the green briar thicket, and built a big fire at the mouth of the tent. Soon an awful storm was upon me, all alone, thirty miles from any human habitation. How the wind moaned through the creaking branches! A dense darkness spread like a pall over the heavens, and the shrieks and wails of the tempest echoed through the woods like the cries of lost souls. Then snow and sleet began to fall in fitful gusts and beat upon the thin canvas that was my only shelter. At such a time a man loses much of his confidence in himself. Pretty small I felt myself when measured with that storm, which bent the great cottonwoods and elms like reeds before it. After supper, tired out with my unwanted exertions, I fell asleep. Whenever the fire sank down and the cold became severe, I roused myself and piled fresh fuel on the dying embers, and when they blazed up again, dropped off once more. Three days and three nights that norther lasted. I understood then why the people of the Southland speak of them as they do, and dread their coming. I never once left my shelter until it cleared. Poor Pat Whelan! He had lost his horses in the storm, and being sure that I would freeze to death if he could not get back to me, he had spent every hour of daylight looking for them. What he must have suffered in that awful gale, while I was safe and comfortable. My readers would grow weary if I told the whole story of that winter's search. 
there were so few results that i became thoroughly disheartened and anxious to give up the fight and go home where my wife and dear baby were waiting for me there was further cause for discouragement in the fact that pat had only agreed to stay with me until spring ploughing began and the time for that was rapidly approaching but i would not give up so we worked on down the stream toward the fort sill cattle trail travelling on an average twenty miles a day on foot with the record nothing in my notebook night after night but on the eleventh of february after forty days of unceasing effort i discovered below the forks of the big wichita a somewhat different horizon from that of the beds over which i had been working so persistently without success some of the beds in this region are composed of red clay with small irregular concretions that are piled in heaps at the base of the hills and roll under one's feet rendering travel difficult in other strata are deposits of small nodules held together by silica these nodules are of various colors and were held securely and ground down make beautiful mosaics then there are beds of greenish sandstone laid down in thin layers and in these beds for the first time since i came to texas i found the remains of a permian vertebrate my notes say although it is not wise to shout before i am out of the woods yet i feel very much encouraged and i earnestly hope for the success i have worked for i have evidently worked too high in the red beds to find fossils on the second day in these beds i found fragments of the great salamander Eryops, and on the twenty second of february i found the first specimen that i had ever seen of the long-spined reptile dimetrodon on this last i got seventy-five pounds of bones and matrix preserved in iron ore concretions the teeth are long recurved and serrated i knew little then about these most ancient of all the vertebrates that it has been my fortune to collect but i shall have more to say about them later the authorities now place the time when these animals lived twelve million years away indeed god is not slack as some men count slackness one day is with the lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day the only way in which we can realize the lapse of millions of years is by a study of the work which nature has accomplished in them depositing vast strata lifting them up into mountain ranges and carving out in them flood plains and mighty canyons more interesting still is a study of the countless forms of life which in ever varying groups have each in turn dominated sea and earth and air first as here in texas the batrachians reigned supreme a race of creatures which were supplied with both gills and lungs so that they could live both on land and in water then came the reptiles and later still dawned the age of mammals with man as the crowning work of the creator's hands i was now at last in the fossiliferous beds and secured some fine material unfortunately about this time pat gave notice that he would soon be obliged to leave me i should then have no team and to work in these fossil beds without a means of transportation would be as useless as to attempt to dig up a forest with a hoe i had however sent north for an assistant a mr wright and after hunting for me a day and a half in the breaks of the big wichita he finally arrived in camp on the sixth of march a violent norther struck us we were better off for protection than we had been however as my tent had at last arrived from kansas and although only an a tent it kept out the storms of sleet and snow that fell for three days during all that time the cattle remained without food in the dense woods such times as this when we were confined to the close quarters of our tent and could accomplish nothing but keeping ourselves warm are in my opinion the most uncomfortable which the fossil hunter is called upon to endure on the ninth of march the sun rose bright and clear upon a scene of surprising beauty every tree bush and blade of grass on the red beds was covered with a milky white ice whose silvery lustre was set with innumerable sparkling gems 
it was glorious at sunrise but as the morning advanced the snow and ice began to melt leaving patches of red and white over the badlands and by noon had entirely disappeared the hills rapidly dried as the thick red water sought the drainage canals and we were soon at work once more as a precaution against the very difficulty which i had encountered i mean the impossibility of keeping a man and team with me i had obtained from the secretary of war through the efforts of professor alexander agassiz a letter of introduction to the commanders of western posts requesting them to assist me by every means in their power not inconsistent with the public service with this letter from the honourable robert t lincoln a son of our martyred president i started out on the twelfth of march for fort sill on a pony hired from a livery stable i was assured that it was only sixty miles to the fort and that the pony could easily take me there in a day but i soon found that he was just off grass and weak and thin i also discovered after night had overtaken me that i had been put on the wrong cattle trail i reached a house in the evening that of a school-teacher who because of his having had some education and possessing the ability to talk intelligently was known in that region as windy turner in distinction from bull turner a cowman i found him to be a gentleman the next morning he gave me directions as to how to reach the old trail that led to the fort i was to go to wagoner's cattle camp where the trail crossed beaver creek and spent the night there i travelled nearly all day and reached the ranch building the only house i had seen since i left the school teachers only to find the camp deserted not a man nor a cow was in sight as i had had no lunch i was very hungry and this being my first visit to this region i did not know where to turn for food and shelter at last however i saw a horseman coming toward me from the northeast and rode to meet him he was a cowboy i inquired where wagoner had gone and learned that he had left a few days before for the indian territory i was told moreover that the nearest place at which i could get a meal was back on coffee creek which i had left in the morning when i complained of being cold and hungry and of not liking to sleep in my saddle blanket on the ground without supper the cowboy replied that he had not had a morsel to eat for three days and that he had slept for three nights in his saddle blanket after that i said no more i was unwilling to return all the way back to the hospitable roof that had sheltered me the night before and continued my journey with no expectation of coming upon a human habitation until i reached red river the next night it is hard to express my delight therefore when upon reaching the divide between beaver creek and red river i saw a lot of tents some distance to the right of the trail i hurried to the encampment and found that it belonged to the locating engineer of the denver and fort worth railroad when i told the young man from whom i had obtained this information that i wanted to see the engineer he grinned i was not a very pleasant-looking individual covered as i was with the dust of travel but he opened the door of the tent and said here's a man who wants to see you as the occupant of the tent came forward i presented to him my letter of introduction from the secretary of war and i saw the grin disappear from the face of my guide as the engineer shook hands with me cordially and remarking that is a good enough letter of introduction for me placed himself at my service when i told him that my pony and i were hungry he instructed the man who had expected to see me refused the courtesies of the camp to get up a good supper for me and to care for my pony then inviting me to make myself at home he entertained me royally and after i had made a hearty meal opened a bale of new woolen blankets and provided me with a most comfortable bed in his own tent i hope if major j f Manette sees this story he will accept at this late day my thanks for his kindly treatment the next night i reached a crossing on red river where i found a house and stayed all night the next day about nightfall i crossed catch creek and saw at my right, in a bend of the creek, an elevated bench on which a teepee was pitched. 
There were two Indians standing about, one a large, fleshy, good-natured man, the other thin, with large prominent cheekbones, a typical Comanche. A large flock of children ran out to greet me. I must confess that I felt a little uneasy at being so entirely alone and at the mercy of these Indians, but I made the best of it, and as several turkeys were lying on the ground, I told the good-natured man that I wanted his squaw to cook me one for supper. This she proceeded to do, removing the breast and putting it on a wooden spit, which she stuck in the ground before a large bed of coals and constantly turned until the meat was done. This, with a cup of coffee which she made me, and the bread crumbs from my lunch, gave me quite a meal. I was too hungry to be fastidious. The Indians were roasting camas, the bulb of the wild hyacinth, which grew plentifully in the creek bottom. They had dug a pit five feet deep and three in diameter, and kindled a fire at the bottom, using at least a cord of wood to heat thoroughly the surrounding ground. The ashes were then scraped out, and the walls plastered with a mortar of mud, over which green grass was thickly strewn to prevent the bulbs from burning. The bulbs were then put in and covered with grass and mud, and a fire built on top of them. The next morning they were done, and were as much relished by these Indian children as popcorn or peanuts by the whites. I tasted some. They had a sweetish taste, a little like sweet potatoes, but they were so full of sand that my teeth were not strong enough to grind them up. I put off going to bed until late, as I dreaded sleeping in the high grass where I had left my saddle. But at last the children, who had been amusing me, went off to bed, and I decided to go too. I spread half my saddle blanket under me, and with my saddle for a pillow was just dozing off when I heard a rustle in the dead grass, and the thin Indian, whom I disliked, stuck his head almost into my face. He had something in his hands which he wanted to swap with me for some of my property, and the more I argued, the more determined he was to trade. He wanted my pony, my Winchester, everything I had, and I was afraid that he would take them whether or no. At last, however, he left, crawling through the grass that he had come, but I was just dropping off to sleep when I heard the snake-like rustle again. I was getting mad by that time, and when the Indian parted the tall grass and peered through the opening, he faced the muzzle of my gun, while I told him with much vehemence that if he did not go about his business and let me get to sleep, I would bore a hole through him. This had the desired effect, and but for the cold, which wakened me often, I slept in peace the rest of the night. I was wakened in the morning by a shot, and a wild turkey fell from a tree near where I had been sleeping. They were so tame and abundant that they roosted in camp. The jolly Indian was anxious to earn another quarter, and as I had ordered turkey for supper, he had concluded that I wanted one for breakfast. I was not quite so hungry this morning, and detected the Indian smell which is left on everything they touch but I made a brave attempt not to show my disgust to my host. After breakfast, as I started out for the trail, a boy of fourteen walked down with me and stood talking, with his hands tangled in my pony's mane. I had given him some tobacco, and he was smoking a cigarette which he had made with a dry leaf. At our feet the path divided and encircled a little mound of earth covered with buffalo grass. When the boy had finished his smoke, he threw the still-burning stump into this dead grass, which was damp with dew, and sent up a dense column of smoke. This was all done so naturally that I thought nothing of it, until I got up on the level prairie, where I could see for miles ahead. As far as the eye could reach, column after column of smoke was rising through the still morning air. It was thirty miles from the crossing at Catch Creek to Fort Sill, Yet, when I presented my letter to Major Guy Henry in his office at nine o'clock in the next morning, the first question he asked was, Did you leave the crossing at Catch Creek about sunrise yesterday morning? And when I answered that I had, he said that probably about ten or fifteen minutes after I left the creek, the Comanche chief had received notice by smoke signal that one man was coming over the trail toward the fort. 
In coming to Fort Sill, I had inadvertently come from one department into another, and the Major had no power to send men out of his department without orders from General Sheridan, the commanding general of the army. So I had to wait at Fort Sill until the matter could be arranged. The southern cowboys who hated the army blue and the darky soldiers who were stationed at the fort were doing all that they could to irritate the officers. While the latter were at dinner and the soldiers off duty, a squad of cowboys would ride into the post across the well-kept grass on the parade grounds up to the flagstaff and fire at the stars and stripes. Another of their tricks was to shoot off the glass insulators from the government telegraph lines which connect the fort with the headquarters at Leavenworth and with the Department of the Gulf. They had just accomplished this piece of mischief when I arrived at the fort, and before the Major could communicate with General Pope, commander of the Department of the Missouri, in which Fort Sill was situated, he had to send out the signal sergeant to repair the line. At last, however, all was arranged, and by general order Corporal Bromfield, three privates, a six-mule team, and a wagon with a white teamster, and fifty days' rations, were detailed for my use. I started out with this escort, elated by the knowledge that I now had men and means of transportation upon which I could depend. It is indeed a lovely drive from Fort Sill to Red River. We were rarely out of sight of the impressive Wichita Mountains, which rise from a sea of green plains like an islet in a lake. We reached the river on the second day and had a mile of sand to pull through. At one time I thought that we would go down in the treacherous quicksands, but our magnificent team of dark-coloured mules and the skill of the teamster carried us safely over. I have since seen, in the sands of this same river, holes ten feet deep which had been dug to rescue wagons loaded with valuable goods that had sunk down to bedrock during high water. When we reached the beds of the Big Wichita, we worked both Indian and Coffee Creeks, a few miles apart. Here at last, after so much toil and so many hardships, I found myself in the very centre of the fossil-bearing strata, and secured a number of fine specimens, among them the great salamander Eryops, the wonderful fin-backed lizard Naosaurus, that peculiar Batrachian Diplocolis, and other forms. On arriving at the fossil beds, I showed Corporal Bromfield where I wanted him to pitch my wall tent, and went into the field with Mr. Wright in search of fossils. When I returned at night, I found that the Corporal had pitched my tent on a level, and his own aid tent as close to it as he possibly could. This will never do, I said to myself. Discipline will go to the dogs if I allow such close companionship so I ordered him to take down his tent and pitch it a hundred yards away, and to follow this rule in future. The soldiers were very indignant, but they obeyed orders. As a general rule I found that I could handle them, although there were a few breaches of discipline. I was so unfortunate on this expedition as to have my tent burned with nearly all my personal property. When the men got to the flaming tent, the first thing they did was to cut the guy ropes and let it blow over. They then, at my request, brought water and threw it on the burning sacks that held the fossils. This saved the fossils, but to do so we had to let everything else go. On the 25th of April, we started with our load for Decatur, the nearest railroad point. We took the Henrietta Road and camped on the Little Wichita, where, in the sandy shales of the Upper Carboniferous or Permian, we found a locality rich in the fossil flora of that region. We secured a number of large fern fronds, etc. Wild turkey were, as usual, abundant. Lee Irving, one of the escort, killed a hen and gobbler, and gave us a change from our customary diet of bacon. On the 4th of May, after a long journey, we ploughed through the valley named, and well named, the Big Sandy, and passing through groves of splendid live oaks, pecans, water elms, and locusts, reached Decatur, the terminus of the Fort Worth and Denver Railroad. Here I delivered to the agent my precious load of fossils, which had cost me so much expense, labour, and anxiety, 
and set out on the return trip to Fort Sill, where, on the 12th of May, after a journey without incident, I turned over my command to Major Henry. The next time I heard of this splendid officer, he was a brigadier general in command of Puerto Rico. End of My First Expedition to the Permian of Texas in 1882 by Charles Sternberg Genetically Engineered Crops in the United States, an excerpt from a United States Department of Agriculture report prepared by Jorge Fernandez Cornejo, Seth Weschler, Mike Livingston, and Lorraine Mitchell in February 2014. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction Genetic engineering is a key component of modern agricultural biotechnology. Note, genetic engineering is a technique used to alter genetic material, genes of living cells. A gene is a segment of DNA that expresses a particular trait. It is a unit of heredity transmitted from generation to generation during reproduction. DNA constitutes the genetic material of most known organisms. End note. The first genetically engineered GE plant, a tomato, was developed in 1982. By 1985, the USDA had approved four releases of GE organisms for field testing. Commercial use of major genetically engineered crops began in 1996. Note, plant biotechnology in general and genetic engineering in particular have significantly reduced the time needed to develop improved plant varieties, increasing the range and precision of characteristics incorporated into these new varieties. By allowing scientists to target single plant traits through genetic recombination techniques, Plant biotechnology decreases the number of residual, unwanted characteristics that often result from traditional plant breeding crosses, enabling breeders to develop desirable new varieties more rapidly. End note. Genetically engineered crop traits have been classified into one of three generations. The first generation features enhanced input traits such as herbicide tolerance, resistance to insects, and resistance to environmental stress like drought. The second features value-added output traits such as nutrient-enhanced seeds for feed. The third generation of GE crops would include traits to allow production of pharmaceuticals and products beyond traditional food and fiber. While the first genetically engineered crop approved by USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS, APHIS, and commercialized in 1994, was a crop with a strictly second-generation trait, flavor saver tomato. Most GE crops planted in the United States have first-generation traits. All three generations of GE crop traits are in various stages of research and development. Note, several second-generation GE crops have been approved by APHIS. High lysine corn, reduced nicotine tobacco, high oleic acid soybean oil, stereodonic acid-producing soybeans, improved fatty acid profile soybeans, altered flower color roses, blue, oil profile altered canola, and alpha amylase corn. Overall, nearly 20% of the approvals for deregulation as of September 2013 are second generation crops. End note. Most U.S. acres planted to GE crops have traits that provide herbicide tolerance, HT, and or insect resistance. 
These seeds became commercially available in 1996. Herbicide tolerant crops are able to tolerate certain highly effective herbicides, such as glyphosate, allowing adopters of these varieties to control pervasive weeds more effectively. Commercially available HT crops include soybeans, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, and alfalfa. Insect resistant or BT crops contain a gene from the soil bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis, capital B, small t, that produces a protein which is toxic to certain insects, protecting the plant over its entire life. Commercially available BT crops include corn and cotton. More than 15 years after commercial introduction, adoption of first-generation genetically engineered crop varieties by U.S. farmers has reached about 90% of the planted acres of corn, soybeans, and cotton. U.S. consumers eat many products derived from these crops, including cornmeal, oils, and sugars, largely unaware of their GE origins. Despite the rapid increase in adoption rates for GE corn, soybean, and cotton varieties by U.S. farmers, some continue to raise questions regarding the potential benefits and risks of genetically engineered crops. Adoption of genetically engineered crops by U.S. farmers. When farmers adopt a new technology, they typically expect benefits like increased farm net returns, time savings by making farming less effort intensive, or reduced exposure to chemicals. Net benefits are a function of farm characteristics and location output and input prices, existing production systems, and farmer abilities and preferences. Judging by the widespread adoption of genetically engineered seeds, farmers have benefited from them. U.S. farmers planted about 169 million acres of GE corn, soybeans, and cotton in 2013 accounting for almost half of the estimated total land used to grow all U.S. crops. On a global scale, approximately 420 million acres of GE crops were planted in 28 countries in 2012. U.S. acreage accounted for approximately 41% of acres planted with GE seed. Brazil accounted for 21%, Argentina for 14%, Canada for 7%, India for 6%, and China, Paraguay, South Africa, and Pakistan, each for roughly 2%. Commercially introduced in the United States in 1996, major genetically engineered crops were rapidly adopted. Planting of GE crops measured in acres increased by 68% between 2000 and 2005 and grew by 45% between 2005 and 2013. Three crops, corn, cotton, and soybeans, make up the bulk of U.S. acres planted to genetically engineered crops, mostly for herbicide tolerance, HT, and insect resistance, BT, including varieties with HT and or BT traits. GE crops accounted for 90% of all planted cotton acres, 93% of soybean acres, and 90% of corn acres in 2013. U.S. farmers have tended to adopt herbicide-tolerant seeds at higher levels than seeds with insect resistance. In part, this is because weeds are a pervasive problem. HT adoption was particularly rapid in soybeans, with U.S. farmers increasing their planting of herbicide-tolerant soybeans from 54% of soybean acres in 2000 to 87% in 2005 and 93% in 2013. Herbicide-tolerant cotton increased from 46% of cotton acres in 2000 to 61% in 2005 and 82% in 2013. HT corn 
increased from 7% of corn acres in 2000 to 26% in 2005 and 85% in 2013. Insect infestations tend to be more localized than weed infestations. Farmers planted Bt cotton to control insects such as tobacco budworm, cotton bollworm, and pink bollworm on 35% of the cotton acres in 2000, 52% in 2005, and 75% in 2013. Bt corn, commercially introduced to control the European corn borer in 1996, the corn root worm in 2003, and the corn ear worm in 2010, was planted on 19% of corn acres in 2000, 35% in 2005, and 76% in 2013. Other genetically engineered crops commercially grown in the United States are herbicide-tolerant canola, herbicide-tolerant sugar beets, herbicide-tolerant alfalfa, virus-resistant papaya, and virus-resistant squash. In addition, other traits are being developed and tested, including cold, drought resistance, and enhanced protein, oil, or vitamin content. Based on the Agricultural Resource Management Survey, farmers indicate that they adopted genetically engineered corn, cotton, and soybeans primarily to increase yields. Other popular reasons for adopting GE crops were to save management time, to facilitate other production practices such as crop rotation and conservation tillage, and to reduce pesticide costs. End of Genetically Engineered Crops in the United States, an excerpt from a United States Department of Agriculture report prepared by Jorge Fernandez Cornejo, Seth Weschler, Mike Livingston, and Lorraine Mitchell in February 2014. Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, given November 19, 1863, on the battlefield near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, USA. This recording is in the public domain. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this, but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. End of recording. This is in the public domain. Jane Hamilton's Recipes by Charlotte Marsh Poindexter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ice Cream and Ices Burnt Sugar To one quart of new milk, put eight eggs, leaving out the whites if you prefer, beating the eggs well. Stir in a tablespoonful of flour, strain the eggs through a sieve and add them to the milk take ten ounces of light brown sugar put it into a skillet and stir it until it boils up add the eggs and milk and boil two or three minutes season with cinnamon pounded 
put in a muslin bag and boiled in the custard as soon as the custard is cold freeze it caramel to one quart of fresh cream put ten ounces of light brown sugar and a tablespoonful of flour put the sugar into a brass skillet and let it boil up stirring it constantly mix the flour with a little of cream and then add the remainder of cream stirring it well so as to distribute the flour equally without any lumps throughout the cream as soon as the sugar boils up pour on the cream and let it stay until the sugar mixes entirely with it which is done by a constant stirring season with powdered cinnamon and as soon as it is entirely cold freeze it brown sugar it should be of the nicest is much better than loaf sugar for caramel as the loaf sugar has a bitter taste when burned coconut cream to two quarts of cream put two coconuts grated or beaten fine in a mortar and a pound and four ounces of sugar beat the cream and coconut well together the cream may be whipped before the coconut is put in lemon cream to one quart of pure cream put one quart of buttermilk one pound of loaf sugar the juice of two lemons of medium size with the oil from the rind of three or four of them this cream may be made with the oil of lemon but it is not so good as when made with the fresh lemon put the cream in the freezer on the ice before putting in the lemon to obtain the oil from the rind rub the sugar on the rind orange ice to two quarts of pure juice put one pound and six ounces of loaf sugar to make orange ice cream to two quarts of pure cream put twelve ounces of sugar and season it to the taste with extract of orange the proper proportion for freezing is one pound of fine salt to two pounds of pounded ice peach to two quarts of good cream put one pound and a half of loaf sugar and one quart of peaches the soft peach mashed to a pulp the peaches must be perfectly ripe take out the stringy substance that is next to the stone and mash them to a soft pulp they are much nicer when passed through a colander if you have one of silver a tin one will give them a taste the ice cream is very good with only one quart of pure cream and one quart of milk sherbet to one pint of water put one pound of loaf sugar the juice of six lemons and the whites of one dozen eggs beaten to a froth mix the sugar with the lemon juice and water as soon as the eggs are beaten and stir them in and freeze immediately the lemons must be large and well flavored strawberry to two quarts of pure rich sweet cream put seven eighths of a quart of pure strawberry juice and one quart of pounded loaf sugar the cream should be at the freezing point when the juice is put in mix the sugar and cream well together pour in the flavoring set the freezer in the ice and salt and when it is cold stir in the juice this cream and all the other creams except peach and coconut should be whipped with a whip just before freezing unless a patent freezer is used they always have dashers in them very good strawberry cream can be made by putting three quarters of a quart of mashed strawberries to one quart of cream and one quart of milk the ice for freezing should be broken into small pieces and mixed with about half its weight of salt cover the vessel which contains the freezer with a woolen cloth unless it has a wooden cover shake the freezer constantly unless you have a freezer with a dasher inside in which case you turn that constantly until the cream is frozen too hard to move it easily always freeze in a pantry or a cool room in the basement one quart of sugar weighs one pound and four ounces syllabub to one pint of rich cream add half a pint of madeira wine sweeten to your taste with loaf sugar whip with a whip and churn in a cool room or put the cream on the ice if the weather is warm if you want the syllabub dry put it in a sieve to drip as fast as you whip it up vanilla to two quarts of pure cream put twelve ounces of loaf sugar the seasoning of vanilla depends upon the strength of the extract generally it takes two teaspoonfuls of the extract to flavor one quart of cream if a good bean is cut up and macerated in six tablespoonfuls of brandy it takes about four tablespoonfuls to flavor two quarts of cream wine to two quarts of pure rich cream put one pint of good madeira wine 
and one pound six ounces of pounded loaf sugar have the cream in the freezer and on the ice before you put in the wine whip it to a froth with a whip and churn end of jane hamilton's recipes by charlotte marsh poindexter john adams letter to abigail adams philadelphia july third seventeen seventy six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by dale grothman john adams letter to abigail adams philadelphia july third seventeen seventy six had a declaration of independency been made seven months ago it would have been attended by many great and glorious effects we might before this hour have formed alliances with foreign states we should have mastered quebec and been in possession of canada you will perhaps wonder how such a declaration would have influenced our affairs in canada but if i could write with freedom I could easily convince you that it would and explain to you the manner how many gentlemen in high stations and of great influence have been duped by the ministerial bubble of commissioners to treat and in a real sincere expectation of this event which they so fondly wished they have been slow and languid in promoting measures for the reduction of that province others there are in the colonies who really wished that our enterprise in canada would be defeated that the colonies might be brought into danger and distress between two fires and be thus induced to submit others really wish to defeat the expedition to canada lest the conquest of it should elevate the minds of the people too much to hearken to those terms of reconciliation which they believed would be offered us these jarring views wishes and designs occasioned an opposition to many salutary measures which were proposed for the support of the expedition and caused obstructions embarrassments and studied delays which have finally lost us the province all of these causes however in conjunction would not have disappointed us if it had not been for a misfortune which could not have been foreseen and perhaps could not have been prevented i mean the prevalence of smallpox among our troops this fatal pestilence completed our destruction it is a frown of providence upon us which we ought to lay to heart but on the other hand the delay of this declaration to this time has many great advantages attending it hopes of reconciliation which were fondly entertained by the multitudes of honest and well-meaning though weak and mistaken people have been gradually and at last totally extinguished time has been given for the whole people maturely to consider the great question of independence and to ripen their judgments dissipate their fears and allure their hopes by discussing it in newspapers and pamphlets by debating it in assemblies conventions committees of safety and inspection in town and county meetings as well as in private conversations so that the whole people in every colony of the thirteen have now adopted it as their own act this will cement the union and avoid those heats and perhaps convulsions which might have occasioned by such a declaration six months ago but the day is past the second day of july seventeen seventy six will be the most memorable epoch in the history of america i am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival it ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to god almighty it ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade with shrews games sports guns bells bonfires and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other 
from this time forward forevermore you will think me transported with enthusiasm but i am not i am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration and support and defend these states yet through all the gloom i can see the rays of ravishing light and glory i can see that the end is more than worth all the means and that posterity will triumph in that day's transaction even although we should rue it which i trust in god we shall not the end of john adams letter to abigail adams philadelphia july third seventeen seventy six judge harlan's dissent plessy versus ferguson one sixty three u s five thirty seven 1896. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Judge Harlan's Dissent, Plessy v. Ferguson, 163 U.S. 537, 1896. By the Louisiana Statute, the validity of which is here involved all railway companies other than street railway companies carry passengers in that state are required to have separate but equal accommodations for white and colored persons by providing two or more passenger coaches for each passenger train or by dividing the passenger coaches by a partition so as to secure separate accommodations under this statute no colored person is permitted to occupy a seat in a coach assigned to white persons nor any white person to occupy a seat in a coach assigned to colored persons the managers of the railroad are not allowed to exercise any discretion in the premises but are required to assign each passenger to some coach or compartment set apart for the exclusive use of its race if a passenger insists upon going into a coach or compartment not set apart for persons of his race he is subject to be fined or to be imprisoned in the parish jail penalties are prescribed for the refusal or neglect of the officers directors conductors and employees of the railroad companies to comply with the provisions of the act only nurses attending children of the other race are accepted from the operation of the statute no exception is made of colored attendants traveling with adults a white man is not permitted to have his colored servant with him in the same coach even if his condition of health requires the constant personal assistance of such servant if a colored maid insists upon riding in the same coach with a white woman whom she has been employed to serve and who may need her personal attention while traveling she is subject to be fined or imprisoned for such an exhibition of zeal in the discharge of duty while there may be in louisiana persons of different races who are not citizens of the united states the words in the act white and colored races necessarily include all citizens of the united states of both races residing in that state so that we have before us a state enactment that compels under penalties the separation of the two races in railroad passenger coaches and makes it a crime for a citizen of either race to enter a coach that has been assigned to citizens of the other race thus the state regulates the use of a public highway by citizens of the united states solely upon the basis of race however apparent the injustice of such legislation may be we have only to consider whether it is consistent with the constitution of the united states that a railroad is a public highway and that the corporation which owns or operates it is in the exercise of public functions is not at this day to be disputed mr justice nelson speaking for this court 
in New Jersey Steam Navigation Company versus Merchants Bank, 6 How 344 382, said that a common carrier was in the exercise of a sort of public office and has public duties to perform, from which he should not be permitted to exonerate himself without the assent of the parties concerned. Mr. Justice Strong delivering the judgment of this court in Alcott v. Supervisors, 16 Wall, 678, 694, said that all railroads, though constructed by private corporations and owned by them, are public highways, has been the doctrine of nearly all the courts ever since such conveyances for passage and transportation have had any existence. Very early the question arose whether a state's right of eminent domain could be exercised by a private corporation created for the purpose of constructing a railroad. Clearly, it could not, unless taking land for such a purpose by such an agency is taking land for public use. The right of eminent domain nowhere justifies taking property for a private use. Yet it is a doctrine universally accepted that a state legislature may authorize a private corporation to take land for the construction of such a road, making compensation to the owner. What else does this doctrine mean, if not that building a railroad, though it be built by a private corporation, is an act done for public use? So in Township of Pine Grove versus Talcott, 19 Wall, 666, 676. Though the corporation, a railroad company, was private, its work was public, as much so as if it were to be constructed by the state. So, in inhabitants of Worcester versus Western R Corporation, 4 Metic, Massachusetts, 564, the establishment of that great thoroughfare is regarded as a public work established by public authority intended for the public use and benefit the use of which is secured to the whole community and constitutes therefore like a canal turnpike or highway a public easement it is true that the real and personal property necessary to the establishment and management of the railroad is vested in the corporation but it is in trust for the public in respect of civil rights common to all citizens the constitution of the united states does not i think permit any public authority to know the race of those entitled to be protected in the enjoyment of such rights every true man has pride of a race and under appropriate circumstances when the rights of others his equals before the law are not to be affected it is his privilege to express such pride and to take such action based upon it as to him seems proper but i deny that any legislative body or judicial tribunal may have regard to the race of citizens when the civil rights of those citizens are involved indeed such legislation as that here in question is inconsistent not only with the equality of rights which pertains to citizenship national and state but with the personal liberty enjoyed by everyone within the united states the thirteenth amendment does not permit the withholding or the deprivation of any right necessarily inhering in freedom it not only struck down the institution of slavery as previously existing in the united states but it prevents the imposition of any burdens or disabilities that constitute badges of slavery or servitude it decreed universal civil freedom in this country this court has so adjudged but that amendment having been found inadequate to the protection of the rights of those who had been in slavery it was followed by the fourteenth amendment which added greatly to the dignity and glory of american citizenship and to the security of personal liberty by declaring that all persons born or naturalized in the united states and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the united states and of the state wherein they reside 
and that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States nor shall any state deprive any person of life liberty or property without due process of law nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws these two amendments if enforced according to their true intent and meaning will protect all the civil rights that pertain to freedom and citizenship finally and to the end that no citizen should be denied on account of his race the privilege of participating in the political control of his country it was declared by the fifteenth amendment that the right of citizens of the united states to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the united states or by any state on account of race color or previous condition of servitude these notable additions to the fundamental law were welcomed by the friends of liberty throughout the world they removed the race line from our governmental systems they had as this court has said a common purpose namely to secure to a race recently emancipated a race that through many generations have been held in slavery all the civil rights that the superior race enjoy they declared in legal effect this court has further said that the law in the states shall be the same for the black as for the white that all persons whether colored or white shall stand equal before the laws of the states and in regard to the colored race for whose protection the amendment was primarily designed that no discrimination shall be made against them by law because of their color we also said the words of the amendment it is true are prohibitory but they contain a necessary implication of a positive immunity or right most valuable to the colored race the right to exemption from unfriendly legislation against them distinctively as colored exemption from legal discriminations implying inferiority in civil society lessening the security of their enjoyment of the rights which others enjoy and the discrimination which are steps toward reducing them to the condition of a subject race it was consequently adjudged that a state law that excluded citizens of the colored race from juries because of their race however well qualified in other respects to discharge the duties of jurymen was repugnant to the fourteenth amendment strotter versus west virginia 100 us 303 306 307 virginia versus rise id 313 x party virginia id 339 neil versus delaware 103 us 370 386 bush versus com 107 us 110 116 one superior court 625 at the present term referring to the previous adjudications this court declared that underlying all of these decisions is the principle that the constitution of the united states in its present form forbids so far as civil and political rights are concerned discrimination by the general government or the states against any citizen because of his race all citizens are equal before the law Gibson v. State, 162 U.S., 565, 16, Superior Court, 904. The decisions referred to show the scope of the recent amendments to the Constitution. They also show that it is not within the power of a state to prohibit colored citizens, because of their race, from participating as jurors in the administration of justice. It was said in argument that the statute of Louisiana does not discriminate against either race, but prescribes a rule applicable alike to white and colored citizens. But this argument does not meet the difficulty. Everyone knows that the statute in question had its origins in the purpose, not so much to exclude white persons from railroad cars occupied by blacks, as to exclude colored people from the coaches occupied by 
or assigned to white persons railroad corporations of louisiana did not make discrimination among whites in the matter of accommodations for travelers the thing to accomplish was under the guise of giving equal accommodation for whites and blacks to compel the latter to keep to themselves while traveling in railroad passenger coaches no one would be so wanting in candor as to assert the contrary the fundamental objection therefore to the statute is that it interferes with the personal freedom of citizens personal liberty it has been well said consists in the power of locomotion of changing situation or removing one's person to whatever places one's own inclination may direct without imprisonment or restraint unless by due course of law 1 bl com 134 if a white man and a black man choose to occupy the same public conveyance on a public highway it is their right to do so and no government proceeding alone on the grounds of race can prevent it without infringing the personal liberty of each it is one thing for railroad carriers to furnish or to be required by law to furnish equal accommodations for all whom they are under legal duty to carry it is quite another thing for the government to forbid citizens of the white and black races from traveling in the same public conveyance and to punish officers of railroad companies for permitting persons of the two races to occupy the same passenger coach if a state can prescribe as a rule of civil conduct that whites and blacks shall not travel as passengers in the same railroad coach why may it not so regulate the use of the streets of its cities and towns as to compel white citizens to keep on one side of the street and black citizens to keep on the other why may it not upon like grounds punish whites and blacks who ride together in street cars or in open vehicles on a public road or street why may it not require sheriffs to assign whites to one side of the courtroom and blacks to the other and why may it not also prohibit the commingling of the two races in the galleries of legislative halls or in public assemblages convened for the consideration of the political questions of the day further if this statute of louisiana is consistent with the personal liberty of citizens why may not the state require the separation in railroad coaches of native and naturalized citizens of the united states or of protestants and roman catholics the answer given at the argument to these questions was that regulations of the kind they suggest would be unreasonable and could not therefore stand before the law is it meant that the determination of the question of legislative power depends upon the inquiry whether the statute whose validity is questioned is in the judgment of the courts a reasonable one taking all the circumstances into consideration a statute may be unreasonable merely because a sound public policy forbade its enactment but i do not understand that the courts have anything to do with the policy or expedience of legislation a statute may be valid and yet upon grounds of public policy may well be characterized as unreasonable mr sedgwick correctly states the rule when he says that the legislative intention being clearly ascertained the courts have no other duty to perform than to execute the legislative will without any regard to their views as to the wisdom or justice of the particular enactment sedge street and construct law 324 there is a dangerous tendency in these latter days to enlarge the functions of the courts by means of judicial interference with the will of the people as expressed by the legislature our institutions have the distinguishing characteristic that the three departments of government are coordinated and separate each must keep within the limits defined by the constitution and the courts best discharge their duty by executing the will of the law-making power constitutionally expressed leaving the results of legislation to be dealt with 
by the people through their representatives. Statutes must always have a reasonable construction. Sometimes they are to be construed strictly, sometimes literally, in order to carry out the legislative will. But however construed, the intent of the legislation is to be respected if the particular statute in question is valid. Although the courts, looking at the public interest, may conceive the statute to be both unreasonable and impolitic. If the power exists to enact a statute, that ends the matter so far as the courts are concerned. The adjudged cases in which statutes have been held to be void because unreasonable are those in which the means employed by the legislature were not at all germane to the end to which the legislature was competent. The white race deems itself to be the dominant race in this country, and so it is, in prestige, in achievements, in education, in wealth, and in power. So, I doubt it not, it will continue to be for all time if it remains true to its great heritage, and holds fast to the principle of constitutional liberty. But in view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior, dominant, ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind, and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. The law regards man as man, and takes no account of his surroundings, or of his color, when his civil rights, as guaranteed by the supreme law of the land, are involved. It is therefore to be regretted that this high tribunal, the final expositor of the fundamental law of the land, has reached the conclusion that it is competent for a state to regulate the enjoyment by citizens of their civil rights solely upon the basis of race. In my opinion, the judgment this day rendered will, in time, prove to be quite as pernicious as the decision made by this tribunal in the Dred Scott case. It was adjudged in that case that the descendants of Africans who were imported into this country and sold as slaves were not included nor intended to be included under the word citizens in the Constitution, and could not claim any of the rights and privileges which that instrument provided for and secured to citizens of the United States. That, at time of the adoption of the Constitution, they were considered as a subordinate and inferior class of beings who had been subjugated by the dominant race, and, whether emancipated or not, yet remained subject to their authority, and had no rights or privileges but such as those who held the power and the government might choose to grant them. 17 Howe, 393, 404. The recent amendments of the Constitution, it is supposed, had eradicated these principles from our institutions. But it seems that we have yet, in some of the states, a dominant race, a superior class of citizens, which assumes to regulate the enjoyment of civil rights, common to all citizens, upon the basis of race. The present decision, it may well be apprehended, will not only stimulate aggressions, more or less brutal and irritating, upon the admitted rights of colored citizens, but will encourage the belief that it is possible, by means of state enactments, to defeat the beneficial purposes which the people of the United States had in view when they adopted the recent amendments to the Constitution by one of which the blacks of this country were made citizens of the United States, and of the states in which they respectively reside, and whose privileges and immunities as citizens the states are forbidden to abridge. Sixty millions of whites are in no danger from the presence here of eight millions of blacks. The destinies of the two races in this country are indissolubly linked together, and the interests of both require that the common government of all shall not permit the seeds of race hate to be planted under the sanction of law what can more certainly arouse race hate 
what more certainly create and perpetuate a feeling of distrust between these races than state enactments which in fact proceed on the ground that colored citizens are so inferior and degraded that they cannot be allowed to sit in public coaches occupied by white citizens that as all will admit is the real meaning of such legislation as was enacted in louisiana the sure guarantee of the peace and security of each race is the clear distinct unconditional recognition by our governments national and state of every right that inures in civil freedom and of the equality before the law of all citizens of the united states without regard to race state enactments regulating the enjoyment of civil rights upon the basis of race and cunningly devised to defeat legitimate results of the war under the pretense of recognizing equality of rights can have no other result than to render permanent peace impossible and to keep alive a conflict of races the continuation of which must do harm to all concerned this question is not met by the suggestion that social equality cannot exist between the white and black races in this country that argument if it can be properly regarded as one is scarcely worthy of consideration for social equality no more exists between two races when traveling in a passenger coach or on a public highway than when members of the same races sit by each other in a street car or in a jury box or stand or sit with each other in a political assembly or when they use in common the streets of a city or town or when they are in the same room for the purpose of having their names placed on the registry of voters or when they approach the ballot box in order to exercise the high privilege of voting there is a race so different from our own that we do not permit those belonging to it to become citizens of the united states persons belonging to it are with few exceptions absolutely excluded from our country i allude to the chinese race but by the statute in question a chinaman can ride in the same passenger coach with white citizens of the united states while citizens of the black race in louisiana many of whom perhaps risk their lives for the preservation of the union who are entitled by law to participate in the political control of the state and nation who are not excluded by law or by reason of their race from public stations of any kind and who have all the legal rights that belong to white citizens are yet declared to be criminals liable to imprisonment if they ride in a public coach occupied by citizens of the white race it is scarcely just to say that a colored citizen should not object to occupying a public coach assigned to his own race he does not object nor perhaps would he object to separate coaches for his race if his rights under the law were recognized but he does object and he ought never to cease objecting that the citizens of the white and black races can be adjudged criminals because they sit or claim the right to sit in the same public coach on a public highway the arbitrary separation of citizens on the basis of race while they are on a public highway is a badge of servitude wholly inconsistent with the civil freedom and the equality before the law established by the constitution it cannot be justified upon any legal grounds if evils will result from the commingling of the two races upon the public highways established for the benefit of all they will be infinitely less than those that will surely come from state legislation regulating the enjoyment of civil rights on the basis of race we boast of the freedom enjoyed by our people above all other peoples but it is difficult to reconcile that boast with a state of the law which practically puts the brand of servitude and degradation upon a large class of our fellow citizens our equals before the law the thin disguise of equal accommodations for passengers in railroad coaches will not mislead anyone nor atone for the wrong this day done 
The result of the whole matter is that while this court has frequently adjudged, and at the present term has recognized the doctrine, that a state cannot, consistently with the Constitution of the United States, prevent white and black citizens having the required qualifications for jury service from sitting in the same jury box. It is now solemnly held that a state may prohibit white and black citizens from sitting in the same passenger coach on a public highway, or may require that they be separated by a partition when in the same passenger coach. May it not now be reasonably expected that astute men of the dominant race, who affect to be disturbed at the possibility that the integrity of the white race may be corrupted, or that its supremacy will be imperiled by contact on public highways with black people, will endeavor to procure statutes requiring white and black jurors to be separated in the jury box by a partition, and that, upon retiring from the courtroom to consult as to their verdict, such partition, if it be a movable one, shall be taken to their consultation room and set up in such a way as to prevent black jurors from coming too close to their brother jurors of the white race. If the partition used in the courtroom happens to be stationary, provision could be made for screens with openings through which jurors of the two races could confer as to their verdict without coming into personal contact with each other. I cannot see but that according to the principles this day announced, such state legislation, although conceived in hostility to and enacted for the purpose of humiliating citizens of the United States of a particular race, would be held to be consistent with the Constitution. I do not deem it necessary to review the decision of the state courts to which reference has been made in argument. Some, and the most important of them, are wholly inapplicable because rendered prior to the adoption of the last amendments of the Constitution, when colored people had very few rights which the dominant race felt obligated to respect. Others were made at a time when public opinion in many localities was dominated by the institution of slavery, when it would not have been safe to do justice to the black man, and when, so far as the rights of blacks were concerned, race prejudice was practically the supreme law of the land those decisions cannot be guides to the era introduced by the recent amendments of the supreme law which established universal civil freedom gave citizenship to all born or naturalized in the united states and residing here obliterated the race line from our system of governments national and state and placed our free institutions on the broad and sure foundation of the equality of all men before the law. I am of the opinion that the state of Louisiana is inconsistent with the personal liberty of citizens, white and black, in that state, and hostile to both the spirit and the letter of the Constitution of the United States. If laws of like character should be enacted in the several states of the Union, the effect would be in the highest degree mischievous. Slavery, as an institution tolerated by law, would, it is true, have disappeared from our country, but there would remain a power in the states, by sinister legislation, to interfere with the full enjoyment of the blessings of freedom, to regulate civil rights, common to all citizens, upon the basis of race and to place in a condition of legal inferiority a large body of American citizens, now constituting a part of the political community called the people of the United States, for whom and by whom, through representatives, our government is administered. Such a system is inconsistent with the guarantee given by the Constitution to each state of the Republican form of government, and may be stricken down by congressional action or by the courts in the discharge of their solemn duty to maintain the supreme law of the land. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. For the reason stated, I am constrained to withhold my assent from the opinion and judgment of the majority. The End of Judge Harlan's Dissent Plessy versus Ferguson 
163 U.S. 537, 1896. Manifesto of the Humanitarian League by the League itself. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Manifesto of the Humanitarian League. The Humanitarian League has been established in the belief that the promulgation of a high and positive system of morality in the conduct of life, in all its aspects, is one of the greatest needs of the time it will assert as the basis of that system an intelligible and consistent principle of humaneness viz that it is iniquitous to inflict suffering directly or indirectly on any sentient being except when self-defence or absolute necessity can be justly pleaded the creed expressed by wordsworth in his well-known lines never to blend our pleasure or our pride with sorrow of the meanest thing that feels this principle the humanitarian league will apply and emphasize in those cases where it appears to be most flagrantly overlooked and will protest not only against the cruelties inflicted by men on men in the name of law authority and conventional usage but also in accordance with the same sentiment of humanity against the wanton ill-treatment of the lower animals the Humanitarian League will therefore demand the thorough revision and more equitable administration of the present criminal code under which a very large amount of injustice and oppression is still frequently perpetrated. It will deprecate the various provocations and incentives to aggressive warfare and will point to the evils that result from the ever-increasing array of military and naval armaments. It will insist on the recognition by the community of its primary duty the protection of the weak and helpless will urge the need of amending a condition of society under which a large portion of the people is in a state of chronic destitution furthermore in view of the increasing evidence of the sufficiency of a non-flesh diet the humanitarian league will aim at the prevention of the terrible sufferings to which countless numbers of highly organized animals are yearly subjected through the habit of flesh-eating which is directly responsible for the barbarities of the cattle traffic and the shambles and will advocate as an initial measure the abolition of private slaughterhouses the presence of which in our large centres is admitted to be a cause of widespread demoralization it will contend that the practice of vivisection is incompatible with the fundamental principles both of humanity and sound science and that the infliction of suffering for ends purely selfish such as sport fashion profit and professional advancement is largely instrumental in debasing the general standard of morality the humanitarian league will look to its members to do their utmost both in private and public to promote the above-mentioned scheme its work will involve no sort of rivalry with that of any existing institution on the contrary it is designed to supplement and reinforce such efforts as have already been organized for similar objects the distinctive purpose and guiding policy of the league will be to consolidate and give consistent expression to those principles of humaneness the recognition of which is essential to the understanding and realization of all that is highest and best in humanity communications to be addressed to the secretary thirty eight gloucester road regent's park london northwest end of the manifesto of the humanitarian league released by the humanitarian league itself nanook of the north by robert e sherwood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Nanook of the North from The Best Moving Pictures of 1922-1923 Produced by Revillon Frères Directed and photographed by Robert J. Flaherty, FRGS Distributed by Pathé Released June 11, 1922 There have been many fine travel pictures, many gorgeous scenics, 
but there has been only one that deserves to be called great. That one is Nanook of the North. It stands alone, literally in a class by itself. Indeed, no list of the best pictures of this year, or of all the years in the brief history of the movies, could be considered complete without it. The potential value of the movies as an educational medium is frequently stressed by men of prominence and triteness, and as a result the word educational, in connection with the motion picture, has become almost synonymous with dullness, dryness, and boredom. The screen is no blackboard, and the prime test of every film that is projected on its surface is that it shall be interesting to the spectator. It may be teeming with genuine instructive value. It may contain what is generally called a message, but if it fails to hold the audience's attention, the value and the message will be lost. Robert J. Flaherty realized this when he produced Nanook of the North. He wanted to make a picture of Eskimo life, and, to the average mind, there is no character that is colder or less enthralling than an Eskimo, and he wanted to record the tremendous vitality, the relentless force of the Arctic. He knew that there was good material here, but he also knew that this material would be worthless unless he presented it in an interesting way. He appreciated the fact that mere photographs of Eskimos in their daily activities would be hopelessly dull if he treated his subject as instruction instead of as drama. The backbone of every motion picture is the continuity, and by this I do not mean the plot. Nanook of the North had no plot whatsoever and struggled along very well without it, but it did have continuity. The arrangement of scenes was sound and logical and consistent. Mr. Flaherty selected one character, Nanook himself, to serve as the protagonist of his drama. Nanook was the center of all the action, and upon him was the camera focused. In this way, Mr. Flaherty achieved the personal touch. Another producer, attempting to do the same thing, would have been content to photograph a native spearing fish, or another native building his igloo. Moreover, he would have kept himself in the foreground, as is the way of all travelogue rollers. Mr. Flaherty made Nanook his hero, and a fine stalwart hero he was. Nanook of the North, however, was not all Nanook. There was a co-star in the title role, and that was the North. The North was the villain of the piece, the dread force against which Nanook and his kind must continually battle. So Mr. Flaherty showed us Nanook fighting sturdily to obtain food and warmth and shelter, and he showed us the North hitting back with its gales, its blizzards, and its terrible bitter cold. Here was drama, rendered far more vital than any trumped-up drama could ever be, by the fact that it was all real. Nanook was no playboy, enacting a part which would be forgotten as soon as the grease paint had been rubbed off. He was himself an Eskimo, struggling to survive. The North was no mechanical affair of wind machines and paper snow. It was the North, cruel and incredibly strong. The production of this remarkable picture was no light task. Mr. Flaherty had to spend years with the Eskimos so that he could learn to understand them. Otherwise, he could not have made a faithful reflection of their emotions, their philosophy, and their endless privations. He had to select from among them those who were best qualified to tell the story of their race. He had to do his photography, his developing, and his printing under terribly adverse conditions. He had no studio, no artificial lights, and only the crudest of laboratories. In the preface to this book, I say that the motion picture represents the combined talents of hundreds, sometimes thousands of different people. But Nanook of the North is the notable exception to that rule. It was essentially a one-man job. Of the difficulties which confronted him in producing Nanook of the North, Mr. Flaherty writes as follows. The film Nanook of the North is a byproduct, if I may use the term, of a long series of explorations in the North which I carried on in behalf of Sir William Mackenzie from 1910 to 1916. Much of the exploration was done with Eskimos. I have been on long journeys for months at a time with only two or three Eskimos as my companions. This experience gave me an insight into their lives and a deep regard for them. In 1913, I went north with a large outfit, an exploring ship with lumber and material for a wintering base and food for eight men for two years. A motion picture outfit was incorporated. I hoped that the results of it might help defray some of the costs of what were now beginning to be expensive explorations. 
I had no preliminary motion picture experience other than some two weeks with a motion picture camera demonstrator just before leaving. We wintered in Baffin land on this expedition, which was of a year and four months duration, and during those intervals when I was not seriously engaged in exploratory work, a film was compiled of some of the Eskimos who lived with us. Naturally, the results were indifferent. But as I was undertaking another expedition in a different part of the North, I secured more negative and chemicals, with the idea of building up this first film. On this expedition, I wintered in the Belcher Islands, which I had rediscovered and explored. Again, between explorations, as it were, I continued with the film work and added to the first film very materially. After a lot of hardship, which involved the loss of a launch and the wrecking of our cruising boat, we secured a remarkable film on a small island 90 miles out at sea of walrus hunting. This picture particularly, and some interesting stuff of native life, together with scenes showing the dismasting of the laddie, our exploring ship, which owing to our condition was broken up and used for fuel, formed the nucleus of what I hoped would be a good picture. After wintering a year in the islands, the laddie skipper, a moose factory half-breed, and myself finally got out to civilization along with my notes, maps, and the above-mentioned film. I had just completed editing the film in Toronto, when through gross carelessness of my own, the negative caught fire, and I was minus all, some 30,000 feet of film. The editing print, however, was not burned, and this was shown to some private groups several times, just long enough, in fact, to enable me to realize that it was no good. I knew then that the reason I had missed out was that the whole thing was episodic, but I did see that if I were to take a single character and make him typify the Eskimos as I had known them so long and well, the results would be well worthwhile. To make a long story short, that is what happened. I went north again, this time solely to make a film. I took with me not only motion picture cameras, negative and developing outfit, but apparatus for producing electric light so that I could print and project my results as they were being made. Thus, I could correct the faults and retake wherever necessary, and more particularly still, my character and his family who lived with me through the year could understand and appreciate what I was doing. Though Nanook and his crowd were at first highly amused at the idea of the white man wanting to take pictures of themselves, the most common objects in all the world, as soon as I got my projection apparatus going and showed them some of the first results, they were completely won over. As luck would have it, the first picture that was made was the walrus hunt, which many of the younger generation had never seen. I shall never forget the night it was first projected on a white cotton sheet in my wintering hut. The audience, men, women, babes, and children, squatted on the floor, completely forgot that what was unfolding before them on the sheet was a picture. They yelled, screamed, and shouted their advice where the four stalwarts were shown in the walrus tug of war. In the language of the trade, that first picture was a knockout. From that time on, they were with me to a man. Indeed, they vied with one another to be cast in the Angaruka's Big Aggie picture. After Mr. Flaherty had completed the picture and had brought it to New York, he encountered a new set of problems. He ran into the movie distributors. He learned that Eskimos were remarkably tractable as compared with these important gentlemen who are empowered to decide what the public shall see and what it shall not see. He had been backed on this Arctic expedition by Reve Jan Frères, the farriers, but Reve Jan Frères could not sell his picture for him. He took Nanook of the North to five different distributing corporations, all of which turned him down flat. They told him that the public is not interested in Eskimos. The public wants to see people in dress suits. Finally, he effected a deal with Pathé, and Nanook of the North was timorously submitted to the exhibitors. One of them, Samuel Rothafell of the Capitol Theater in New York, decided to give it a try, although he was frankly dubious about its possibilities as a box office attraction. The week that Nanook of the North played at the Capitol Theater, it did $43,000 worth of business. It was instantly hailed by every critic in New York, and the public, which wants to see people in dress suits, responded nobly. Nanook of the North has since proved to be a substantial, if not a sensational, box office success. One of the distributing companies, the famous players, Lasky, which elected to throw Nanook of the North back into the cold from whence it came, has made amends in an honorable and emphatic way. Jesse L. Lasky has sent Mr. Flaherty to Samoa to make a Polynesian Nanook. 
Moreover, he has made no restrictions as to money, time, or quality, so that we may expect eventually to see the first real representation of the glamorous South Sea Isles on the screen. There was a tragic sequel to Nanook of the North, which did not appear in the film itself. Some time after Mr. Flaherty departed from the Arctic with his negatives and his prints, the gallant Nanook died of starvation. The villainous North finally won in its mortal combat, and Nanook became the first hero in movie history who has gone down to ultimate defeat. But his soul goes marching on. His shadowy form still flickers across the screen to prove to distributors and other short-sighted persons that Eskimos are human beings, after all. End of Nanook of the North by Robert E. Sherwood Read by Colleen McMahon The Nation's Capital by Clifton Johnson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Nation's Capital the powerful Algonquin tribe at one time had its capital within the confines of what is now the District of Columbia. Powhatan lived in a wigwam at the present Washington suburb known as Anacostia. Captain John Smith sailed past here in 1608 and recorded that he found the river full of luscious fish and its shores lined with ferocious savages. A party of immigrants came to the region in 1660 and by dint of fighting and bargaining made the indians move on then the newcomers began to till the soil after the colonies had won their independence and the question of selecting a permanent site for a capital had to be decided all agreed that it should be fixed as near as possible to what would remain the center of population which in seventeen ninety was twenty three miles east of baltimore some were convinced that it would stay indefinitely in the north and others that the tides of humanity would flow toward the warm and fertile south none foresaw the transformation that would be wrought by railroads and telegraphy and the teeming civilization destined to develop in the western solitudes by nineteen ten the center of population was in bloomington indiana when congress finally agreed in seventeen ninety to establish the capital on the potomac it simply designated a strip eighty miles long from which president washington was to choose the location washington himself therefore walked through the wilderness with his surveying instruments and his assistants and discussed terms and titles at the georgetown tavern with the owners of the land the district of columbia was at first ten miles square and included a tract on each side of the potomac but that on the southern side was later relinquished, diminishing the area to 69 square miles. The topographical plan of the city was devised by a French engineer who had served in the Continental Army. He based it on that of Versailles, the seat of government in France. The plan was on such a grand scale and the actual growth so slow for many years that Washington was often satirically called the city of magnificent distances long straight avenues were cut through the forest and on september eighteenth seventeen ninety three the southeast cornerstone of the capital was laid by the president after the exercises ended the assemblage retired to an extensive booth to partake of a barbecued ox and presently fifteen volleys of artillery concluded the festival the white house was begun a year earlier and was ready for use in seventeen ninety nine john adams was the first president to occupy it mrs adams says in one of her letters the lighting of the apartments from the kitchen to parlors and chambers is a tax indeed the great unfinished east room i make a drying room to hang my clothes in washington called the place federal city but after he died it received its name when the seat of government was moved from philadelphia to the new capital in eighteen hundred department records and equipment were sent by vessels and the clerks and officials journeyed with their families by stage they found washington very inadequately prepared to receive them and those who could not crowd into the few hotels and other buildings had to resort to georgetown three miles away through mud and forest only one government building was finished 
and pennsylvania avenue the principal thoroughfare was a bog lined by bushes the original intention was to build the city on the salubrious high ground immediately around the capitol and that the president's house should be a secluded comfortable retreat amid ample grounds in the suburbs but the people persisted in building on the low ground adjacent to the broad pennsylvania avenue which led from the capitol to the executive mansion on august twenty fourth eighteen fourteen a british force of five thousand after defeating a somewhat larger body of americans mostly militia at bladensburg encamped at nightfall close to washington and details of troops burned the capitol white house treasury and navy yard the conflagration lit up the whole surrounding country before mrs madison the wife of the president left the city she secured gilbert stuart's celebrated portrait of washington and the original draft of the declaration of independence to carry with her the stone walls of the president's mansion remained standing and when the building was restored the stone was painted white to obliterate the marks of the fire thus it acquired the name by which it is commonly known the city developed slowly very little paving had been done by eighteen sixty and most of the streets were worse than country roads in summer the dust rose in clouds and in winter the streets were well-nigh impassable with mud street railways did not exist until eighteen sixty two the civil war transformed the city into a vast military camp and hospital long trains of army wagons were almost constantly passing through the streets and at times many churches public institutions and the capital itself were given up to hospital service the dome and two wings of the capital were built between the years eighteen fifty one and eighteen sixty five the wings are marble but the main building is sandstone painted white the dome is one of the stateliest in the world and its impressiveness is aided by the admirable situation of the building on a dominating hilltop which rises ninety feet above the level of the potomac on the tip of the dome is a bronze statue of liberty sixteen and one-half feet high the building covers three and one-half acres and is in a fifty-acre park an odd feature of the interior is a whispering gallery in the rotunda the white house a trifle over a mile distant is no less satisfying in its stately simplicity and its generous grounds seventy-five acres in extent that sweep down to the potomac river there by the waterside is the washington monument a widely famed architectural feature of the city chiefly impressive because of its height for it is an absolutely unornamented tapering marble shaft more severely plain than a factory chimney the obelisk was begun in eighteen forty eight but work on it ceased in eighteen fifty four when it had reached a height of one hundred and fifty six feet and was not resumed until eighteen seventy seven it was finished in eighteen eighty four at a cost of two million dollars from the floor to the tip it soars up five hundred and fifty five feet and for years it was the highest masonry structure in the world it can be ascended either by a fatiguing climb of its nine hundred steps or by elevator the walls are fifteen feet thick at the entrance but gradually thin to eighteen inches at the top the immensity of the monument is only fully appreciated when one stands right at its base but it is seen to best advantage from an adjacent island park summer heat and winter bleakness detract from the charm of the city and the ideal months for a visit are may and october of all american cities washington has the largest negro population about one hundred thousand but new york and new orleans are close seconds everywhere are the vast structures necessary for carrying on the nation's business on the same hill occupied by the capitol is the enormous congressional library finished in eighteen ninety seven at a cost of six million dollars and capable of containing four and one-half million volumes its sumptuous adornments of painting sculpture colored marbles and gilding have special interest the bureau of engraving and printing is the largest printing plant in the world here you can see paper money bonds and stamps in the process of manufacture and visit an exhibit of old-time 
fractional currency, shin plasters, and see a $10,000 gold certificate, the largest note issued. Among the many treasures at the Museum of Natural History are the Roosevelt African Trophies, complete group studies of North American Indians showing their habits and ceremonies, and exhibits illustrating early man in various countries. The Botanic Gardens and Smithsonian Institution also have exceptional attractions. The Union Railway Station is a fitting companion to the best of the government buildings in architectural beauty and size. Many wonderful paintings can be seen at the Corcoran Gallery and the National Gallery of Art. On 10th Street is Ford's Theater, where Lincoln was shot. Just across the street is the house in which he died and which is now a repository for Lincoln relics. Nearby is Baptist Alley, through which John Wilkes Booth escaped. Rock Creek Cemetery should be visited, if for no other reason, because it contains St. Godin's noble monument to Mrs. Henry Adams. The city wharves along the Potomac are not without touches of the picturesque, and a canal comes into the place high up on the north bank of the river, to which it descends by a series of locks. Coal brought from the mines in the Cumberland Mountains is the ordinary canal boat cargo. Within easy reach of Washington are various noteworthy attractions, including Arlington, which was the home of General Lee, Old Alexandria, Mount Vernon, and the Great Falls of the Potomac. End of The Nation's Capital by Clifton Johnson Unleveling from Emile's Journal, September 6, 1851 by Friedrich Emil, 1821 to 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Emile's Journal, September 6, 1851. Tocqueville's book has on the whole a calming effect upon the mind, but it leaves a certain sense of disgust behind. It makes one realize the necessity of what is happening around us, and the inevitableness of the goal prepared for us. But it also makes it plain that the era of mediocrity in everything is beginning, and mediocrity freezes all desire. Equality engenders uniformity and it is by sacrificing what is excellent remarkable and extraordinary that we get rid of what is bad the whole becomes less barbarous and at the same time more vulgar the age of great men is going the epoch of the ant hill of life in multiplicity is beginning the century of individualism if abstract equality triumphs runs a great risk of seeing no more true individuals by continual leveling and division of labor society will become everything and man nothing as the floor of valleys is raised by the denudation and washing down of the mountains what is average will rise at the expense of what is great the exceptional will disappear a plateau with fewer and fewer undulations without contrasts and without oppositions such will be the aspect of human society the statistician will register a growing progress and the moralist a gradual decline on the one hand a progress of things on the other a decline of souls the useful will take the place of the beautiful industry of art political economy of religion and arithmetic of poetry the spleen will become the malady of a leveling age is this indeed the fate reserved for the democratic era may not the general well-being be purchased too dearly at such a price the creative force which in the beginning we see forever tending to produce and multiply differences will it afterward retrace its steps and obliterate them one by one and equality which in the dawn of existence is mere inertia torpor and death is it to become at last the natural form of life 
or rather above the economic and political equality to which the socialist and non-socialist democracy aspires taking it too often for the term of its efforts will there not arise a new kingdom of mind a church of refuge a republic of souls in which far beyond the region of mere right and sordid utility beauty devotion holiness heroism enthusiasm the extraordinary the infinite shall have a worship and an abiding city utilitarian materialism barren well-being the idolatry of the flesh and of the eye of the temporal and of mammon are they to be the goal if our efforts the final recompense promised to the labors of our race i do not believe it the ideal of humanity is something different and higher but the animal in us must be satisfied first and we must first banish from among us all suffering which is superfluous and has its origin in social arrangements before we can return to spiritual goods end of unleveling from emile's journal september sixth eighteen fifty one by frederick emile excerpt from poison mysteries in history romance and crime by c j s thompson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter one poisons used by ancient and primitive races excerpt poisons those silent weapons capable of destroying life mysteriously secretly and without violence have ever had a peculiar fascination for mankind they have played so large a part in history at various periods in romance as well as in crime that the subject is one which claims the attention of every student of human nature a poison may be generally described as any substance which in a small quantity when introduced into or absorbed by a living organism destroys life by rapid action in another sense a substance may be termed a poison that has a cumulative effect if administered for a length of time so that it ends fatally substances of this description were called venom venin venom or bane in the middle ages and also termed slow poisons it is probable that many substances which had the effect of destroying life were observed and used by primitive man from a period of remote antiquity when injured in a tribal battle by perhaps a flint arrowhead or stone axe he no doubt sought for something to revenge himself on his enemy in his search for curative substances he also found noxious ones which produced unpleasant effects when applied to the point of a weapon destined to enter the internal economy of an opponent he doubtless observed that the arrowhead and spear on which the blood of former victims had dried caused wounds which often proved fatal owing to the action of what we now term septic poisons this may have led him to experiment with the juices of plants till he discovered something of a more deadly character the observations of primitive man as to the poisonous effects of plants on animal life is evident from some of the names which he gave to them in early times instances of these are perpetuated in cowbane the water hemlock which often has a fatal effect on cattle salbane so called says parkinson in his herbal as it was observed to kill swine wolfsbane leopardsbane henbane and many others which might be mentioned showing that primitive man must have observed the evil effects on the animal whose name he associated with them in primeval times both the poisonous and medicinal properties of plants appear to have been first discovered and kept secret by the most observant and intelligent members of pastoral and nomadic tribes the possessor of such secrets wielded an immense power over his fellows and often combined the office of medicine man and priest he reserved to himself as much as possible the knowledge which he had acquired of plants and their uses and particularly those which would produce stupor delirium and death for by these means he was enabled to exert a greater influence over others the study therefore of the poisons employed by primitive races for destroying life in animals and man 
is one of considerable interest. Arrowheads and spearheads worked with depressions, probably for holding poisons, have been found in cave remains in the Paleolithic period in France. Lagno is of the opinion that these weapons were first used to destroy large animals, such as the bison and reindeer, and were probably also used in tribal warfare. Toxicon, the Greek word used to denote poison, takes its origin from a word signifying a bow, which probably symbolized a poison-tipped arrow, a custom still practiced by savage tribes in various parts of the world. It seems but a natural sequence that man should have turned to his own account the knowledge he acquired of the effects of substances which proved deadly when introduced into the body by either external or internal means, as in them he found a more secure and secret weapon by means of which he could rid himself of the objects of his jealousy, hatred, or revenge. The Greek toxican, from which the word toxicology is derived, is believed to have been used for the poisonous substance into which the arrowheads were dipped. Poisoned arrows are mentioned by several of the early writers, including Homer, Horace, and Ovid. The latter tells us how the blood of vipers was used to poison weapons, and there was a general belief that disease and death were caused by poisoned arrows shot by an offended deity, as instanced in the mythical story of Apollo, whose darts were supposed to smite man with pestilence. The Scythians are known to have used poisons and mixed the venom they employed with human blood. Certain tribes of the Caucasus are said to have employed viper venom mixed with decomposed human blood serum. Aristotle and Strabo state that the Celts were accustomed to poison their arrows and weapons, while Pliny and Celsus refer to the practice among the Gauls. As late as the 7th century, poisoned arrows were used by the Dacians and the Dalmatians on the shores of the Danube, and among the Goths it seems to have been a common custom. Almost every savage tribe and people throughout the world have been found to have their own particular poison for this purpose, and there is little doubt that this method of making the wound caused by the weapons more deadly has been practiced from a period of remote antiquity. Although most of the substances employed in the methods of preparation are now known to us, there are others about which little or no information can be obtained. The secret of the poison used by many barbaric tribes is still most jealously guarded and is only known to certain chiefs and their families or the medicine men of the tribe who pass on the knowledge to their successors. The substances used for lethal purposes are both of animal and vegetable origin and include poisonous insects and fish, snake venoms, and poisonous plants, which are used alone or mixed together. These substances are not equally effective, as the active principle by age tends to decompose, but if the poison be freshly prepared, as it often is, it generally proves fatal. Lewin, however, states that he found an arrow poison used by the Bushmen in Australia still active after remaining for 90 years in a Berlin museum. The poisons used by the various tribes of Bushmen of Africa vary according to the district in which they live. Livingstone states that those who inhabited the Kalahari district used the entrails of a small caterpillar for poisoning their spears and arrows. When drawn over a sore, this insect, which is known to the natives as Nga, causes the most excruciating agony, and those wounded by arrows smeared with this poison die slowly in a condition of violent delirium. Bain says the bushmen squeeze the grub gradually between the forefinger and thumb when a colorless fluid exudes which is smeared over the arrowhead, forming an imperceptible coating. Modern investigators who have studied the properties of this curious poison state that its action strongly resembles some of the snake venoms and that it will retain its properties for an indefinite time. Livingstone also mentions a curious fact that the natives consider that the best antidote to the poison is to swallow the grub. A very powerful poison employed by other tribes of bushmen for their arrow and spearheads is said by Burchell to be prepared from Amaryllis distica, various species of euphorbium, and acocanthera, alone or mixed with snake venom, and a species of black spider or beetle poison. The bushmen, or bajermans of the South African district called Kalahari, use the juice of the leaf beetle 
or the diamphidia simplex. Lewin, who examined the insect, found in its body, besides inert fatty acids, a tox albumin which causes paralysis and finally death. Bame, after examination, states that the poison from the larva also belongs to the tox albumins. The poison grubs are of a pale flesh color, similar to the silkworm, and are about three-quarters of an inch in length. When a wound is made by an arrow poisoned with this exudation, the most intolerable agony is caused, which proves fatal. The Somali prepare a very deadly poison from various species of Acocanthera, which they call waba, wabayo, or ubayo, to which they sometimes add snake venom. The Ovamposts of southwest Africa employ a species of adenium as an arrow poison, while the seeds of the strophanthus, strophanthus hispidus or combe, are largely used by the tribes who inhabit the districts near the Congo and the Zambezi. The arrow poison of the pygmies of Central Africa, in which the red ant forms an ingredient, is described by Stanley and is so very deadly that a single arrow has been known to kill an elephant. According to a recent writer on Malay poisons, John D. Gimlet, native poisoners frequently use narcotic plants to stupefy their victims as a preliminary to robbing them. They also employ sand, powdered glass, quicklime, and other powders to disconcert their pursuers. Some of them claim to be able to know a method of causing loss of voice lasting seven or eight days by the administration of certain poisons by the mouth. Gimlet asserts that two or three clinical cases have occurred in Kelantan in which it was alleged that the witnesses in court could not give evidence for this reason. Malay cunning is proverbial, but it is not generally known that the natives are accustomed to use poison in the same manner as employed in ancient times, namely by mixing it with honey, which is sometimes smeared on the undersurface of a knife. The poisoner then shares a meal with his enemy and divides a watermelon in half with the poisoned blade, but is careful to eat only the upper and harmless portion as his share of the fruit. This method is said to be common in Traganu, where potassium cyanide is employed for the purpose. The Malays are said to have a knowledge of slow poisons which they call time poisons, by means of which they can give a single dose of poison and time the death of the victim within three, six, or even twelve months, according to the dose and the particular combination used. Native experts, however, say that the idea of this time poison is unfounded, but they know that the effect of certain deadly poisons is greatly accelerated or delayed if certain fruits or vegetables, such as watermelon or cucumbers, happen to be eaten soon after the ingestion of the poison. Some of the Malays believe that the poisoned food can be recognized by the shadow of the right hand and fingers not being cast on eating rice. Others believe that a stirring rod of ivory will become darkened if poison has been put into the food, and in Perak, a spoon made of the beak of a hornbill is said to turn black if touched by anything of a poisonous nature. The Malays use many different vegetable poisons for their blowpipe darts, some of which are extremely powerful, but curiously enough, some are poisonous to certain animals and not to others, and many of the poisons which destroy human life may be eaten with impunity by graminiferous animals. Thus, opium does not poison pigeons, tobacco and hemlock do not injure goats, and henbane can be eaten by rabbits. The Malay jungle natives have special markings on their blowpipe darts by means of which they differentiate their various poisons. That of the upas tree is specially marked to distinguish it from the others. The sap of the upas tree, Antiaris toxicaria, the active principle of which is called antiarin, is used as a poison for their darts by the natives throughout the eastern archipelago, including Java and Borneo. It is extremely powerful and will sometimes cause death in 30 minutes after a wound is received. It is often mixed with the venom of snakes, scorpions or centipedes, and occasionally with arsenic. The upas tree sap is collected in primitive vessels fashioned from palm leaves, which are then suspended a few feet above the fire. The boiling process is somewhat protracted, and during the whole time the sap is continually stirred. During this operation, the liquid is transformed into a thick, viscid mass, and in this condition it is withdrawn from the fire. When cold, the sap is a solid, hard, yet brittle substance. 
so before it is set, the leaf is rolled up with its soft contents, the two ends tied with rattan, and the poison thus kept till it is required. The darts, which are projected by the natives with blowpipes, consist of strips of palm wood from 20 to 30 centimeters in length. They are pointed at one end, and a quantity of poison is then removed from its palm leaf receptacle and ground up until it is the consistency of flour. It is then mixed with water and stirred up until it becomes a thin paste, which is smeared upon the points of the darts. The process of preparation takes place before a fire, and when completed, they are placed with their points towards the fire until the upas sap has dried into the wood. In the case of the darts that are required for larger game, the point of the weapon is split open, and a thin metal wedge or plate is inserted, and the whole point is then smeared over with the poison. The opposite end of the dart comprises a small conical butt made of the soft pith of the sago palm. The darts are carried in small bamboo quivers, which are fixed into the loincloth of the native, the points being protected by a piece of animal skin. North American Indians employ a poison called caramari, which they prepare from the roots of a plant found along the seacoast. It is prepared by being burnt in earthen pipkins, and to the residue is added a species of spider, hairy worms, bat's wings, the head and tail of a fish called taborino, toads, and mancanillas. These substances are set over a fire and heated in pots till they come to the consistency of a paste. The Choco Indians of Colombia, South America, use a poison which they extract from a tree frog, which they hold on a stick near a fire when the heat causes the glands of the skin to secrete the poisonous fluid. The Yivaro Indians of the Amazon use a vegetable poison called yambi for their arrows, which is said to be made from a species of vine which grows in great profusion throughout the upper Amazon zone. The process for extracting the poison, as described by Up de Graaf in Headhunters of the Amazon, is simple. Quote, the vine is cut into sections a foot in length, and the thin, hard outer crust of bark is carefully removed by scraping. The main bark, white when first exposed to the air, turns brown in just the same way as an apple. This inner bark is scraped into fine shavings by means of shells and flints, and these are placed in a colander which rests upon a pot in which water is boiling. The water is poured over the contents of the colander repeatedly until the constant action on it has drawn out the alkaloid, when the lifeless shavings are thrown away, and the residue is boiled down until it resembles, both in consistency, color, and smell, plain chocolate. While still warm, it is poured into a bamboo receptacle, and when cool, it becomes semi-solidified." The head of the arrow is dipped into the yambi and dried in the sun or before the fire. These arrows have a swift and painless effect on animals and birds of the forest, and after a wound from the poisoned dart projected from a blowgun, so long as the skin is broken at any point, they are killed within about two minutes. Experiments carried out on domestic animals have proved that the poison acts painlessly, the effect being much the same as an overdose of morphine, but despite its proved deadliness, yambi is never used by the headhunters in warfare. One of the most curious preparations in use among the North American Indians is the so-called black poison, the effects of which are well known around the lakes of the Winnipeg Basin and in the Swan River District. Some time after administration, it changes the color of the skin from brownish yellow or copper color to a sooty black, and at the same time causes hair to grow on unusual parts, such as the cheekbones. Its first effects are sickness, headache, and pain in the back and limbs. Afterwards, ulceration and sores break out in various parts of the body, chiefly over the joints and more particularly the knuckles. When prepared, the poison is said to be a brown, snuff-like powder with a slight and rather sickening smell. A small quantity administered in food appears to be sufficient to produce these effects. It is said to be partly composed of frus toxicodendron mixed with a dried, acrid matter secreted by the glands in the skin of a species of toad. The Indian tribes indigenous to California have a curious method of using certain plants to stupefy or poison fish. One of the most effective is soap root, Chlorogallum pomeridianum. Besides providing a substitute for soap, the crushed pulp is dropped into the water, 
generally into a small pool or stream, and then stirred. The fish are stupefied by the poison, float to the surface, and are captured either by hand or in a basket. Another plant employed for this purpose is known as blue curls, or vinegar weed, Trichostemma lancerlatum. Other tribes of Indians in South America use curare, which they extract from a certain species of strychnos and other plants, which were first brought to England by Sir Walter Raleigh in 1595. Although a deadly poison when introduced into a wound or injected under the skin, curare is particularly harmless when swallowed. Indeed, Humboldt states the Indians lick it off their fingers and use it as a stomachic tonic. The Ainos of Japan are said to have used a preparation made from aconite and tobacco, while the natives of New Hebrides are stated to smear their arrows with damp earth containing the tetanus bacillus, which infects the person wounded by them. End of chapter 1 excerpt from Poison Mysteries in History, Romance, and Crime by C. J. S. Thompson. Sufism from A Dictionary of Islam by Thomas Patrick Hughes, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Org. Sufism, Part 1. Headword, Sufi, more correctly, Sufi, the Persian form of the plural being Sufyan, a man of the people called Sufiya who professed the mystic principles of Tasawwuf. There is considerable discussion as to the origin of this word. It is said to be derived, one, from the Arabic Suf, wool, on account of the woolen dress worn by Eastern ascetics, two, or from the Arabic safu, purity, with reference to the efforts to attain to metaphysical purity, which is scarcely probable, three, or from the Greek sophia, wisdom, four, or according to the Rayatholorat, it is derived from the Sufa, the name of a tribe of Arabs, who in the time of ignorance separated themselves from the world, and engaged themselves exclusively in the service of the Mecca temple. It might at first appear almost an impossibility for mysticism to engraft itself upon the legal system of the Quran and the Ahadith with the detailed ritual and cold formality which are so strikingly exemplified in Islam. But it would appear that from the very days of Muhammad there have been always those who, whilst they call themselves Muslims, set aside the literal meaning of the words of Muhammad for a supposed mystic or spiritual interpretation. And it is generally admitted by Sufis that one of the great founders of their system, as found in Islam, was the adopted son and son-in-law of the Prophet, Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Sufis themselves admit that their religious system has always existed in the world prior to the mission of Muhammad, and the unprejudiced student of their system will observe that Tasawwuf or Sufism is but a Muslim adaptation of the Vedanta school of Hindu philosophers, and which also we find in the writings of the old academics of Greece and Sir William Jones thought Plato learned from the sages of the East. The Sufis are divided into innumerable sects, which find expression in the numerous religious orders of Darwishes or Fakirs, cross-reference Fakir. But although they differ in name and in some of their customs, as dress, meditations, and recitations, they are all agreed in their principal tenets particularly those which inculcate the absolute necessity of blind submission to a murshid, or inspired guide. It is generally admitted that, quite irrespective of minor sects, the Sufis are divided into those who claim to be only the Ilhamiya, or inspired of God, and those who assert that they are Ittahadiyya, or unionist, with God. Section 1. The Doctrine of the Sufis The following is a succinct account of the doctrines of the Sufis. 
Number one, God only exists. He is in all things, and all things are in Him. Number two, all visible and invisible beings are an emanation from Him and are not really distinct from Him. Number three, religions are matters of indifference. They, however, serve as leading to realities. Some for this purpose are more advantageous than others, among which is al-Islam, of which Sufism is the true philosophy. Number four, there does not really exist any difference between good and evil, for all is reduced to unity, and God is the real author of the acts of mankind. Number five, it is God who fixes the will of man. Man, therefore, is not free in his actions. Number six, the soul existed before the body and is confined within the latter as in a cage. Death, therefore, should be the object of the wishes of the Sufi, for it is then that he returns to the bosom of divinity. Number seven, it is by this metempsychosis that souls which have not fulfilled their destination here below are purified and become worthy of reunion with God. Number eight, without the grace of God, which the Sufis called Faydanu Allah or Fadlu Allah, no one can attain to this spiritual union, but this, they assert, can be obtained by fervently asking for it. Number nine, the principal occupation of the Sufi whilst in the body is meditation on the wahdaniya or unity of God, the remembrance of God's names, cross-reference, dhikr, and the progressive advancement in the tariqa or journey of life so as to attain unification with God. Section two, the Sufi journey. Human life is likened to a journey, Safar, and the seeker after God to a traveler, Salik. The great business of the traveler is to exert himself and strive to attain that perfect knowledge, Ma'rifa, of God, which is diffused through all things. For the soul of man is an exile from its creator, and human existence is its period of banishment. The sole object of Sufism is to lead the wandering soul onward, stage by stage, until it reaches the desired goal, perfect union with the divine being. The natural state of every human being is humanity, nasut, in which state the disciple must observe the law, sharia. But as this is the lowest form of spiritual existence, the performance of the journey is enjoined upon every searcher after true knowledge. The various stages, manazil, are differently described by Sufi writers, but amongst those of India, and, according to Malcolm of Persia also, the following is the usual journey. The first stage, as we have already remarked, is humanity, nasut, in which the disciple must live according to the law, sharia, and must observe all the rites, customs, and precepts of his religion. The second is the nature of angels, malakut, for which there is the pathway of purity, tariqa. The third is the possession of power, jabrut, for which there is knowledge, ma'rifa. And the fourth is extinction, fene, id est, absorption into the deity, for which there is truth, hakika. The following more extended journey is marked out for the traveler by a Sufi writer, Aziz ibn Muhammad Nafasi, in a book called Al-Maqsud al-Aqsa, or The Remotest Aim, which has been rendered into English by the lamented Professor Palmer, Oriental Mysticism, Cambridge, 1867. When a man possessing the necessary requirements of fully developed reasoning powers turns to them for resolution of his doubts and uncertainties concerning the real nature of the Godhead, he is called a talib, a searcher after God. If he manifest a further inclination to prosecute his inquiry according to their system, he is called a murid, or one who inclines. 
placing himself then under the spiritual instruction of some eminent leader of the sect, he is fairly started upon his journey and becomes a Salic or traveller whose whole business in life is devotion to the end that he may ultimately arrive at the knowledge of God. Number one, here he is exhorted to serve God as the first step towards a knowledge of him. This is the first stage of his journey and is called obodiya or service. Number two, when in answer to his prayers the divine influence or attraction has developed his inclination into the love of God, he is said to have reached the stage called ishq or love. Number three, this divine love, expelling all worldly desires from his heart, leads him to the next stage, which is zuhud or seclusion. Number four, Occupying himself henceforward with contemplations and investigations of metaphysical theories concerning the nature, attributes, and works of God, he reaches ma'rifa, or knowledge. Number five, this assiduous contemplation of startling metaphysical theories is exceedingly attractive to an oriental mind and not unfrequently produces a state of mental excitement. Such ecstatic state is considered a sure prognostication of direct illumination of the heart by God and constitutes the next stage called wedged or ecstasy. Number six. During this stage, he is supposed to receive a revelation of the true nature of the Godhead and to have reached the stage called Hakika or truth. Number seven, he then proceeds to the stage of wasl or union with God. Number eight, further than this he cannot go, but pursues his habit of self-denial and contemplation until his death, which is looked upon as fina, total absorption into the deity, extinction. To develop this quasi-spiritual life, the Sufi leaders have invented various forms of devotion called zikr, or recitations. These eccentric exercises have generally attracted the notice of travelers in the East, and have been described by Lane, Vanbury, Burton, and other Orientalists. For an account of these ceremonies of zikr, the reader is referred to the article under that head, cross-reference zikr. Section 3. The Perfect Man in Sufi Spiritualism The late Professor E. H. Palmer of Cambridge has in his Oriental Mysticism, compiled from native sources, given a very correct idea of what may be considered the spiritual side of Mohammedanism as expressed in the teaching of Muslim Sufis. The perfect man is he who has fully comprehended the law, the doctrine, and the truth, or, in other words, he who is endued with four things in perfection, vide licet, number one, good words, number two, good deeds, number three, good principles, number four, the sciences. It is the business of the traveller to provide himself with these things in perfection, and by so doing he will provide himself with perfection. The perfect man has had various other names assigned to him, all equally applicable, vide licet, elder, leader, guide, inspired teacher, wise, virtuous, perfect, perfecter, beacon and mirror of the world, powerful antidote, mighty elixir, Isa, Jesus, the raiser of the dead, Khidr, the discoverer of the water of life, and Solomon, who knew the language of birds. The universe has been likened to a single person, of whom the perfect man is the soul, and again to a tree, of which mankind is the fruit, and the perfect man the pith and essence.
Nothing is hidden from the perfect man, for after arriving at the knowledge of God, he has attained to that of the nature and properties of material objects, and can henceforth find no better employment than acting mercifully towards mankind. Now there is no mercy better than to devote oneself to the perfection and improvement of others, both by precept and example. Thus the Prophet is called in the Qur'an a mercy to the universe. Qur'an chapter 21 verse 107 But with all his perfection, the perfect man cannot compass his desires, but passes his life in consistent and unavoidable self-denial. He is perfect in knowledge and principle, but imperfect in faculty and power. There have indeed been perfect men possessed of power, such power as that which resides in kings and rulers, yet a careful consideration of the poor extent of man's capacities will show that his weakness is preferable to his power, his want of faculty preferable to his possession of it. Prophets and saints, kings and sultans, have desired many things, and failed to obtain them. They have wished to avoid many things, and have had them forced upon them. Mankind is made up of the perfect and the imperfect, of the wise and the foolish, of kings and subjects, but all are like weak and helpless, all pass their lives in a manner contrary to their desires. This the perfect man recognizes and acts upon. And knowing that nothing is better for man than renunciation, forsakes all and becomes free and at leisure. As before he now renounced wealth and dignity, so now he foregoes eldership and teachership, esteeming freedom and rest above everything. The fact is that though the motive alleged for education and care of others is a feeling of compassion and a regard for discipline, yet the real instigation is the love of dignity. As the prophet says, the last thing that is removed from the chiefs of the righteous is love of dignity. I have said that the perfect man should be endued with four things in perfection. Now the perfectly free man should have four additional characteristics. Videlicet, renunciation, retirement, contentment, and leisure. He who has the first four is virtuous, but not free. He who has the whole eight is perfect, liberal, virtuous, and free. Furthermore, there are two grades of the perfectly free those who have renounced wealth and dignity only, and those who have further renounced eldership and teachership, thus becoming free and at leisure. These again are subdivided into two classes, those who, after renunciation, retirement, and contentment, make choice of obscurity, and those who, after renunciation, make choice of submission, contemplation, and resignation but the object of both is the same. Some writers assert that freedom and leisure consists in the former course, while others maintain that it is only to be found in the latter. Those who make choice of obscurity are actuated by the knowledge that annoyance and distraction of thought are the invariable concomitants of society. They therefore avoid receiving visits and presents, and fear them as they would venomous beasts. The other class, who adopt submission, resignation, and contemplation, do so because they perceive that mankind, for the most part, are ignorant of what is good for them, being dissatisfied with what is beneficial and delighted with circumstances that are harmful to them. As the Qur'an says, Perchance ye may dislike what is good for you, and like what is hurtful to you. Qur'an chapter 2 verse 213 For this reason they retire from society equally with the other class, caring little what the world may think of them. 
Fellowship has many qualities and effects, both of good and evil. The fellowship of the wise is the only thing that can conduct the traveler safely to the goal. Therefore, all the submission, earnestness, and discipline that have been hitherto inculcated are merely in order to render him worthy of such fellowship. Provided he have the capacity, a single day, nay, a single hour, in the society of the wise tends more to his improvement than years of self-discipline without it. Verily one day with thy Lord is better than a thousand years. Quran chapter 22 verse 46 It is, however, possible to frequent the society of the wise without receiving any benefit therefrom, but this must proceed either from want of capacity or want of will. In order, then, to avoid such a result, the Sufis have laid down the following rules for the conduct of the disciple when in the presence of his teachers. Hear, attend, but speak little. Never answer a question not addressed to you, but if asked, answer promptly and concisely, never feeling ashamed to say, I know not. Do not dispute for disputation's sake. Never boast before your elders. Never seek the highest place, nor even accept it if it be offered to you. Do not be over-ceremonious, for this will compel your elders to act in the same manner towards you, and give them needless annoyance. Observe in all cases the etiquette appropriate to the time, place, and persons present. In indifferent matters, that is, matters involving no breach of duty by their omission or commission, conform to the practice and wishes of those with whom you are associating. Do not make a practice of anything which is not either a duty or calculated to increase the comfort of your associates, otherwise it will become an idol to you, and it is incumbent on every one to break his idols and renounce his habits. Section 4. Renunciation This leads us to the subject of renunciation, which is of two kinds, external and internal. The former is the renunciation of worldly wealth, the latter the renunciation of worldly desires. Everything that hinders or veils the traveler's path must be renounced, whether it relate to this world or the next. Wealth and dignity are great hindrances, but too much praying and fasting are often hindrances too. The one is a shroud of darkness, the other a veil of light. The traveller must renounce idolatry if he desire to reach the goal, and everything that bars his progress is an idol. All men have some idol which they worship. With one it is wealth and dignity, with another overmuch prayer and fasting. If a man sit always upon his prayer carpet, his prayer carpet becomes his idol, and so on with a great number of instances. Renunciation must not be performed without the advice and permission of an elder. It should be the renunciation of trifles, not of necessaries, such as food, clothing, and dwelling place, which are indispensable to man. For without them, he would be obliged to rely on the aid of others, and this would beget avarice, which is the mother of vice. The renunciation of necessaries produces as corrupting an influence upon the mind as the possession of too much wealth. The greatest of blessings is to have a sufficiency, but to overstep this limit is to gain naught but additional trouble. Renunciation is the practice of those who know God and the characteristic mark of the wise. Every individual fancies that he alone possesses this knowledge, but knowledge is an attribute of the mind, and there is no approach from unaided sense to the attributes of the mind, by which we can discover who is or who is not possessed of this knowledge. Qualities, however, are the source of action. Therefore, a man's practice is an infallible indication of the qualities he possesses, 
If, for instance, a man asserts that he is a baker, a carpenter, or a blacksmith, we can judge at once if he possesses skill in these crafts by the perfection of his handiwork. In a word, theory is internal and practice external. The presence of the practice, therefore, is a proof that the theory, too, is there. Renunciation is necessary to the real confession of faith. For the formula, there is no God but God, involves two things, negation and proof. Negation is the renunciation of other gods, and proof is the knowledge of God. Wealth and dignity have led many from the right path. They are the gods the people worship. If, then, you see that one has renounced these, you may be sure that he has expelled the love of this world from his heart and completed the negation. And whosoever has attained to the knowledge of God has completed the proofs. This is really confessing that there is no God but God, and he who has not attained to the knowledge of God has never really repeated the confession of faith. Early prejudices are a great stumbling block to many people, for the first principles of monotheism are contained in the words of the Hadith. Everyone is born with a disposition for the true faith, but his parents make him a Jew, a Christian, or a Magian. The Unitarians also say that the real confession of faith consists in negation and proof, but they explain negation by renunciation of self and proof by acknowledgment of God. Thus, according to the Sufis, confession of faith, prayer, and fasting contain two distinct features, namely form and truth, the former being entirely inefficacious without the latter. Renunciation and the knowledge of God are like a tree. The knowledge of God is the root, renunciation the branches, and all good principles and qualities are the fruit. To sum up, the lesson to be learnt is that in repeating the formula, the traveller must acknowledge in his heart that God only always was, God only always will be. This world and the next, nay, the very existence of the traveller, may vanish, but God alone remains. This is the true confession of faith. And although the traveller before was blind, the moment he is assured of this, his eyes are opened, and he seeth. Section 5. Helps to Devotion The Sufis hold that there are three aids necessary to conduct the traveller on his path. Number 1. Attraction, Injitheb. Number 2. Devotion, Ibadah. Number 3. Elevation, Uruj. Attraction is the act of God who draws man towards himself. Man sets his face towards this world and is entangled in the love of wealth and dignity until the grace of God steps in and turns his heart towards God. The tendency proceeding from God is called attraction. That which proceeds from man is called inclination, desire, and love. As the inclination increases, its name changes, and it causes the traveller to renounce everything else and become a qibla, to set his face towards God. When it has become his qibla and made him forget everything but God, it is developed into love. Cross-reference qibla. Most men, when they have attained this stage, are content to pass their lives therein and leave the world without making further progress. Such a person the Sufis call attracted, majdhub. Others, however, proceed from this to self-examination and pass the rest of their lives in devotion. They are then called devoutly attracted, majdhub salik. If devotion be first practice and the attraction of God then step in, such a person is called an attracted devotee, salik mejdub. If he practice and complete devotion, but is not influenced by the attraction of God, he is called a devotee, salik. 
Sheikh Shihab al-Din, in his work entitled Awarif al-Ma'arif, says that an elder or teacher should be selected from the second class alone. For although many may be estimable and righteous, it is but few who are fit for such offices or for the education of disciples. Devotion is the prosecution of the journey, and that in two ways, to God and in God. The first, the Sufis say, has a limit. The second is boundless. The journey to God is completed when the traveller has attained to the knowledge of God, and then commences the journey in God, which has for its object the knowledge of the nature and attributes of God, a task which they confess is not to be accomplished in so short a space as the lifetime of man. The knowledge wisest men have shared of thy great power and thee is less when with thyself compared than one drop in a sea. The Unitarians maintain that the journey to God is completed when the traveller has acknowledged that there is no existence save that of God. The journey in God they explain to be a subsequent inquiry into the mysteries of nature. The term elevation or ascent or ruj is almost synonymous with progress. Section 6. The Intellectual and Spiritual Development of Man Every animal possesses a vegetative spirit, a living spirit, and an instinctive spirit. But man has an additional inheritance, namely the spirit of humanity. Now this was breathed by God into man directly from himself, and is therefore of the same character as the primal element. And when I have fashioned him, and breathed my spirit into him. Quran chapter 15 verse 29. The Sufis do not interpret this of the life, but of the spirit of humanity, and say that it is frequently not attained until a late period of life, thirty or even eighty years. Before man can receive this spirit of humanity, he must be furnished with capacity, which is only to be acquired by purifying oneself from all evil and immoral qualities and dispositions, and adorning oneself with the opposite ones. Sheikh Muhyiddin ibn al-Arabi, in his investigations for Sus, says that the words, And when I have fashioned him, refer to this preparation, and the rest of the sentence, and breathed my spirit into him, refers to the accession of the spirit of humanity. Two conditions are therefore imposed upon the traveller. First, to attain humanity. Second, to acquire capacity. There are three developments of character that must be suppressed before man can attain to humanity, the animal, the brutal, and the fiendish. He who only eats and sleeps, and gives way to lust, is mere animal. If besides these he gives way to anger and cruelty, he is brutal, and if in addition to all these he is crafty, lying, and deceitful, he is fiendish. If the traveller is moderate in his food, rest, and desires, and strives to attain a knowledge of himself and of God, then is the time for acquiring capacity by freeing himself from all that is evil and base, and adorning himself with the opposite qualities. After that, by prayer, he may obtain the spirit of humanity. Someone has truly said that there is none of the perfection, essence, or immortality of man save only among such as are created with a godly disposition. When the traveller has once been revivified by the spirit of humanity, he becomes immortal and inherits everlasting life. This is why it has been said that man has a beginning but no end. If when he has attained the spirit of humanity he is earnest and does not waste his life in trifling, he soon arrives at the divine light itself. For God guideth whom he pleaseth unto his light. The attainment of this light is the completion of man's upward progress. But no one can attain to it but those who are pure in spirit and in their lives.
Muhammad asserted that he himself had attained it. To the light have I reached, and in the light I live. Now this light is the nature of God. Wherefore he said, Who seeth me, seeth God. Cross-reference, Nuri Muhammad. The germ that contains the primal element of man is the lowest of the low, and the divine light is the highest of the high. It is between these extremes that the stage of man's upward or downward progress lie. We have created man in the fairest of proportions, and then have thrown him back to be the lowest of the low, save only such as believe and act with righteousness, and verily these shall have their reward. Quran, chapter 95, verse 4. This reward is said by the Sufis to be defined by the word ajrat, reward itself. This word contains three radical letters, alif, jim, and ra. Alif stands for i'ada, return, jim for jannah, paradise, and ra for ru'iya, that is, those who have handed down the faith. Their acting righteously is their return to the nature of God, for when they have finished their upward progress and reached this, they are in paradise and in the presence of their God. He, therefore, is a man, in the true sense of the word, who, being sent down upon earth, strives upward towards heaven. These aspirations are indispensable to man. He might, by the almighty power of God, exist without all beside, even had the heavens and the elements themselves never been. But these things are the aim and want of all. It has been said that the primal element or constructive spirit, as well as the spirit of humanity, proceed direct from God, they are therefore identical and are both included by the Sufis in the one term concomitant spirit. Now the spirit, although distinct and individual, comprehends and governs the entire universe. The simple natures are its administrators and exponents. Of these, the seven sires beget and the four mothers conceive from the incarnation of the spirit in them, and their offspring is the triple kingdom, mineral, vegetable, and animal, and so it is with the lesser world of man. Now the spirit hath two functions, external and internal. The external is revealed in the material generation just alluded to. The internal abides in the heart of man. Whosoever purifies his heart from worldly impressions and desires reveals this internal function of the spirit within him and illumines and revivifies his soul. Thus the spirit at once comprehends the universe and dwells in the heart of man. Section 7 of the Upward Progress or Ascent of Man When man has become assured of the truth of revelation, he has reached the stage of belief and has the name of Mu'min, believer. When he further acts in obedience to the will of God and apportions the night and day for earnest prayer, he has reached the stage of worship and is called an Abid or worshipper. When he has expelled the love of this world from his heart and occupies himself with a contemplation of the mighty whole, he reaches the next stage and becomes a zahid, or recluse. When, in addition to all this, he knows God and subsequently learns the mysteries of nature, he reaches the stage of acquaintance and is called arif, one who knows. The next stage is that in which he attains to the love of God and is called a wali or saint. When he is moreover gifted with inspiration and the power of working miracles, he becomes a nebi, prophet, and when entrusted next with the delivery of God's own message, he is called an apostle, rasul. When he is appointed to abrogate a previous dispensation and preach a new one, he is called Ulul Azam, one who has a mission. 
When his mission is final, he has arrived at the stage called Khatam, or the seal. This is the upward progress of man. The first stage is the believer, the last, the seal. After separation from the body, the soul of man returns to that heaven which corresponds to the stage which he has attained. Thus the believer at last dwells in the first or lowest heaven and the seal in the heaven of heavens. For it will be noticed that the stages of upward progress correspond to the number of degrees in the heavenly spheres, namely seven inferior and two superior. The metaphysicians say that these stages and degrees do not in reality exist, but that the heavenly intelligence which corresponds to the degree of intelligence attained by man attracts and absorbs his soul into itself after separation from the body. Thus every one who has attained intelligence corresponding to that of the highest sphere, his soul returns thereto, and he who has attained intelligence corresponding to the lowest sphere, his soul in like manner returns to that. Those who have not attained intelligence corresponding to any of these will be placed in hell, which is situate below the lowest sphere. As each of the heavenly spheres is furnished with knowledge and purity in proportion to its position, the rank of the man's soul in the future state will, according to this last account, be in proportion to his degree of knowledge and purity of life while upon the earth. The Unitarians say that man's upward progress has no end, for if he strive for a thousand years, each day will teach him something that he knew not before, inasmuch as the knowledge of God has no limit. So Muhammad says, he who progresses daily is yet of feeble mind. The religious account says that the soul of every man returns to an individual place after separation from the body. This the metaphysicians deny. For how, say they, can the soul of man return to a certain place when it has not originally come from a certain place? The soul of man is the primal spirit, and if a thousand persons live, it is the same spirit that animates them all. And in like manner, if a thousand die, the same spirit returns to itself and is not lessened or diminished. If a myriad persons build houses and make windows therein, the same sun illumines them all, and though every one of them should be destroyed, the sun would not be lessened or diminished. The Son is the Lord of the sensible world, and the exponent of the attributes of the primal spirit. The primal spirit is the Lord of the invisible world, and the exponent of the nature of God. When the heart of man has been revivified and illumined by the primal spirit, he has arrived at intelligence, for intelligence is a light in the heart, distinguishing between truth and vanity. Until he has been so revivified and illumined, it is impossible for him to attain to intelligence at all. But having attained to intelligence, then and not till then is the time for the attainment of knowledge, for becoming wise. Intelligence is a primal element, and knowledge the attribute thereof. When from knowledge he has successively proceeded to the attainment of the divine light and acquaintance with the mysteries of nature, his last step will be perfection, with which his upward progress concludes. But dive he ever so deeply into the treasury of mysteries and knowledge, unless he examine himself and confess that after all he knows not, all that he has acquired will slip through his hands and leave him far poorer than before. His treasure of today should as much exceed the treasure of yesterday as an ocean exceeds a drop, but this can never be unless he, leaving all else for contemplation and self-examination, have freedom and leisure to learn how poor he really is and how much he needs the saving help of God. 
One class of Unitarians explain the upward progress of man thus. They say that every atom of existent beings is filled with light. Arise and look around, for every atom that has birth shines forth a lustrous beacon to illumine all the earth. But that man walks abroad in darkness, blinded by the lusts of life, and laments the want of light that would, were he but aware of it, involve him in the glorious sheen of brightest day. Twere well to catch the odours that about our senses play, for all the world is full of blasts to bear the sweets away. What they mean is this, that all existent beings are compounded of two things, darkness and light, which are indistinguishably blended together. The light belongs to the invisible and the darkness to the sensible world, but the two are intimately connected and the former exercises a paramount influence upon the latter. The object of man, according to them, is to separate the light from the darkness, that its nature and attributes may be understood, and in this consists his upward progress. Although the light and darkness can never be entirely separated, for the one is as it were the veil of the other, the light can be made to prevail, so that its attributes may become manifest. Now it is possible to separate thus far the light from the darkness in certain cases. In the bodies of men and animals, for instance, there are certain organs always at work, whose sole object is this separation. Thus, when food is introduced into the stomach, the liver receives the cream and essence of it and transmits it to the heart. The heart, in like manner, extracts the essence of this, which is the life, and transmits it to the brain. Lastly, the brain extracts the essence of this and transforms it into the elixir of life, the real light of all. The elixir evolved by the brain is the instinctive spirit, and is, as it were, a lamp in a lantern. But it gives forth, after all, but a flickering and cloudy light, and man's object should therefore be to strengthen and purify it by renunciation and contemplation, until it give forth the true light which is the spirit of humanity. When man has attained to this, he necessarily becomes free from all that is evil, and is adorned instead with every good and noble quality. The body of man is like a lantern, the vegetative spirit is the lamp, the animal spirit is the wick, the instinctive spirit the oil, and the spirit of humanity the fire that kindles all. Verily its oil would almost shine, even though no fire kindled it. Quran, chapter 24, verse 35. In other words, the instinctive spirit should feed and supply the spirit of humanity, as the oil feeds and supplies the flame in a lamp. The traveller must aim at completing this lamp, so that his heart may be illumined, and he may see things as they really are. When the spirit of humanity, a light upon light, Quran chapter 24 verse 35, has thus kindled the instinctive spirit, God guideth whom he pleaseth to his own light, Edom, that is, to the divine light of his own nature, reaching which the traveller's upward progress is complete, for from him they spring, and unto him return. End of Sufism, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sufism from A Dictionary of Islam by Thomas Patrick Hughes, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sufism, Part 2 Section 8. Sufism Adapted to Mohammedanism 
A clear and intelligible exposition of the principles of Sufism or Oriental Spiritualism is given by Muhammad al-Misri, a Sufi of the Ilhamiyya school of thought, in the following categorical form translated by Mr. J. P. Brown in the Journal of the American Oriental Society. It represents more particularly the way in which this form of mysticism is adapted to the stern and dogmatic teachings of Islam. Question. What is the beginning of a tasawwuf? Answer. Iman, or faith, of which there are six pillars, namely, number one, belief in God, number two, in his angels, number three, in his books, number four, in his prophets, number five, in the last day, and number six, in his decree of good and evil. Question. What is the result of Atasawwaf? Answer. It is not only the reciting with the tongue these pillars of faith, but also establishing them in the heart. This was the reply made by the Murshid Junaidu al-Baghdadi in answer to the same question. Question. What is the distinction between a Sufi and an ordinary person? Answer. The knowledge of an ordinary person is but imanu taqlidi, or a counterfeit faith, whereas that of the Sufi is imanu al-tahqiqi, or true faith. Question. What do you mean by counterfeit faith? Answer. It is that which an ordinary person has derived from his forefathers or from the teachers and preachers of his own day without knowing why it is essential that a man should believe in these six articles for his soul's salvation. For example, a person may be walking in the public streets and find a precious jewel which, perhaps, kings had sought for in vain, and rulers who had conquered the whole world had sought for and yet had not found. But in this precious jewel he has found that which is more effulgent than the sun when it is so bright that it obscures the lesser light of the moon or even he has found an alchemy which can convert copper into gold, and yet perhaps the finder knows not the value of the precious jewel, but thinks it a counterfeit jewel, and one which he would give away even for a drink of water if he were thirsty. Question. What is the establishment of faith? Answer. The establishment of faith consists in a search being made for the true origin of each of these six pillars of faith until the inquirer arrives at al-haqiqa, the truth. Many persons pursue the journey for ten or twenty or thirty or even forty years and, wandering away from the true path, enter upon the path of error, and hence there are known to be seventy-three ways, only one of which is the way of salvation. Cross-reference, sects. At last, by a perfect subjection to the teaching of the murshid, or guide, they find out the value of the lost jewel which they have found, and their faith becomes manifest. And you might say that, with the light of a lamp, they have reached the sun. They then find out that the tariqa, or journey of the Sufi, is consistent with the sharia, or law of Islam. Question. In matters of faith and worship, to what sect are the Sufis attached? Answer. To this reply the author says, speaking of course of his own people, that they are chiefly of the Sunni sect, but he does not notice that mystic doctrines are more prevalent amongst the Shias. Question. When Bayezid al-Bastami was asked of what sect he was, he replied, I am of the sect of Allah. What did he mean? Answer. The sects of Allah are the four orthodox sects of Islam. Here our author departs from true Sufi teaching. Question. Most of the Sufis in their poems use certain words which we hear and understand as showing that they were of the Metempsychoseans. 
They say, I am sometimes lot, sometimes a vegetable, sometimes an animal, at other times a man. What does this mean? Answer, brother, the prophet has said, my people in the future life will rise up in companies, that is, some as monkeys, others as hogs, or in other forms, as is written in a verse of the Quran, Surah 78, 18, Ye shall come in troops, which has been commented on by al-Baydawi, who cites a tradition to the effect that, at the resurrection, men will rise up in the form of those animals whose chief characteristics resemble their own ruling passions in life. The greedy, avaricious man as a hog, the angry, passionate man as a camel, the tail-bearer or mischief-maker as a monkey. For though these men, while in this life, bore the human form externally, they were internally nothing different from the animals whose characters are in common with their own. The resemblance is not manifest during the life, but becomes so in the other existence after the resurrection. Let us avoid such traits. Repentance before death will free us from these evils. The prophet said that with regard to this, sleep is the brother of death. The dying man sees himself in his true character and so knows whether or not he is, by repentance, freed from his ruling passion of life. In like manner he will see himself during his slumbers, still following in the path of his passions. For instance, the money calculator in sleep sees himself engaged in his all-absorbing occupation, and this fact is a warning from God not to allow himself to be absorbed in any animal passion or degrading occupation. It is only by prayerful repentance that anyone can hope to see himself in his sleep delivered from his ruling carnal passion and restored to his proper human intellectual form. If in your slumbers you see a monkey, consider it as a warning to abandon or abstain from the passion of mischief. If a hog, cease to seize upon the goods of others, and so on. Go and give yourself up to an upright murshid, or spiritual guide, who will, through his prayers, show you in your slumbers the evil parts of your character, until one by one they have passed away and have been replaced by good ones, all through the power of the name of God, whom he will instruct you to invoke. Cross-reference, Zikr. At length you will only see in your slumbers the forms of holy and pious men, in testimony of that degree of piety to which you will have attained. This is what is meant by that expression of certain poets, referring to one's condition previous to the act of repentance, when the writer says, I am sometimes an animal, sometimes a vegetable, sometimes a man. And the same may be said by the Sufis in application to themselves as of any other part of creation, for man is called Akhiru al mawjudat or the climax of beings, for in him are comprised all the characteristics of creation. Many mystical books have been written on this subject all showing that man is the larger part and the world the smaller part of God's creation. The human frame is said to comprise all the other parts of creation, and the heart of man is supposed to be even more comprehensive than the rainbow, because when the eyes are closed, the mental capacity can take in the whole of a vast city, though not seen by the eyes, it is seen by the capacious nature of the mind. Among such books is the Hawdh al-Hayat, or the Well of Life, which says that if a man closes his eyes, ears, and nostrils, he cannot take cold that the right nostril is called the sun, and the left the moon, 
that from the former he breathes heat, and from the latter cold air. Question. Explain the distinctive opinions of the Sufis in Al-Tanasuch, or the transmigration of souls. Answer. O oh, brother, our teaching regarding Al-Barzakh, Quran 23102, has nothing whatever to do with Al-Tanasuch. Of all the erring sects in the world, those who believe in metempsychosis or transmigration of souls is the very worst. Question. The Sufis regard certain things as lawful which are forbidden. For instance, they enjoy the use of wine, wine shops, the wine cup, sweethearts. They speak of the curls of their mistresses and the moles on their faces, cheeks, etc., and compare the furrows on their brows to verses of the Quran. What does this mean? Answer. The Sufis often exchange the external features of all things for the internal, the corporeal for the spiritual, and thus give an imaginary signification to outward forms. They behold objects of a precious nature in their natural character, and for this reason the greater part of their words have a spiritual and figurative meaning. For instance, when, like Hafez, they mention wine, they mean a knowledge of God, which, figuratively considered, is the love of God. Wine, viewed figuratively, is also love. Love and affection are here the same thing. The wine shop, with them, means the Murshid al-Kamil, or spiritual director, for his heart is said to be the depository of the love of God. The wine cup is the Talqin, or the pronunciation of the name of God in a declaration of faith, as there is no God but Allah or it signifies the words which flow from the Murshid's mouth, respecting divine knowledge, and which, when heard by the Salik, or one who pursues the true path, intoxicates his soul and divests his heart of passions, giving him pure spiritual delights. The sweetheart means the excellent preceptor, because when any one sees his beloved, he admires her perfect proportions with a heart full of love. The Salik beholds the secret knowledge of God which fills the heart of his spiritual preceptor, or Murshid, and through it receives a similar inspiration and acquires a full perception of all that he possesses, just as the pupil learns from his master. As the lover delights in the presence of his sweetheart, so the Salik rejoices in the company of his beloved Murshid, or preceptor. The sweetheart is the object of a worldly affection, but the preceptor of a spiritual attachment. The curls or ringlets of the beloved are the grateful praises of the preceptor, tending to bind the affections of the disciple. The moles on her face signify that when the pupil at times beholds the total absence of all worldly wants on the part of the preceptor, he also abandons all the desires of both worlds. He perhaps even goes so far as to desire nothing else in life than his preceptor, the furrows on the brow of the beloved one, which they compare to verses of the Quran, mean the light of the heart of the Murshid. They are compared to verses of the Quran because the attributes of God, in accordance with the injunction of the Prophet, be ye endued with divine qualities, are possessed by the Murshid. Question. The Murshids and their disciples often say, We see God. Is it possible for anyone to see God? Answer. It is not possible. What they mean by this assertion is that they know God, that they see his power, for it is forbidden to mortal eyes to behold him, as is declared in the Quran, Surah 6, 103, no sight reaches him, he reaches the sight, the subtle, the knowing. The Prophet commanded us to adore God 
as thou wouldst, didst thou see him. For if thou dost not see him, he sees thee. This permission to adore him is a divine favor, and they say that they are God's servants by divine favor. Ali said, Should the veil fall from my eyes, how would God visit me in truth? This saying proves that no one really sees God, and that even the sainted Ali never saw him. Question. Can it possibly be erroneous to say that, by seeing the traces of anyone, he may be beheld? Answer. One may certainly be thus seen. When any person sees the brightness of the sun, he may safely say that he has seen the sun, though indeed he has not really seen it. There is another example, namely, should you hold a mirror in your hand, you see a figure in it, and you may therefore say that you see your own face, which is really an impossibility, for no one has ever seen his own face, and you have asserted what is not strictly correct. Question. Since everyone sees the traces of God, as everyone is able to do, how is it that the Sufis declare that they only see him? Answer. Those who make this statement do not know what they see, for they have never really seen him. A person who has eaten of a sweet and savory dish given to him, but of which he knows not the name, seeks for it again with a longing desire after it, and thus wanders about in search of what has given him so much delight, even though he be ignorant of what it really was. So are those who seek after God without knowing him or what he is. Question. Some Sufis declare, we are neither afraid of hell, nor do we desire heaven, a saying which must be blasphemous. How is this? Answer. They do not really mean that they do not fear hell, and that they do not wish for heaven. If they really meant this, it would be blasphemous. Their meaning is not as they express themselves. Probably they wish to say, O Lord, Thou who createdst us, and madest us what we are, Thou hast not made us, because we assist Thy workings. We are in duty bound to serve Thee all the more devotedly, wholly in obedience to Thy holy will. We have no bargaining with Thee, and we do not adore Thee, with the view of gaining thereby either heaven or hell. As it is written in the Quran, Surah 9, 1, 12, Verily God hath bought of the believers their persons and their wealth, for the paradise they are to have, which means that his bounty has no bounds, his mercy no end, and thus it is that he benefits his faithful servants. They would say, Thou hast no bargaining with anyone. Our devotion is from the sincerity of our hearts, and is for love of thee only. Were there no heaven nor any hell, it would still be our duty to adore thee. To thee belongs the perfect right to put us either in heaven or in hell, and may thy commands be executed agreeably to thy blessed will. If thou puttest us in heaven, it is through thine excellence, not on account of our devotion. If thou puttest us in hell, it is from out of thy great justice, and not from any arbitrary decision on thy part. So be it for ever and for ever. This is the true meaning of the Sufis, when they say they do not desire heaven or fear hell. Question. Thou saidst that there is no conflict between the Sharia law and the Hakika truth, and nothing in the latter inconsistent with the former, and yet these two are distinguished from one another by a something which the Ahl al Hakika, believers in the truth, conceal. Were there nothing conflicting, why should it be thus hidden? Answer. If it be concealed, it is not because there is a contrariety to the law, but only because the thing hidden is contrary to the human mind. 
Its definition is subtle and not understood by everyone, for which reason the prophet said, Speak to men according to their mental capacities, for if you speak all things to all men, some cannot understand you and so fall into error. The Sufis, therefore, hide some things conformably with this precept. Question. Should anyone not know the science which is known to the Sufis and still do what the law plainly commands and be satisfied therewith, would his faith in Islam be less than that of the Sufis? Answer. No. He would not be inferior to the Sufis. His faith and Islam would be equal even to that of the prophets, because Iman and Islam are a jewel which admits of no division or separation into parts, and can neither be increased nor diminished, just as the portion of the sun enjoyed by a king and by a faqir is the same, or as the limbs of the poor and the rich are equal in number just as the members of the body of the king and the subject are precisely alike, so is the faith of the Muslim the same in all and common to all, neither greater nor less in any case. Question. Some men are prophets, saints, pure ones, and others fasics, who know God but perform none of his commands. What difference is there among them? Answer. The difference lies in their ma'rifa, or knowledge of spiritual things, but in the matter of faith they are all equal, just as, in the case of the ruler and the subject, their limbs are all equal, while they differ in their dress, power, and office. Section 9. Sufi Poetry The very essence of Sufism is poetry, and the Eastern mystics are never tired of expatiating on the ishq, or love to God, which is the one distinguishing feature of Sufi mysticism. The Mesnavi, which teaches in the sweetest strains that all nature abounds with love divine, that causes even the lowest plant to seek the sublime object of its desire, the works of the celebrated Jami, so full of ecstatic rapture, the moral lessons of the eloquent Sa'di, and the lyric odes of Hafiz, may be termed the scriptures of the Sufi sect. And yet each of these authors contains passages which are unfit for publication in an English dress, and advocate morals at variance with what Christianity teaches us to be the true reflection of God's holy will. Whilst propriety demands the suppression of verses of the character alluded to, we give a few odes as specimens of the higher order of Sufi poetry. Jalal al-Din al-Rumi, the author of the Mesnavi, 670 after Hijra, thus writes, I am the Gospel, the Psalter, the Quran. I am Uzza and Lat, Arabic deities, Bel and the Dragon. Into three and seventy sects is the world divided, yet only one God, the faithful who believe in him am I. Thou knowest what are fire, water, air, and earth. Fire, water, air, and earth, all am I. Lies and truth, good, bad, hard, and soft. Knowledge, solitude, virtue, faith. The deepest ground of hell, the highest torment of the flames. The highest paradise, the earth, and what is therein the angels and the devils, spirit and man, am I? What is the goal of speech? O tell it, Shems Tabrizi. The goal of sense, this, the world soul, am I? And again, are we fools, we are God's captivity? Are we wise, we are his promenade? Are we sleeping, we are drunk with God? Are we waking, then we are his heralds? Are we weeping, then his clouds of wrath? Are we laughing, flashes of his love? Every night God frees the host of spirits, 
frees them every night from fleshly prison. Then the soul is neither slave nor master. Nothing knows the bondsman of his bondage. Nothing knows the lord of all his lordship. Gone from such a night is eating sorrow. Gone the thoughts that question good or evil. Then without distraction or division, in this one the spirit sinks and slumbers. The following is from the mystic poet Mahmud. All sects but multiply the I and thou. This I and thou belong to partial being. When I and thou and several being vanish, then mosque and church shall find thee nevermore. Our individual life is but a phantom. Make clear thine eye and see reality. The following verses are by Farida Din Shakurgunj, 662 after Hijra. Man, what thou art, is hidden from thyself. Knowst not that morning, midday, and the eve are all within thee? The ninth heaven art thou, and from the spheres into the roar of time didst fall erewhile. Thou art the brush that painted the hues of all the world, the light of life that ranged its glory in the nothingness. Joy, joy, I triumph now. No more I know myself as simply me. I burn with love. The center is within me, and its wonder lies as a circle everywhere about me. Joy, joy, no mortal thought can fathom me. I am the merchant and the pearl at once. Lo, time and space lie crouching at my feet. Joy, joy, when I would revel in a rapture, I plunge into myself, and all things know. Mr. Lane, in his Modern Egyptians, gives a translation of a Sufi poem recited by an Egyptian darwish. With my love my heart is troubled, and mine eyelid hindereth sleep. My vitals are dissevered, while with streaming tears I weep. My union seems far distant, will my love e'er meet mine eye? Alas, did not estrangement draw my tears, I would not sigh. By dreary nights I'm wasted, absence makes my hope expire, my tears like pearls are dropping, and my heart is wrapped in fire. Whose is like my condition? Scarcely know I remedy, alas, did not estrangement Draw my tears, I would not sigh. O turtle dove, acquaint me, wherefore thus dost thou lament? Art thou so stung by absence, of thy wings deprived and pent? He saith our griefs are equal, worn away with love I lie. Alas, did not estrangement draw my tears, I would not sigh. O first and sole eternal, show thy favor yet to me. Thy slave Ahmad al-Bekri hath no lord excepting thee. By Taha the great prophet, do thou not his wish deny. Alas, did not estrangement draw my tears, I would not sigh. Dr. Tholuk quotes this verse from a Darwish breviary. Yesterday I beat the kettle drum of dominion. I pitched my tent on the highest throne. I drank, crowned by the beloved, the wine of unity from the cup of the Almighty. One of the most characteristic Sufi poems is the Persian poem by the poet Jami, entitled Salaman and Absal. The whole narrative is supposed to represent the joys of love divine as compared with the delusive fascination of a life of sense. The story is that of a certain king of Ionia who had a son named Salaman, who in his infancy was nursed by a young maiden named Absal, who, as he grew up, fell desperately in love with the youth and in time ensnared him. Salaman and Absal rejoiced together in a life of sense for a full year and thought their pleasures would never end. A certain sage is then sent by the king to reason with the erring couple. Salaman confesses that the sage is right but pleads the weakness of his own will. 
Salaman leaves his native land in company with Absal, and they find themselves on an island of wonderful beauty. Salaman, unsatisfied with himself and his love, returns once more to his native country, where he and Absal resolve to destroy themselves. They go to a desert and kindle a pile, and both walk into the fire. Absal is consumed, but Salaman is preserved in the fire and lives to lament the fate of his beloved one. In course of time he is introduced by the sage to a celestial beauty called Zohra, with whom he becomes completely enamored, and Absal is forgotten. Celestial beauty seen, he left the earthly, and once come to know eternal love, he let the mortal go. In the epilogue to the poem, the author explains the mystic meaning of the whole story in the following language. Under the outward form of any story an inner meaning lies, this story completed, do thou of its mystery whereto the wise hath found himself away, have thy desire. No tale of I and thou, though I and thou be its interpreters. What signifies the king, and what the sage, and what Salaman, not of woman born, and what Absal, who drew him to desire, and what the kingdom that awaited him, when he had drawn his garment from her hand? What means the fiery pile, and what the sea? And what the heavenly Zohra, who at last cleared Absal from the mirror of his soul? Learn part by part the mystery from me, all ears from head to foot and understanding be. The incomparable creator, when this world he did create, created first of all the first intelligence, first of a chain of ten intelligences, of which the last sole agent is this our universe. Active intelligence so called, the one distributor of evil and of good, of joy and sorrow, himself apart from matter in essence and in energy, his treasure subject to no such talisman, he yet hath fashioned all that is, material form, and spiritual sprung from him, by him, directed all, and in his bounty drowned. Therefore is he, that fair man issuing king, to whom the world was subject, but because what he distributes to the universe himself from still higher power receives, the wise and all who comprehend aright will recognize that higher in the sage. His the prime spirit that spontaneously projected by the tenth intelligence was from no womb of matter reproduced, a special essence called the soul, a child fresh sprung from heaven in raiment undefiled, of sensual taint, and therefore called Salaman. And who Absal, the lust-adoring body, slave to the blood and sense, through whom the soul, although the body's very life it be, does yet imbibe the knowledge and desire of things of sense, and these united thus, by such a tie God only can unloose, body and soul are lovers each of other. What is the sea on which they sailed? The sea of animal desire, the sensual abyss, under whose waters lies a world of being, swept far from God in that submersion. And wherefore was Absal in that isle, deceived in her delight, and that Salaman fell short of his desire? That was to show how passion tires, and how with time begins the folding of the carpet of desire. And what the turning of Salaman's heart back to the king, and looking to the throne of pomp and glory, what but the return of the lost soul to its true parentage, and back from carnal error, looking up repentant to its intellectual throne? What is the fire? Ascetic discipline that burns away the animal alloy, till all the dross of matter be consumed, and the essential soul, its raiment clean of mortal taint, be left. But forasmuch as, in a lifelong habit so consumed, may well recur a pang for what is lost, therefore the sage set in Salaman's eyes a soothing phantom of the past, 
but still told of a better Venus, till his soul she filled, and blotted out his mortal love. For what is Zohra, that divine perfection, wherewith the soul inspired and all arrayed, its intellectual light is royal blessed, and mounts the throne, and wears the crown, and reigns lord of the empire of humanity. This is the meaning of this mystery, which to know, wholly ponder in thy heart, till all its ancient secrets be enlarged. Enough, the written summary I close, and set my seal, the truth God only knows. Section 10. The True Character of Sufism It will be seen that the great object of the Sufi mystic is to lose his own identity. Having effected this, perfection is attained. This ideal conception of the Sufi is thus expressed by Jalal al-Din rumi in his book The Mesnavi, page 78. It represents human love seeking admission into the sanctuary of divinity. One knocked at the door of the beloved and a voice from within inquired, Who is there? Then he answered, It is I. And the voice said, This house will not hold me and thee. So the door remained shut. Then the lover sped away into the wilderness, and fasted, and prayed in solitude, and after a year he returned, and knocked again at the door, and the voice again demanded, Who is there? And the lover said, It is thou. Then the door was opened. The Sufi doctrines are undoubtedly pantheistic and are almost identical with those of the Brahmins and Buddhists, the Neoplatonists, the Begards and Begins. There is the same union of man with God, the same emanation of all things from God, and the same final absorption of all things into the divine essence. And these doctrines are held in harmony with a Mohammedan view of predestination which makes all a necessary evolution of the divine essence. The creation of the creature, the fall of those who have departed from God, and their final return are all events preordained by an absolute necessity. Bayezid al-Bastami, a mystic of the ninth century, said he was a sea without a bottom, without beginning and without end. Being asked, What is the throne of God? He answered, I am the throne of God. What is the table on which the divine decrees are written? I am the table. What is the pen of God, the word by which God created all things? I am the pen. What is Abraham, Moses, and Jesus? I am Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. What are the angels Gabriel, Michael, Israfil? I am Gabriel, Michael, Israfil. For whatever comes to true being is absorbed into God, and this is God. Again, in another place, Al-Bastami cries, Praise to me, I am truth. I am the true God. Praise to me, I must be celebrated by divine praise. The chief school of Arabian philosophy, that of Al-Ghazali, 505 after Hijra, passed over to Sufism by the same reasoning which led Plotinus to his mystical theology. After long inquiries for some ground on which to base the certainty of our knowledge, Al-Ghazali was led to reject entirely all belief in the senses. He then found it equally difficult to be certified of the accuracy of the conclusions of reason, for there may be, he thought, some faculty higher than reason which, if we possessed, would show the uncertainty of reason as reason now shows the uncertainty of the senses. He was left in skepticism and saw no escape but in the Sufi union with deity. There alone can man know what is true by becoming the truth itself. I was forced, he said, to return to the admission of intellectual notions as the basis of all certitude. This, however, was not by systematic reasoning and accumulation of proofs, but by a flash of light which God sent into my soul. 
For whoever imagines that truth can only be rendered evident by proofs places narrow limits to the wide compassion of the Creator. Sufism, says Mr. Cowell, has arisen from the bosom of Mohammedanism as a vague protest of the human soul in its intense longing after a pure creed. On certain tenets of the Quran, the Sufis have erected their own system, professing, indeed, to reverence its authority as a divine revelation, but in reality substituting for it the oral voice of the teacher or the secret dreams of the mystic. Dissatisfied with the barren letters of the Quran, Sufism appeals to human consciousness and from our nature's felt wants seeks to set before us nobler hopes than a gross Mohammedan paradise can fulfill. Whilst there are doubtless many amongst the Sufis who are earnest seekers after truth, it is well known that some of them make their mystical creed a cloak for gross sensual gratification. A sect of the Sufis called the Muhabiyya, or revered, maintained the doctrine of community of property and women, and the sect known as the Malamatiyya, or reproached, maintained the doctrine of necessity and compound all virtue with vice. Many such do not hold themselves in the least responsible for sins committed by the body, which they regard only as the miserable robe of humanity which encircles the pure spirit. Some of the Sufi poetry is most objectionable. Magakin de Slain, in his introduction to Ibn Khalakan's biographical dictionary, says, It often happens that a poet describes his mistress under the attributes of the other sex, lest he should offend that excessive prudery of oriental feelings which, since the fourth century of Islamism, scarcely allows an allusion to women, and more particularly in poetry. And this rigidness is still carried so far that Cairo public singers dare not amuse their auditors with a song in which the beloved is indicated as a female. It cannot, however, be denied that the feelings which inspired poetry of this kind were not always pure, and that polygamy and jealousy have invested the morals of some eastern nations with the foulest corruption. The story of the Reverend Dr. Madodin, the eminent native clergyman, a convert from Islam, now residing at Amritsar, is a remarkable testimony to the unsatisfying nature of Sufistic exercises to meet the spiritual need of anxious soul. The following extract from the printed autobiography of his life will show this. I sought for union with God from travelers and fakirs, and even from the insane people of the city, according to the tenets of the Sufi mystics. The thought of utterly renouncing the world then came into my mind with so much power that I left everybody and went out into the desert and became a fakir, putting on clothes covered with red ochre, and wandered here and there from city to city and from village to village, step by step, alone, for about 2,000 or 2,500 miles, without plan or baggage. Faith in the Mohammedan religion will never indeed allow true sincerity to be produced in the nature of man. Yet I was then, although with many worldly motives, in search only of God. In this state I entered the city of Karuli, where a stream called Cholida flows beneath the mountain, and there I stayed to perform the Hisp al-Bahar, I had a book with me on the doctrines of mysticism and the practice of devotion, which I had received from my religious guide, and held more dear even than the Quran. In my journeys I slept with it at my side at nights, and took comfort in clasping it to my heart whenever my mind was perplexed. My religious guide had forbidden me to show this book or to speak of its secrets to anyone, for it contained the sum of everlasting happiness, and so this priceless book is even now lying useless on a shelf in my house. 
I took up the book and sat down on the bank of the stream to perform the ceremonies as they were enjoined, according to the following rules. The celebrant must first perform his ablutions on the bank of the flowing stream, and wearing an unsewn dress, must sit in a particular manner on one knee for twelve days, and repeat the prayer called Jugopar thirty times every day with a loud voice. He must not eat any food with salt or anything at all except some barley bread of flour lawfully earned which he has made with his own hands and baked with wood that he has brought himself from the jungles. During the day he must fast entirely after performing his ablutions in the river before daylight, and he must remain barefooted, wearing no shoes, nor must he touch any man, nor except at an appointed time even speak to anyone. The object of all this is that he may meet with God, and from the longing desire to obtain this I underwent all this pain. In addition to the above, I wrote the name of God on paper 125,000 times, performing a certain portion every day, and I cut out each word separately with scissors, and wrapped them up each in a ball of flour, and fed the fishes of the river with them in the way the book prescribed. My days were spent in this manner, and during half the night I slept, and the remaining half I sat up, and wrote the name of God mentally on my heart, and saw him with the eye of thought. When all this toil was over, and I went thence, I had no strength left in my body. My face was wan and pale, and I could not even hold myself up against the wind. Major Dury Osborne, in his Islam under the Caliphs of Baghdad, page 112, says, The spread of this pantheistic spirit has been and is the source of incalculable evil throughout the Mohammedan world. The true function of religion is to vivify and illuminate all the ordinary relations of life with light from a higher world. The weakness to which religious minds are peculiarly prone is to suppose that this world of working life is an atmosphere too gross and impure for them to live in. They crave for better bread than can be made from wheat. They attempt to fashion a world for themselves where nothing shall soil the purity of the soul or disturb the serenity of their thoughts. The divorce thus effected between the religious life and the worldly life is disastrous to both. The ordinary relations of men become emptied of all divine significance. They are considered as the symbols of bondage to the world or to an evil deity. The religious spirit dwindles down to a selfish desire to acquire a felicity from which the children of this world are hopelessly excluded. Preeminently has this been the result of Mohammedan mysticism. It has dug a deep gulf between those who can know God and those who must wander in darkness, feeding upon the husks of rites and ceremonies. It has affirmed with emphasis that only by a complete renunciation of the world is it possible to attain the true end of man's existence. Thus all the best and purest natures, the men who might have put a soul in the decaying church of Islam, have been drawn off from their proper task to wander about in deserts and solitary places or expend their lives in idle and profitless passivity disguised under the title of spiritual contemplation. Cross-reference, zikr. But this has only been part of the evil. The logical result of pantheism is the destruction of a moral law. If God be all in all, and man's apparent individuality, a delusion of the perceptive faculty, there exists no will which can act, no conscience which can reprove or applaud. The individual is but a momentary seeming. He comes and goes like the snowflake on the river, a moment seen, then gone forever. To reproach such an ephemeral creature for being the slave of its passions is to chide the thistle down for yielding to the violence of the wind. 
Mohammedans have not been slow to discover these consequences. Thousands of reckless and profligate spirits have entered the orders of the Darwishas to enjoy the license thereby obtained. Their affection of piety is simply a cloak for the practice of sensuality. Their emancipation from the ritual of Islam involves a liberation also from its moral restraints. And thus a movement, animated at its outset by a high and lofty purpose, has degenerated into a fruitful source of ill. The stream which ought to have expanded into a fertilizing river has become a vast swamp, exhaling vapors charged with disease and death. Cross-reference, Fakir. For further information on the subject of Eastern mysticism, the English reader is referred to the following works. Hunt's Pantheism, Tholuck's Sufismus, Malcolm's History of Persia, Brown's Darwishes, Oxford Essays for 1855 by E. B. Cowell, Palmer's Oriental Mysticism, Deslane's Introduction to Ibn Khalqan, Bicknell's Translation of Hafiz of Shiraz, Usli's Persian Poets, Vaughan's Hours with the Mystics, Persian and Arabic books on the subject are too numerous to mention. Abdul Razak's Dictionary of the Technical Terms of Sufis was published in Arabic by Dr. Sprenger in Calcutta in 1845. Cross-reference, Fakir, Zikr. End of Sufism, Part 2, from A Dictionary of Islam by Thomas Patrick Hughes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 of Underground London by John Hollingshead. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. If the poor old ghost of Dr. Johnson had not been so extremely hard worked of late years, it would be a pleasure to call it up. Of course, in connection with the ghost of Mr. Boswell, in order to get a satisfactory definition of a main sewer. The definitions of the great doctor may not always be conveyed in the most simple language, but then they come upon us with a full booming sound of undeniable authority. The boldest caviller never questions an opinion beginning, It is laid down by the great lexicographer, and hence the value of such an opinion on a subject surrounded by so many theorists, rival engineers, boards, and technicalities as sewers. As we cannot avail ourselves of the doctor's defining wisdom, we must scramble through the entrance to our subject as best we can, and state, with no dogmatic precision, that main sewers are only properly so called when they follow the run of watercourses. This is a definition that most sewer engineers would not, perhaps, hesitate to endorse, and it shows us the natural melancholy connection between limpid streams or purling brooks and black, slimy, muddy underground rivers that no one ever thought of writing a sonnet to since poetry was born. A volume of antiquarian sentiment might easily be written on the old London watercourses or bournes. There is the ancient stream called Walbrook, which runs into the city from what were once fields between Islington and Hoxton. In old times it turned a number of corn mills, and even as late as 1810 it was found turning a lead mill near the turnpike in the city road. In its younger days, like all similar streams, it was spanned by many bridges throughout its course and its lower end was wide enough to allow barges to be rowed up it as far as Bucklersbury, to a spot now called Barge Yard. In 1489 the Lord Mayor gave two hundred marks towards vaulting it over near to the parish church of St. Margaret's in Lothbury. This river discharged into the Thames east of Dowgate Dock. Its line within the old city wall and ditch was by Walbrook, Prince's Street, crossing beneath the bank and along Bell Alley, to London Wall, and thence out of the city, across Old Street, to its source. 
It had several branches. Its bed was thirty-two feet beneath the present level of Prince's Street, as was discovered when the London Bridge sewer, its great substitute, was built, and its waters have trickled under the foundations of the bank. Even now, in its present dark obscurity, it has reason to be proud. It may consider itself the father of one of the lustiest young sewers in the metropolis, for the London Bridge sewer and its neighbour the Fleet are the largest channels of underground London. The Fleet itself, the Turnmill Brook, the River of Wells, bubbles up in a hundred volumes. It trickles through poems, forms little pools in plays, and sparkles here and there in less imaginative pages. Some historians of the Fleet Brook have regarded it with more veneration or enthusiasm than others, and have mused over its probable condition in the remotest times. They have pictured the period when Roman villas studded its banks, when Snow Hill was famous for its snowdrops, when Saffron Hill was a wooded slope like the Thames banks at Richmond, and when the stream wandered down from its source in the Hampstead Hills, carrying swarms of silver trout into the Thames. They have dreamed over the time when large vessels may have floated up as high as King's Cross, where this black river is now carried over the underground metropolitan railway in an iron pipe or tunnel. Some excuse for this dream about an extinct inland river may be found in the tradition that an anchor was found some years ago, as high up as the site of the Elephant and Castle, at Pancras Wash, where the road branches off to Kentish Town. The Fleet Brook has always been celebrated for its periodical floods in winter. It is the most unruly sewer in the whole vast property handed over in trust to the Metropolitan Board of Works. In 1846 it burst its bounds, doing much damage to property along its sides, particularly between Peter Street and Back Hill. Its embankment walls were much injured. Three houses and a warehouse in Vine Street were thrown down, and a slaughterhouse and mill house were also undermined. The flood rose five feet in the houses which fell down, and in some places to the height of six feet above the pavement. Last winter it was impassable for many weeks, and thirty or forty years ago, after continued rains, or a sudden thaw with much snow upon the ground, it has often broken up its arches and flooded the surrounding neighbourhood. A flood of this kind is recorded, which took place about 1820, when several oxen were drowned, and many butts of beer and other heavy articles were carried down the stream from houses on the banks into which the water had broken. The greatest flood recorded in connection with the fleet during the present century is one which happened in January 1809. At this period, when the snow was lying very deep, a rapid thaw came on, and the arches, not affording a sufficient passage for the increased current or storm waters, the whole space between Pancras, Somerstown, and the bottom of the hill at Pentonville, was in a short time covered with water. The flood rose to the height of three feet in the middle of the highway. The lower rooms of all the houses within that space were completely inundated, and the inhabitants had much of their goods and furniture damaged, which they had not time to remove. Two cart-horses were drowned, and for several days persons were obliged to be conveyed to and from their houses, and to receive their provisions in at the windows, by means of carts. Much of the water of the Fleet Brook, originally drawn from springs, on the south side of the hill between Hampstead and Highgate, by Ken Wood, where it forms several large ponds, has been carried off in pipes by the Hampstead Water Company, now merged in the New River Company, for the supply of the adjacent neighbourhood. That portion or branch of the Fleet Brook down in the London Valley, known by the unsavoury title of the Fleet Ditch, being part of the old town or city ditch that ran round the walls for about two miles, is even more closely embanked with anecdote, history, and poetical satire. It was once supplied with the waters of certain local wells on each side of its course, such as Clarken Well, St. Chad's Well, Am Well, St. Pancras Wells, Bagnig Wells, and others. <coughs> it was also fed by a small brook called Oldbourne, the godfather of Hoban. 
Oldbourne, or Hillbourne, says Stowe, broke out about the place where the bars do now stand, and ran down the whole street till Oldbourne Bridge, and into the river of the Wells or Turnmill Brook. This bourne was likewise long since stopped up at the head, and in other places, where the same has broken out. But yet till this day the said street is there called High Oldbourne Hill, and both sides thereof, together with all the grounds adjoining, that lie betwixt it and the river Thames, remain full of springs, so that water is there found at hand, and hard to be stopped in every house. The great fire of London stopped short in this direction at Hoban Bridge. The four bridges over the Fleet Ditch were Hoban Bridge, Fleet Lane Bridge, Bridewell Bridge, and Fleet Bridge. After the great fire, says Mr. Cunningham, Fleet Ditch was converted into a dock or creek, about forty feet in breadth, at a cost of about twenty-eight thousand pounds sterling, called the New Canal. It was an unprofitable speculation. The toll was heavy, the traffic inconsiderable, and in spite of its new name and the money that had been spent upon it, the ditch was doomed to continue a common sewer. As early as Ben Jonson's days, the Fleet Ditch was considered a fair object for humorous satire and description. In the Famous Voyage, an account of an adventurous journey up the stream, the following passage occurs. All was to them the same, they were to pass, and so they did from Styx to Acheron, the ever-boiling flood, whose banks upon your Fleet Lane furies and hot cooks do dwell that with still scalding steams make the place hell the stinks run grease and hair of measled hogs cats there lay diverse the ditch was a nuisance in cromwell's time by reason of the many encroachments thereupon made by keeping of hogs and swine therein and elsewhere near it as the new canal with its sides built of stone and brick its wharves and landing places it still maintained its repulsive character. Animals seem to have fattened in its thick stream, to judge by the following passage in the Gentleman's Magazine for 1736. A fatter boar was hardly ever seen than one taken up this day, August the 24th, 1736, coming out of Fleet Ditch into the Thames. It proved to be a butcher's near Smithfield Bars, who had missed him five months, all which time he had been in the common sewer, and was improved in price from ten shillings to two guineas. A prodigal son, missing for this period, would probably have been reduced rather than increased in value. Gay, in his trivia, has had a fling at the old fleet ditch. If where fleet ditch with muddy current flows, you chance to roam, where oyster-tubs in rows are ranged beside the posts, there stay thy haste, and with the savoury dish indulge thy taste. The damsel's knife the gaping shell commands, while the salt liquor streams between her hands. Of course, the oyster-shells were thrown into the slow-creeping stream, either by the stall-keeper or her customers. Pope has added his might to Fleet Ditch satire and history in The Dunkiad. This labour past by Bridewell all descend, as morning prayer and flagellation end, to where Fleet Ditch with disemboguing streams rolls its large tribute of dead dogs to Thames, the king of dykes, than whom no sluice of mud with deeper sable blots the silver flood swift with his usual bold felicity in dealing with such subjects has outdone all his brother poets in his city shower now from all parts the swelling kennels flow and bear their trophies with them as they go filth of all hues and odours seem to tell what street they sailed from by their sight and smell they, as each torrent drives its rapid force from Smithfield to St. Pulker's, shape their course, and in huge confluence joined at Snow Hill Ridge, fall from the conduit prone to Hoban Bridge, sweepings from butchers' stalls, drowned puppies, stinking sprats all drenched in mud, dead cats and turnip-tops come tumbling down the flood. 
This nuisance was checked in 1734 by the mayor and corporation, who caused the ditch to be arched over from Hogan Bridge to Fleet Street. In 1765, when Blackfriars Bridge and Bridge Street were being built, another portion from Fleet Street to the Thames was arched over and other portions have been arched or covered in at different times the two old bridges which formerly spanned the ditch at hoban and fleet street at the junction with ludgate are built into and form part of the present great sewer its length within the city is now about three-quarters of a mile but it extends for miles beyond the city boundary and drains an area of four thousand two hundred and twenty acres some few houses at different parts of its course still hang over the black uncovered stream like those old traditional bygone dens of field lane which have been the source of a thousand stories in the romance of crime jonathan wilde jack shepherd and other similar criminals are said to have haunted this spot and along with accounts of fat boars city refuse and coarse heroic couplets we have many traditions of robbery and murder. Some of the houses overhanging the fleet ditch in the last century had trap-doors opening over the stream, through which many unsuspecting victims are said to have been thrust, as well as many heaps of muck and ashes. A small and dirty street called Chick Lane, West Smithfield, was destroyed in 1844 when the memorable Red Lion Tavern in West Street, as the place was then called, was taken down. The house overlooked the open descent of the fleet from Clerkenwell to Farringdon Street and had long been infamous. It had many trapdoors, sliding panels, and cellars and passages for thieves, and a plank thrown across the sewer was often the means, it was said, of effecting an escape. A great crowd gathered round the place day after day for several days, I being on one occasion amongst the number, and many stories were told, and believed, of murders and robberies hidden by the black flood below. The fleet certainly rushed down to the river in times of flood, and bodies picked up floating backwards and forwards with the tide would, no doubt, have been taken ashore to be owned, and if not owned, would have been buried by the parish with a Bow Street record of found drowned. So far the machinery seems to have been well adapted for the commission of such crimes, and we may therefore allow that a certain small percentage of the existing stories are possibly founded upon fact. It is a relief to turn from these black or unsavoury records of one of the oldest and largest of the northern main sewers to stories such as are told of the less famous Ephra. This great southern sewer was once a small river which, rising in the Norwood Hills, flowed down in a winding course to Kennington, and then wound through South Lambeth to the Thames, near where Vauxhall Bridge now stands. Forty years ago, says a contemporary writer, nightingales in great numbers made their home in the sequestered portions of the Ephra's banks, and flocks of larks might have been seen sweeping over Rush Common. The river was then wider than at present, with a current racing along faster than a man could walk. Although its channel was very deep, a day or two of heavy rain invariably caused an overflow, which lay South Lambeth, Kennington, and the lower portions of Brixton under water. The abbots of Merton had lands given them for the especial purpose of repairing the bridge over the Ephra, at the point where Kennington Church now stands and Brixton was once a happy hunting-ground well stocked with game, where Queen Elizabeth used to disport herself during her visits to Lord Norris. A local tradition exists that the strong-minded Queen once came up the river Ephra in her barge to visit Sir Walter Raleigh at Old Raleigh House, which still stands on the hill. Looking at the partly open, partly closed black stream, which is now known as the Wash, or Ephra main sewer, and thinking of the frilled fullness which characterized the Elizabethan style of dress, it is difficult to believe that the former could have ever been broad enough to admit the latter. There, however, is the tradition, firmly rooted, like many other traditions, in the popular faith, and pictures are called up of gilded barges, the sweeping of light guitars, potato custards, 
tobacco pastils and the chivalry that makes doormats of velvet cloaks end of chapter 2 of underground london read by peter yearsley